Section 1 of Six Radical Thinkers, Bentham, J.S. Mill, Cobden, Carlyle, Mazzini, T.H. Green. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami, M.D. Six Radical Thinkers, Bentham, J.S. Mill, Cobden, Carlyle, Mazzini, T. H. Green, by John McCunn. Chapter 1. Bentham and His Philosophy of Reform, Part 1. Under a government of good laws, asks Bentham, what is the motto of a good citizen? He answers, to obey punctually, to censure freely. And few men have more faithfully lived up to their words. It began early. I learnt nothing, he says, of his undergraduate days at Oxford. We just went to the foolish lectures of our tutors to be taught something of logical jargon. But he said worse things of his university than this. It is an often told story how, against scruples of conscience, he was constrained to affix the necessary signature to the thirty-nine articles then exacted at the beginning of a university career. He was then but twelve and a half. Possibly the college authorities may have thought the boy made too much of his conscience and too little of the articles. Yet we know from his own words that on that precocious and sensitive mind an impression was made which lasted for life. He said many bitter things about tests in his lifetime. One was that the streets of Oxford were paved with perjury nor did the social opportunity so justly prized in the life of the old universities make amends for other disgusts. He had fellow students, of course, but short is their shrift. They were all either stupid or dissipated. His final experience of the university was in keeping. After graduating, he returned, I taught sixteen, to attend the lectures of Blackston, and in due course, to do his best in his fragment on government to demolish the lecturer. It is the same story when he passed from the university to the bar. He had no liking for the profession to begin with, and very soon, as he tells us, he did his best to put to death, and not without success, the cases which his anxious father had as a solicitor thrown in his way. He and his practice parted, with willingness on both sides. But there is a sequel. If the reader will turn to the copious index to Bowring's edition of Bentham's works, he will find under the head lawyers the following among other items. Lawyers, interest of in the incognoscibility of the law. Mendacity, license of. The only persons in whom ignorance of the law is not punished least of all men exposed to the operations of humanity, opinion of that cheap justice is bad, dear justice good, knowledge of, confined to the corrupt part of human nature, accessories to the crimes they defend, their interest in technical jargon. The last item is even more eloquent. Lawyers, incidentally animadverted on, with 156 citations. It had been the dearest ambition of Bentham's pushing father to educate his son to be a great lawyer. He even, we know, had views which the astonishing precocity of the boy might well justify of the woolsack. But sons dispose where fathers propose. The product was the most subversive critic that English law and lawyers have ever had to encounter. It was not otherwise when he came to mix in society. When he left the bar, he seemed to have passed into the obscurity of failure, and his father, he tells us, was always out of spirits for my want of success. But he was working, he was producing, and it was in the theory of the very subject in which all his acquaintance had set him down as a final failure. The result was the Fragment on Government, published in 1776 when its author was twenty-eight and with this came the recognition and the friendship of the Whig Lord Shelburne. It was a friendship he regarded with lifelong gratitude as one of the prime movers in his life, 
and among the many things it did for him was, in words of his own, to raise him from the pit of humiliation and to bring him into society, and especially, of course, into the society of public men. These Whigs, it is evident, did not think much of him. They laughed at him, they made jokes at his expense, and he could not retaliate in kind, for with all his intractability he was in society a timid and bashful man, with a bashfulness that clung to him like a cold garment all through his life and to the end of his days he gave little sign in conversation of the explosiveness of his mind and opinions. But this is what, when he was seventy, he wrote down in that memorandum book to which, as to a faithful friend, he confided all his inmost feelings. J. Bentham's knowledge of the world, Whig lords, etc. Those who live with them and by describing their doings and looking at their titles pretend to know what they are, know only what they say. I, who might have lived with them, and would not live with them, and who neither know nor care what they say, know, and without living with them, what they think. And if we turn to his second work, The Principles of Morals and Legislation, which was completed under Shelburne's roof, we shall search in vain for any vestige of that softening influence which Whig drawing-rooms have been sometimes supposed to exercise even upon radical thinkers. The truth is that society was not made for him nor he for society, and as years went on he settled down to do his work in an ever-increasing seclusion. As for people at large, I want little of their company and much of their esteem. He wrote this when he was twenty-three, and it was truer of him every day he lived. Once in later times, when Madame de Stal came to London, she sent a message through his friend and editor Dumont. Tell Bentham I will see nobody till I have seen him. Sorry for it, said Bentham, for then she will see nobody. It is easy to say that in all this there is much that is deplorable. This determination from Oxford days onwards to set himself forever in opposition, and to smash every idol he was expected to worship, shut his mind, narrowed his experience, impoverished his life, distorted his world. His contractedness of mind is incredible. He found Socrates insipid. Plato was to him a philosophy of words. He called Burke a madman, and Johnson a vamper of commonplace morality. He wished that Goldsmith had never written The Deserted Village. He defined poetry as misrepresentation, and even in his own subject declared that before Montesquieu all was unmixed barbarism. He is, in brief, not only one of the greatest, but one of the most limited of Englishmen. He thought much in his day, and he wrote much about prisons, himself all the while an unconscious prisoner within spiritual walls that shut out life. Be it so. We need not say it, because his greatest disciple, the younger Mill, has, in the best of his essays, set it for us with sufficient emphasis. But then this fitted him for his work, for it gave him two qualities without which he could never have been, in his manhood, the great subversive critic of English law, and in exuberant old age, the radical reformer of the English constitution. It gave him the irreverence, which is the price which the world has to pay for emancipation. The irreverence of Erasmus when he satirized the monks, of Bacon when he scoffed at the schoolmen, of Pascal when he scathed the Jesuits, of Voltaire when he scoffed at superstition, and of Bentham when he assaulted the law and constitution of England. And to irreverence, impotent enough had it stood alone, it added the self-reliance which enabled its possessor, without support of any institution and with little of the alliance of other minds, to stand up, strongly rooted in himself against venerated authorities, massive prescription, sinister interest, and prolonged indifference. Bentham is himself the greatest obstacle to an understanding of the bitterness of his onslaught on the law of England. He has, by general admission, 
done so much to make law what it is that it has become impossible without special knowledge to realize what before bentham it was i do not know says sir henry Maine, a single law reform effected since bentham's day which cannot be traced to his influence it was of course inevitable that with the growth of the nation and with the activity of legislation english statute law should increase in complexity no one could better realize this than bentham himself who in his own handling of the civil and the criminal code has proved himself one of the greatest masters of detail that ever lived but unfortunately complexity had become confusion systematization had not kept pace with growth the antiquated and the obsolete had not been shorn away when its day was done and the new in a laborious and gigantic patchwork had been superimposed upon the old there was progress the plough as mill puts it was no longer attached to the horse's tail but then for form's sake the tail was still suffered to remain attached to the plough dearly he adds did the client pay for the cabinet of historical curiosities which he was obliged to purchase every time that he made a settlement of his estate a similar thing had happened in case law the recorded decisions of courts had inevitably multiplied an hundredfold and had gone to swell or as bentham thought to be entombed in the multitudinous volumes out of which lawyers had to dig their law when they needed it add to this a terminology and a phraseology only recently translated into english to the last degree prolix and technical and we can hardly wonder if upon this more than primeval chaos there brooded the spirit of even to lawyers an all but impenetrable unintelligibility but even this it would seem was not the worst unintelligibility might have had its advantages it would have left at any rate the lay mind in total darkness but then the darkness was not total by the free use of legal fictions words which seemed to mean something did not mean what they seemed an acquired non-natural interpretation was put upon them known doubtless to the legal expert but mysterious and deceptive to the last degree to the natural understanding of men and then when thus to complexity had been added technicality and to technicality unintelligibility and to unintelligibility fiction there emerged that safeguard of justice with which we are all so familiar ignorance of the law excuses no man it was this state of things that bentham could not tolerate it was not in his blood to do it blind and deaf as he was to whole tracts of human experience there were some things to which the ways of influence were open indeed sincerity honesty candor such as have never been surpassed were part of his being the recollection of that money he says recalling a very venial childish departure from perfect straightforwardness was like the worm that never dieth within me i never told a lie he once said in the latest years of his long life to bowring from whom he hid nothing i never in my remembrance did what i knew to be a dishonest thing this was his native spirit it fed on all it met on the memoirs he read even as a child of the victims of the law's delay in which he tells us the demon of chicane appeared to him in all its hideousness on the extorted tests of oxford university on the damnatory revelations of his brief practice at the bar on the legal studies of his later life till at last it broke out in a torrent of denunciation and derision complication he cries is the nursery of fraud our whole judiciary establishment is one entire mass of corruption the incomprehensibility of the law he declares in another not less characteristic vein is the very remedy which in its present state preserves society from dissolution yes because if rogues did but know all the pains that the law has taken for their benefit honest men would have nothing left they could call their own what is a fiction he asks 
a falsehood by whom invented by judges on what occasion on the occasion of their pronouncing a judicial decision for what purpose one may conceive too either that of doing in a roundabout way what they might do in a direct way or that of doing in a roundabout way what they had no right to do in any way at all we cannot pause upon his illustrations but here is one presented in his usual fashion an innocent son of a father capitally punished for high treason was not only deprived of his father's goods by the fiction of corruption of blood he could not even inherit from his grandfather the channel so ran the law through which the goods had to pass had been corrupted this fiction of a sort of original sin serves as a foundation to all this point of law but why stop there if in fact the father's blood is corrupted why not destroy the vile offspring of corruption why not execute the son at the same time with the father now it is entirely and even obviously true that in this and in much else like it there is ignorance bentham had nothing of the historic spirit the wisdom of our ancestors is to him but the infantile foolishness of the cradle of the race and if he ever wishes to conserve the past at all it is only that we may learn by its follies blunders and crimes his very admirations disclose his limits for though he admired montesquieu it was not for the historic spirit which is the supreme merit of that great pioneer of the historical method sir henry Maine's verdict is unimpeachable no geniuses of an equally high order so completely divorced themselves from history as hobbes and bentham not to bentham therefore need we look for the spirit that finds in the natural history of abuses an apology for their survival nor for that recognition of social evolution which sees in revolution a sin against organic continuity nor for that discovery so familiar now to the student of comparative law and politics that men are not made for codes and constitutions but contrariwise codes and constitutions for men he denounced fictions but even here he has but delivered himself into the hands of historians of institutions who have little difficulty in convicting him of ignorance of the peculiar office of legal fictions in the development of law but then it was not bentham's mission to do justice to what was old nor even to attempt to hold the balance between the old and the new his task was to prepare the way for whole truths by enforcing partial ones and in particular to subject the law of england to the test of a utility stripped of the last shred of reverence for prescription it is not for us to lament it prescription had friends enough even while bentham was busy the romantic genius of scott soul sitting by the shores of old romance was bringing the past to life again and burke on a hundred reverent pages was telling the world that men would never look forward to posterity who did not look backward to their ancestors who will say that in face of these the greatest of all the prophets of conservatism reform in politics as well as in the law did not need a champion who forgot to do justice to the past in the passion to do justice to the future there are to be sure some who think among them sir henry Maine, that both for his own reputation and for the good of his country bentham had much better never have gone beyond legal reform but he had no misgivings himself at sixty-eight or at most a few years earlier with that youth in age which characterized him he threw himself into political reform and never flagged till having lived to express his joy at the french revolution of eighteen thirty he died in eighteen thirty two an impenitent radical of nearly eighty-four few men have ever from the quiet haven of a recluse life more striven to act upon the stormy course of politics he counselled the parliamentary radicals cartwright burdett o'connell broom and others he drafted their resolutions he inspired the masterful dogmatism of james mill he founded 
the Westminster Review. Most of all, he wrote books which became the scriptures of philosophical radicalism. He was not without his opportunity. When he turned to politics, the first line of radical assault had been repulsed. Burke and the forces of conservatism had carried the day. They had triumphantly diffused the terror, with Paris as illustration, and the country had followed them. The watchword of reform, the rights of man, was discredited. Discredited by its sanguinary victory in France, discredited by both practical and controversial defeat in England. Bentham himself had played his part in discrediting it. He gave proof of his radicalism here, by doing his best to subvert the foundations on which radicalism had been heretofore supposed to rest. Nor amongst all the phrases he assails is there one which more moves him to denial and derision than the natural rights of man. Radical Bentham here outdoes conservative Burke. Bitterly as Burke had denounced the revolutionary dogma of abstract rights, it was not the theory he attacked, it was its fanatical applications. Far otherwise with Bentham. He meets the theory of the natural rights of man with the flat denial that man has any natural rights whatever. What man has by nature is inclinations, desires, expectations. These he has in lavish abundance. Nature has seen to that. But of all the rights of man, rights to life, liberty, property, and all the rest which figured in the great American and French declarations of rights, man has not won, not even the elementary right to life, till he has received it at the hands of law. It is law and law alone that is the source of rights, for it is law alone that defines what are the natural inclinations in whose satisfaction it is for the public good that the citizen ought to be protected, as it is likewise law that defines what are the natural inclinations which ought in the public interest to be repressed, if need be, by prison and gallows. Rights properly so called are the creatures of law properly so called. Real laws give birth to real rights. This is the pith of Bentham's teaching about rights. The teaching, to be sure, is far from unimpeachable. The definition of rights is too narrow. The legal endorsement of a right, the mere inscription of a right in the statute book, does not create that right. But the very narrowness of the definition serves the more effectually to mark the completeness of Bentham's rupture with the earlier radicalism. The natural rights, which to it were the foundations of politics, had become to him no better than dogmatic and contemptible anarchic fallacies. End of section one. Section two of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter one. Bentham and his philosophy of reform. Part two. The result of all this was that when, after the Great War, reform began again to raise its head, it found the Constitution still standing intact and indeed stronger than ever upon the ruins of the radical theory and buttressed by all the splendid reasoning apology and imaginative panegyric of Burke. Yet if our century be not a step backward, we cannot well deny that the Constitution needed looking into. Bentham, at any rate, set himself to look into it. There is one of his writings, The Book of Fallacies, which, considering its permanent applicability to political life, is surprisingly neglected. For it is designed to expose not so much logical fallacies as the manifold devices by which privilege and monopoly and inertia and sinister interest in all its forms are prone to clutch if only they might postpone the hour of reform. There are many sections in the volume, and the headings are in themselves often significant of much. Thus we have the wisdom of our ancestors or Chinese argument, 
the hobgoblin argument or no innovation official malefactors screen attack me you attack government the quietist or no complaint snail's pace argument one thing at a time slow and sure and so on the constitution why must it not be looked into so runs his comment upon our matchless constitution why is it that under pain of being ipso facto anarchist convict we must never presume to look at it otherwise than with shut eyes because it was the work of our ancestors of ancestors of legislators few of whom could so much as read and these few had nothing before them that was worth the reading perhaps his handling of the hobgoblin argument shows him in his most aggressive vein i am a sinecurist cries another who being in receipt of thirty eight thousand pounds a year public money for doing nothing and having no more wit than honesty have never been able to open my mouth and pronounce any articulate sound for any other purpose yet hearing a cry of no sinecures am come down to join in the chorus of no innovation down with the innovators in hopes of drowning by these defensive sounds the offensive ones which chill my blood and make me tremble i am a contractor cries a third who having bought my seat that i might sell my vote and in return for them being in the habit of obtaining with the most convenient regularity a succession of good jobs foresee in the prevalence of innovation the destruction and the ruin of this established branch of trade i am a country gentleman cries a fourth who observing that from having a seat in a certain assembly a man enjoys more respect than he did before on the turf in the dog kennel and in the stable and having tenants and other dependents enough to seat me against their wills for a place in which i am detested and hearing it said that if innovation were suffered to run on unopposed elections would come in time to be as free in reality as they are in appearance and pretense have left for a day or two the cry of tally ho and hark forward to join in the cry of no anarchy no innovation i am a priest says a fifth who having proved the pope to be antichrist to the satisfaction of all orthodox divines whose piety prays for the cure of souls or whose health has need of exoneration from the burthen of residence and having read in my edition of the gospels that the apostles lived in palaces which innovation and anarchy would cut down to parsonage houses though grown hoarse by screaming out no reading no writing no lancaster no popery for fear of coming change am here to add what remains of my voice to the full chorus of no anarchy no innovation i am myself bentham once complacently remarked the most egregious and offensive libeller men in power in this country ever saw and yet after all the noteworthy fact about bentham is not that he can revile there are greater masters of invective which in him too often loses half of its force by losing all its reticence the wonder rather is the union of scoffs flouts derision vituperation denunciation with an unaffected love of men and a cheerful geniality that endeared this egregious and offensive libeller to every one who really knew him james mill has told us in his envenomed fragment on mackintosh that bentham's critics regarded him as a man whose habit and practice was to hold forth in a conventicle of fools and knaves or both such as elsewhere was not to be found on the face of the earth had such been admitted to the hermitage in queen square they would have found a strange reversal of their apprehensions for they would have met there one of the gentlest of men hospitable with the kindliest hospitality remarkable for the peculiar benevolence of his manner fond of music and flowers of little children and pet animals and wholly unobtrusive of theories no misinterpretation could be more flagrant than to ascribe bentham's seclusion to misanthropy the prime cause lay in his devotion to his work i give my mornings to nobody he says in his eighty-fourth year i have so much to do and so short a time to live that i cannot abridge my working hours 
for Bentham's work, we must remember, did not lie in the origination of ideas, for which contact with the world may have its uses and afford its inspirations. It lay in a method of detail, that is, in the working of what was, after all, but a small stock of leading ideas into their minutest and most logically divided applications. It was this that compelled him to a willing seclusion, and the prodigious labor with which his seclusion was filled. I have seen him, writes his intimate friend Dumont, suspend a work almost finished, and compose a new one only to assure himself of the truth of a single proposition which seemed to be doubtful. A problem in finance has carried him through the whole of political economy. Some questions of procedure obliged him to interrupt his principal work till he had treated of judicial organization. This preparatory labor, this labor in the mines, is immense. No one can form an idea of it except by seeing the manuscripts, the catalogues, the synoptical tables in which it is contained. Thousands of pages that he wrote, one may add, have to this day never been published. He once made the discovery that genius means production. His entire life is a comment on that text. But there was nothing here of the moroseness that lies in wait for the recluse, it was from first to last a healthy nature and a happy life, full of a boyish cheerfulness and an imperturbable geniality. Shortly before his death he put on paper his brief philosophy of life. The way to be comfortable is to make others comfortable. The way to make others comfortable is to appear to love them. The way to appear to love them is to love them in reality. And what perhaps makes this good will to men the more attractive is that it went with no high professions of disinterestedness. He once no doubt declared himself in a mood of exuberance to be the most philanthropic of the philanthropic, but he never seriously flattered himself on being a philanthropist. On the contrary, among the last lines he penned in his memorandum book was this remarkable well known confession I am a selfish man as selfish as any man can be. But in me, somehow or other, so it happens, selfishness has taken the form of benevolence. This being so, it is time to ask a question. If a man tells us that he is the most philanthropic of the philanthropic in one breath, and in the next describes himself, and with truth, as the most egregious libeler that men in power have ever known, if through a long life he flings missiles broadcast at his fellow countrymen and ends in the conviction that selfishness in him has taken the form of benevolence, is it not a contradiction? But there is none here. For it was not Oxford, nor the Bar, nor Whig Society, nor all that he saw of sinecurists or monopolists that made Bentham the great critic of things established. Far less was it a corrosive mind and an embittered spirit. It was the fact that behind all his negations there was belief. Even from early student days there had been rising before his mind a comprehensive idea of the public good. He had read in Priestley, when twenty-two, of the greatest happiness of the greatest number. He had encountered the same idea, indeed, the very phrase, in Beccaria, and it had found confirmation in the pages of Hume. It met what was already in his mind. It fostered his instincts of philanthropy. It satisfied the benevolence of his aspirations. It gave unity to his thoughts and direction to his aims. He seized upon it firmly and finally, and the peculiar cast of his genius did the rest. By an analytic faculty that was masterly, by a grasp of detail that has never been surpassed, by an infinite patience of unresting labor, he worked the idea out, and he did not flag till he had wrought it into the very texture of theoretical law and politics. It would be rash to say that this idea is, philosophically speaking, unassailable. This we shall see in due course. But even if greatest happiness of the greatest number be an imperfect formula, it served to denote for Bentham and for many another since a supreme positive fact, 
the fact namely that in law and politics the final court of all appeal is the public good it was his hold upon this fact that gave their fervour to his combinations for in the light of it law had gained a new dignity it had become the science which holds in its hands the happiness of men and nations and forthwith against that background every legal abuse took on an added iniquity it defrauded the client of course and this was bad but it was a worse thing that by consecrating injustice it defrauded mankind it blocked the way to the public good and therefore in the name of the public good it had to go not without maledictions similarly in politics here too it is the believer not the unbeliever who is the most radical reformer this will quickly appear if we remember what the distinctive characteristic of political reform in this country has been it has been a movement against monopoly there have been other watchwords but the enduring watchword has been no monopoly it was a movement which already had achieved much the catholic monopoly had perished in the sixteenth and the royal monopoly in the seventeenth centuries but when bentham came to politics monopoly still stood the monopoly of protestant against catholic the monopoly of tory and whig borough mongers against non-electors the monopoly of master against slave the monopoly of corn producer against corn consumer and some would add the monopoly of capitalist against labourer not to speak of what some ardent reformers would call the oldest and most inveterate monopoly of all the monopoly of men against women now it was monopoly that bentham attacked and we may truly say that nothing more became him than his manner of attacking it for he did not stake his case either on reviling monopolists or on denouncing monopolies he could do both but he sought also through his own message and through the message of followers like the two mills who in politics were greater than himself to lodge in the minds of his countrymen an ideal of the public good so comprehensive so impartial so reasonable and so satisfying that by its mere presence there it might unmask every monopoly as an obstruction and brand every monopolist as a robber of the commonwealth it is this and not only as some have thought its negations that is the supreme service that benthamism has rendered later philosophy may have conceived the public good more adequately but no philosophy either before or since has ever kept its eye more steadfastly fixed upon that supreme object it is for this reason that it has always acted as a powerful incitement to political benevolence in bentham the founder in james mill the propagandist in john mill the apostle it has nobly striven to expand the area of practical interests in words of bentham's own limits it has none other than those of the habitable globe in nothing is it more truly in the vanguard of the modern spirit even the greeks when all is said bounded their obligations by narrow political barriers as some one has said they were not so much political philosophers as philosophers of the polis and in the modern world it is only by slow degrees that the best of citizens have come to realize their duties to the slave or the savage even in our own day there is many a good patriot who looks askance at cosmopolitanism as a thing of vague humanitarian enthusiasm if indeed he be not ready to drop with burke the insinuation that lovers of their kind may be haters of their kindred it is to this spirit that benthamism is an antidote it joins hands with christianity itself at the breadth of its answer to the old question who is my neighbour it goes further for jeremy bentham the most philanthropic of the philanthropic is not to be satisfied even with the great human race in all places and at all times like j s mill he does not forget the animals the question is not he says putting the matter in a way that to utilitarian hedonism is convincing can they reason nor can they talk but can they suffer 
It goes closely with this that Benthamism carries in it a sort of gospel of political integrity. No philosophy has ever more sternly set itself against that fatal contraction of the political sympathies that comes in the insidious guise of loyalty to friends or kindred or connections. No philosophy, to put the matter more bluntly, ever more resolutely took its stand against nepotism, jobbery, log-rolling, favoritism, and betrayal of public trust. Even as an ethical doctrine, it is one of the glories of utilitarianism that it pled the claims upon private men of social duties and public responsibilities, and in doing so it was but putting on paper the spirit of Bentham's whole life. No man has ever held his powers or his wealth more as a public trust, and when at the end he bequeathed his body to the dissecting knife in the interest of science, he did but set the seal on a long private life of public devotion. We may judge from this what he would exact from public men in public life, and in truth he has left us in no doubt. I would have the dearest friend I have to know that his interests, if they come in competition with the public, are as nothing to me. And yet these practical merits of Benthamism come from the very source of certain of its theoretical difficulties. It is for the sake of the happiness of the greatest number that we are bidden to count the interests of our dearest friend as nothing. It is for the sake of the happiness of the greatest number that we are forbidden to tolerate privilege or monopoly or class interest or sinister interest in any shape or form. Well and good. But now we have to ask a question. Where is the proof that by thus pursuing the happiness of the greatest number we shall produce or contribute to produce the greatest happiness? This is a question that Benthamism must face. On one assumption the answer is easy if only we might assume that all men are equal, then indeed it is simple political philosophy, because it is nothing more than simple arithmetic, to conclude that the greater the number of men made happy, the greater the resulting sum of happiness. This, however, is precisely the line of proof, if we may call it proof, which Bentham could not take. The dogma of the equality of men was just one of those anarchic fallacies that was abhorrent to him, and in point of fact he poured derision upon it with a copiousness and an animosity which no Tory could surpass, and which Burke or Carlyle himself might have envied. This being so, the question that emerges is obvious. If men are not equal, why treat them as if they were? Why identify the happiness of the majority with the end of legislation? Why preach on a thousand pages equality before the law? Why attack monopoly in every shape? Why level men at the door of the polling booth? Why count each as one? Why argue, as he does, that a greater equalization of property is a justifiable aspiration? It must, I imagine, be already evident that this raises a problem which goes to the roots of Benthamism as a theory. Thus Sir Henry Maine, in this very reference, tells us of a certain Brahmin who had quite insuperable difficulties in accepting the happiness of the greatest number as the supreme political end on the ground that, according to his reckoning, the happiness of one Brahmin was worth at least the happiness of twenty ordinary men. One wonders if he spoke in all innocence, or if he meant to convey just a shadow of suggestion that there might be, elsewhere than in India, those who live and act in the evident conviction that the happiness of one Western Brahmin is at very least equal to that of a score of Western pariahs. Be this as it may, our Brahmin does not stand alone. Every critic of Bentham must sympathize with him for once these inequalities are recognized as facts, inequalities of endless diversity from crown and scepter to scythe and spade, where is the political arithmetic to be found which will demonstrate the Benthamite solution as against the Brahminical, or for that of it, the Brahminical as against the Benthamite? The citizens of a commonwealth may of course be called units, but they are units far from arithmetical. No two of them are alike. 
each one of them as bentham well knew has his own peculiar sensibilities to pleasures and pains and each is unlike even his next-door neighbour in gifts and opportunities in hopes fears sympathies antipathies estimates of men and things who then we may ask will venture to stand forward and undertake to weigh the pleasures of this poor man as against the pleasures of that rich man or the pains of this group of citizens as against the pains of that group or more difficult task still the pains of this class as against the pleasures of that class let any one try the experiment even within the small circle of his own acquaintance he may then better understand the task of the legislator who has to compute in terms of pleasure and pain the effects of a projected law upon the lives of great multitudes moral arithmetic hedonistic calculus sum of pleasures and so forth are phrases not unattractive they suggest solutions but one may not stifle the doubt that when it comes to estimates of human happiness or misery arithmetic in politics is not much more helpful than politics in arithmetic End of section two section three of six radical thinkers by john mccunn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter one bentham and his philosophy of reform part three benthamism however had more ways than one of meeting such objections in the first place it simplifies the problem by breaking it up and thereby making it more definite it does not leave the benthamite legislator to work out his sums in political arithmetic from beginning to end with no more concrete end before his eyes than the vague general happiness it specifies four subordinate ends in the light of which general happiness may be interpreted four finger-posts if one may call them so which point the way to public good these are subsistence abundance equality and security footnote some persons he adds may be astonished to find that liberty is not ranked among the principal objects of law but a clear idea of liberty will lead us to regard it as a branch of security personal liberty is security against a certain kind of injuries which affect the person political liberty is security against injustice from the ministers of government and footnote the first two need no comment it is obvious that without subsistence happiness would disappear in destitution and death it is almost equally obvious that there must be abundance or as one might prefer to call it accumulation for it has become one of the commonplaces of economic analysis that a community that struggles along on the level of mere subsistence is precariously situated without savings it will be ready to drop into the jaws of destitution on the first industrial reverse and even far short of this it must signally fail to provide the resources without which labour will lose its efficiency and capital be paralysed in enterprise nor does the matter rest there for in the modern state it is not the industrial system alone that calls for abundance its whole higher civilization comes to depend not only on the sinews of war but as cobden afterwards so strenuously taught on the sinews of peace nor is it difficult to follow bentham in the passionate emphasis he lays upon security which to him is nothing less than the distinctive index of civilization no writer could be firmer here no one has made it clearer that without social security and the sense of security the reasonable expectations on which men planned their lives would be at an end accumulation would cease even subsistence he declares would no longer be forthcoming and society perish in want this radical is nothing less than an apostle of security the difficulty comes when we turn to equality it has been said it was to tocqueville's conclusion drawn from his searching survey of the united states that the pursuit of equality is the fundamental principle of democracy 
but it is not a dictum that Bentham would adopt, and his words are unmistakable. For should the pursuit of equality come into collision with security, it will not do to hesitate for a moment, equality must yield. And yet, of course, equality stands as one of the four recognized subordinate ends, and the question that rises and presses for an answer is, why? Why, if men are admittedly not equal, nor ever can be, should equality be thus elevated even to a second place? Why, if quashy nigger, to use Carlyle's vividly concrete antithesis, be not equal to Socrates or Shakespeare, nor Judas Iscariot to Jesus Christ, nor Bedlam and Gehenna equal to the New Jerusalem, should radicalism give to all alike not merely equality before the law, nor yet merely equality of political rights, but press on further to a greater equalization of worldly means. This is the crux of Benthamism, and small wonder, for it is also the crux of modern democracy. To this question there appear to be two answers. The one is that in the pursuit of equality, Benthamism is simply following the path of practicality. When a man takes his place in public life, be it as statesman and legislator or simply as ordinary citizen, he does so in the hope that he will act, through legislation and administration, upon great masses of his countrymen. This is his honorable ambition. But if this ambition is ever to be satisfied, it will only be when, as a man of action, he has reconciled himself to two things. Firstly, to dismiss as utopian the possibility of taking account of the endless inequalities of individuals, and secondly, to regard his fellow citizens for all purposes of legislation or public action as if they were equals. For in that way alone will he be likely to reap for his country the largest crop of happiness. This is, in effect, the interpretation suggested by Sir Henry Maine. Puzzled by the paradox that Bentham should pursue that very equality which he denies and derides, Maine comes to the conclusion that he adopted this course as simply a working rule for legislation. But there is another and a deeper justification of Benthamite equality than this. For when Bentham pled, and he pled with conviction, for a greater equality of worldly means, he certainly believed that he could prove his point, and his proof rests upon two propositions which, if they be true, are of nothing less than the first importance. The one is that to increase a man's means is to increase his happiness, and the second that as we pass upwards in the scale of wealth, the happiness which increased wealth undoubtedly brings does not by any means continue to increase in proportion to the increase of the wealth. On the contrary, a law of diminishing returns begins to operate at an early stage. For though an increase of ways and means will generally bring some increase of happiness in its possessor, it does not follow that the crop of happiness, any more than other crops, will go on increasing in proportion to the corresponding increments of wealth. A fresh one thousand pounds a year may doubtless give an added joy to life, even to a millionaire, but who will deny that it will stir but a feeble pulse of happiness in him in comparison with what a hundredth part of that sum would affect if it were added to the income of his clerk? It would seem to follow that the best policy, the policy, that is, which makes for greatest happiness, is that of distributing the elements of well-being widely as against the counter-policy, not unknown in politics, of concentrating them in the hands of a minority, however meritorious. Bentham urges this policy, more especially in regard to wealth. But the same argument applies to the distribution of civil and political rights, for these are conditions which, it may be argued, lie so manifestly on the very threshold of human happiness that the lack of them in the life of the ordinary man could not be compensated by the exceptional satisfactions, however intense, of the privileged few, however gifted. It is at any rate not to be denied 
that there is a point where even a modest increase of worldly means may make all the difference between struggling poverty and decent competency. And this is a difference of such vital import as far to outweigh in significance the difference that lies between competency and riches. It outweighs it because decent competence may carry in it not only emancipation from the miseries of want, but the opportunity for higher things, and not least for the life of active citizenship, which are of the essence of human happiness. It follows that there is no real inconsistency between Bentham's emphatic recognition of the inequality of men and his equally emphatic plea for democratic equality. On the contrary, it is to his credit that the clear perception that inequalities are stubborn and inevitable did not blind him to the fact that the steady democratic movement towards equality, equality of civil rights, of political rights, and even of wealth, is the path to greatest happiness. Nonetheless, the argument has its weaknesses, for it is not possible to accept the Benthamite case for equality strong though it be, without at least one serious qualification. If, at a first glance, it may seem axiomatic to say that to increase a man's material well-being is to increase his happiness, the axiom is one with only too many exceptions. Is not the course of industrial history strewn with instances in which material betterment has served only to disclose a lamentable inability to profit by it? Has it not even proved at times the deluding path to thriftlessness and destitution? A similar qualification applies to political rights. We sometimes call them boons and gifts, the boons and gifts democracy has to bestow. But the gift is one thing, the capacity to use it or even to learn to use it is another. Nor does it need many words to prove that the bestowal of franchises upon those who, for lack of intelligence and public spirit, or from defect of character, are incapable of using them is not the way to greatest happiness. This is the weak point in the Benthamite argument, and it has manifest far-reaching significance. Nothing is easier for a victorious democracy than to give. To civil rights it can add political rights in all degrees on to universal suffrage and payment of members, and to political rights it can, if it will, add a drastic socialism designed to level up and level down existing inequalities of wealth. The crux comes in finding reasonable assurance that the recipients of the gift will be fit to use them for the public good. It is here that Benthamism came short. It needed the closer analysis of J. S. Mill to open its eyes to the magnitude of the task of making the individual fit for all that Bentham was so eager to give. And yet, Bentham, despite his cheerful optimism, was not without misgivings of his own as to the tendencies of the egalitarian spirit. For the context in which he so decisively subordinates equality to security discloses in this arch-radical a conservative spirit, of which perhaps we have not yet suspected him. What else can we say of a writer so sympathetic with private property in land as to rejoice over the enclosure of commons by private landowners, and so tender to private capital, and the expectations which it fosters as to declare that the hostile sword in its utmost furies is a less dreadful prospect than the victory of socialism. If there be any latter-day radicals who mourn over this lapse of a philosophic brother, they must find their consolation in the fact that if Bentham thus stopped short of radicalism's furthest, he did so for the same reason that made him go so far. No one can deny that he went far, so far indeed that he was quite prepared witness his handling of pain and the rights of man, to reform radicalism itself, even to its foundations. And if he did not go further, we know why. Because his eye was ever on the public good, in the name of which he was as firm to resist socialism as he was resolute to destroy monopoly. 
and yet we must not suppose that fears of socialism ever gave pause to his democratic ardor or energies. As the years went on, it was more and more to democratic government he looked for the realization of his hopes, even his hopes of legal reform, and it was to the elaboration or over-elaboration of his theories of democratic government that by far the greater part of the last twenty years of his life was given. For this reason, if for no other, we must not leave him without asking what this theory was. Macaulay may help us to put it in fewest words. The higher and middling orders, said that self-confident reforming Whig, are the natural representatives of the human race. With the change of a single word, the statement will exactly express the views of Bentham. For representatives, read plunderers. The higher and middling orders are the natural plunderers of the human race. It is no travesty to say that this was Bentham's settled conviction. It was not cynicism, nor did he see in the fact anything specially discreditable to the higher and middling orders. He saw nothing other than human nature. For in his psychology men are by nature self-interested to the core, and never to be counted upon to stir so much as a little finger, such are his own words, for the public, save and except in so far as it is for their own interest to do so. Footnote. So in the deontology, but as this has sometimes been regarded as no fair transcript of Bentham's views, one might add the following from the Constitutional Code. Whatsoever evil it is possible for a man to do for the advancement of his own private and personal interest at the expense of the public interest, that evil, sooner or later he will do, unless by some means or other, intentional or otherwise, he be prevented from doing it. End footnote. Results follow. The rulers of men being themselves no more than men, are in no case fit to be trusted with irresponsible power. It is so with monarchs. It is so with aristocracies. It is so with the representative rulers of democracy. Left to themselves, they will all gravitate in the same sinister direction. Nature is strong. Nature will work. And in the name of governing, by whatever name the government may be called, they will batten on the commonwealth. There is but one sufficient security to see in every man in power, be it hereditary power, be it elective power, a possible robber of the public. It is to minimize confidence in them, to maximize control over them, or, as he is fond of putting it, to make public functionaries uneasy. In other words, to enforce to the last jot and tittle, and by every constitutional device, universal suffrage, annual parliaments, vote by ballot, and so on, responsibility to that great public, that large voting majority whose interests are supposed to be identical with the end of government, and whose interests are safe, so Bentham thought, in no hands but their own. If it be true, according to the homely proverb, that the eye of the master makes the ox fat, it is no less so that the eye of the public makes the statesman virtuous. For it is thus and only thus that public service is to be won from the jaws of private greed. Few doctrines have so strangely united logic and paradox. The thinker who would give every man a vote sees in every child of nature a possible plunderer of the public. It is the man in whom selfishness had taken the form of benevolence who insists that in his countrymen benevolence will take the form of selfishness. J. Bentham, the most philanthropic of the philanthropic, so he describes himself, but clearly he was not prepared to think his own case common. For this theory of government, if we may dignify it by that title, there is a certain historical apology. Some think that it was not difficult in England between 1816 and 1832, to minimize confidence in rulers. And for purposes of parliamentary reform, it served a purpose to make a Tory government uneasy. But when all is said, it is seldom that a great democratic doctrine has been more lamentably travestied. 
no one is likely to deny that a democracy must call its representatives to account. It does so for the simple and honorable reason that it is minded for better or for worse to manage or to mismanage its own affairs and to keep power in its own hands. It would not be a real democracy if it did otherwise. Irresponsible power in a ruler and a real and active democratic citizenship are ideas which simply will not fuse. But it does not follow that the democratic elector need transform himself into a detective and his chosen representative into a possible public plunderer from whom the paralyzing and insulting eye of suspicion is never to be lifted. There need be no distrust at all. A representative may be a saint or a sage, and a constituency may believe him to be both. It will none the less expect him to give an account of his stewardship, from no other motive than from the just democratic desire to play its part in the business of the nation. It is this that Bentham appears unable to see. In his theory, there seems no middle point between groaning under the tyranny of irresponsible rulers and exercising the tyranny of suspicious subjects. Ridden to death by a selfish theory of human nature, of which his own life and his ideal are a splendid contradiction, he is so ingeniously busy in devising checks upon possible plunderers of the public that it does not seem to occur to him that he might effectually scare away its truest, most efficient, and most honorable servants. Under our democratic dispensation, for better or for worse, the ruler must be the servant of the subject. But there are two manners of service. One is the service of the delegate, steeped in pledges, mortgaged in judgment, enslaved to committees and caucuses. The other is the service of the representative, who, as Burke has it, being a lover of freedom, is himself determined to be free, free to serve his constituents with his judgment. For the worst of all slaveries is an enslavement of the judgment. The worst of all tyrannies, the tyranny that degrades a man of sense and honor into a voluble mouthpiece of foregone conclusions. Who will deny that there are many decisions of which a great electorate, by reasons of its size, its inexperience, its want of knowledge, its want of time, its passions, is inherently incapable. Who will deny that it is one of the highest ambitions of democratic freedom to enlist, by its votes, the loyal service of vigorous and independent minds? Democracy has long learnt to hate the rulers whose subjects are slaves. It has not enough learnt to despise the slaves whose masters are subjects. It is the fatal flaw in the Benthamite theory of government that in its minimization of confidence and its maximization of control, it would hasten the coming of the ill-starred day of delegative democracy. And it is for this reason that in the name of the public good, of which he was the prophet, we may take courage to say that one of the reforms which Bentham left unaccomplished was the radical reform of the Benthamite theory of government. End of section three. Section four of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two. The Utilitarian Optimism of John Stuart Mill. Part one. John Stuart Mill took perhaps the most effective means in his power of writing himself down optimist. Into a political economy deeply tinctured by the teachings of Malthus and dominated from first to last by a recognition of the niggardliness of nature, he introduced that chapter entitled The Stationary State, which embodies surely one of the most cheerful forecasts that ever came from philosophic pen. For does it not tell us that mankind is advancing to a social state in which, thanks to an assured and permanent supply of their material needs, they will be delivered for ever from the trampling, crushing, elbowing, and treading on each other's heels which form the existing type of social life, 
and thereby left free to give themselves with undivided energies to political, moral, and intellectual development, to the enjoyment of nature, and to the influences of solitude, that cradle of thoughts and aspirations. Could Ruskin himself have wished for more? Yet there the picture stands, no passing vision too good to be true, but a serious forecast which claims to be rooted in economic tendencies already at work in our midst. Nor is this a solitary passage. There is another in the utilitarianism, which reads more like a dream of eighteenth-century perfectibility than a deliberate utterance of the nineteenth century. It must be quoted at length, because it is precisely its sustained hopefulness that makes it so impressive. No one whose opinion deserves a moment's consideration can doubt that most of the great positive evils of the world are in themselves removable, and will, if human affairs continue to improve, be in the end reduced within narrow limits. Poverty in any sense implying suffering may be completely extinguished by the wisdom of society, combined with the good sense and providence of individuals. Even that most intractable of enemies, disease, may be indefinitely reduced in dimensions by good physical and moral education and proper control of noxious influences, while the progress of science holds out a promise for the future of still more direct conquests over this detestable foe. And every advance in that direction relieves us from some, not only of the chances which cut short our lives, but what concerns us still more, which deprive us of those in whom our happiness is wrapped up. As for vicissitudes of fortune and other disappointments connected with worldly circumstances, these are principally the effect either of gross imprudence, of ill-regulated desires, or of bad or imperfect social institutions. All the grand sources, in short, of human suffering are in a great degree, many of them, almost entirely conquerable by human care and effort and though their removal is grievously slow, though a long succession of generations will perish in the breach before the conquest is completed, and this world becomes all that, if will and knowledge were not wanting, it might easily be made, yet every mind sufficiently intelligent and generous to bear a part, however small and inconspicuous in the endeavour, will draw a noble enjoyment from the contest itself, which he would not for any bribe in the form of selfish indulgence consent to be without. It will not be denied that this is optimism, but it is not enough to call it optimism. We must add that it is optimism which triumphed over the keenest perception of obstacles, a perception of obstacles which parts it, for a whole world, from the millennium of the visionary or the easy worthless dreams of the fool's paradise. These obstacles, in truth, darken for Mill all along the line. Some men are optimists because they believe in the beneficence of nature, other men because they believe in the omnipotence of God. But Mill believes in neither. Is he discoursing upon nature? It is to tell us that nature so far from meriting our trust, still less our encomia, is in point of fact guilty of every crime for which men are hanged. Footnote. His words are, In sober truth, nearly all the things which men are hanged or imprisoned for doing to one another are nature's everyday performance. Three Essays on Religion, page 28. End footnote. Is he speculating about God? It is in effect to tell us that the belief that God's in his heaven is very far from a guarantee that all's right with the world, as Browning puts it, being indeed a belief tenable only by those who are prepared to acquit God of the manifest evil of the world by denying his omnipotence. No writer could more frankly face the conclusions of his logic. Divine goodness and divine omnipotence are declared to sunder before the force of hostile fact. 
Footnote. The notion of a providential government by an omnipotent being for the good of his creatures must be entirely dismissed. Ibid, page 243. End footnote. This is only what might be expected from Mill's speculative position. In a sensationalistic theory of knowledge like his, unable at utmost speculative stretch to rise above empirical generalizations which, for aught the human mind can know, may be subverted to their foundations by larger experience, there is manifestly no room for any absolute trust, persistent in the face of ugly facts, that somehow good will be the final goal of ill. Mill, be it clearly understood, is not an agnostic nor an atheist. He is not unwilling to believe that there may be a God. For have we not the argument from design, such as it is? But even so, the existence of such a God would furnish but slender security for the final triumph of goodness. For though God may be regarded as the foe of evil, he is certainly never regarded by Mill as its master. This is the first difficulty, a difficulty rooted in Mill's fundamental philosophical principles. Not in Mill, therefore, need we expect to find that pantheistic faith that has often strengthened the poet, the prophet, the reformer, by carrying the assurance, even in the darkest hour, that the nations are struggling forward to some far-off divine event, some end greater than they know. Mazzini's watchword, God and the People, is not possible here. The optimism of Mill must rest, if it rest anywhere, upon his faith in man. Yet this does but bring us face to face with a new and a not less formidable difficulty, for it must now be said that no optimist has ever avowed so low an estimate of his fellow men as Mill. This is beyond mistaking, for it is the central paradox of Mill's social teaching that he is, on the one hand, the greatest thinker of English democracy, and on the other, the persistent censor, shall we say libeler, of all sorts and conditions, of all ranks and classes of his fellow countrymen. Illustration is easy. At Yarmouth, so he writes when seventeen to his corrosive father, dined with a leading radical, not much better than a mere radical. It was in this spirit he was brought up free, as he tells us, from the contagion of vulgar modes of thinking. It was the same in his later life. His whole essay on the subjection of women, says Fitzjames Stevens, and not without reasons, goes to prove that of the two sexes which between them constitute the human race, one has all the vices of a tyrant, and the other all the vices of a slave. English society, he declares in his autobiography, to be unfit for the society of the man of intellect, unless, indeed, it should accept him as an apostle. He is a very candid friend of the people. He calls them the herd, sometimes the common uncultivated herd. When he writes on democratic government, it is to diffuse a terror of the majority, and when he advocates parliamentary reform, it is to tell us that of the few points on which the English as a people are entitled to the moral preeminence with which they are accustomed to compliment themselves at the expense of other nations, the one of greatest importance is that the higher classes do not lie, and the lower, though mostly habitual liars, are ashamed of lying. When he stood as radical candidate for Westminster, this passage was raked up and read out in a public meeting, with the question if he wrote it. I did, was the answer, and indeed there can be no doubt at all that it embodies his deliberate convictions. Passages like these can scarcely be said to savor of optimism. They seem to reek of pessimism. They would embarrass any thinker, and doubly do they embarrass one who is all for democracy. This in two ways. For in the first place they give a handle to the cynic. The cynic might well turn round upon the writer of these belittling estimates with the question, Why, if men be indeed so bad as this, that great democratic end, the happiness of the greatest number, should seem worth so much as the scuffle of a contested election? In vain to exalt the ideal of political benevolence, 
the area of benevolence might well shrivel into the area of blight before this withering blast of calculated disparagement as well build a temple of rotten bricks as rear an ideal of public good out of lives that are individually contemptible and in the second place to our cynic's retort we might add the reminder not surely out of place that these tyrants and slaves these philistines in need of an apostle these habitual liars what are they but the only available nay the chosen instruments through whom the democratic reformer has elected to work the reminder be it added is doubly to the point here because as we shall abundantly see it was emphatically in men that this democratic reformer set his trust there have been reformers who believed that good institutions may do much to atone for imperfect men but mill is not one of them his trust is not in institutions but in men if the working classes are to have a future it will be by the prudence of individual working men if representative government is indeed to be the best of all forms of government this will rest with the individual voter if social life in general is to attain a full vigorous many-sided development again it will depend upon the free self-realization of individual men who say the thing they think and act the thing they say it is as we have said mill's faith for the future turns on his faith in men yes may we not add and in such men in the herd in the common uncultivated herd this is the second difficulty but there is a third and it is one before which many an optimist has gone down this third difficulty is the economic problem to the magnitude of which the eyes of mill as economist could not be blind it was in truth by his frank recognition of this inexorable problem that mill decisively separated himself from the earlier radicals some of them for example the metaphysically mad godwin and his fanatical friend holcroft had like other literary leaders of the french revolution times been optimists in point of fact the two just named did not despair of even while still in this life vanquishing that one great eternal monarchy the monarchy of death their optimism was confident but then it was of little value for though they hoped to abolish death they had somehow missed the fact that mankind had to reckon with subsistence it was far otherwise with mill economist from the days when he had his first economic lessons from his father as they walked the lanes of surrey he had all that familiarity with the economic obstacles to progress which the political economy of the nineteenth century has served to disclose and which our socialists have done their best to popularize above all he had read malthus and significantly he tells us that it was malthus who first turned his thoughts to social questions we may say he repaid the debt for to the last social questions always turned his thoughts to malthus the results upon him of this potent influence were far-reaching and final and they separated him both in diagnosis and remedy not only from the radicals of the revolution but even from bentham and his own father their diagnosis located the disease of the body politic in bad political institutions their remedy prescribed radical political reform in their blind enlightenment they seemed to fancy that it needed but to sweep the earth of tories and whigs to bring a new heaven and a new earth mill was not so easily satisfied the plague spot which his eye discerned lay deeper than any political abuse even the worst and it was one not to be cured by all the political reforms that had entered into the heart of tom paine and bentham put together to conceive for economic analysis had revealed to him certain facts of the first magnitude with which all future progress was bound to reckon one of them was what he called the most important proposition in political economy the law of diminishing returns from land he was aware of course that this law could be counteracted 
he knew that the improvement of the industrial arts could postpone the time at which in any given country it began to operate and even then apply an effectual drag to its action yet such considerations did but furnish qualifications they did not upset this law they did not extinguish the tendencies due as these were to the physical properties of the soil for which it found the formula let but the struggle of man with nature go on till it became acute let but nature or human nature bring into the world more mouths to feed and forthwith this law would disclose itself in its true colours shall we say its true terrors as a statement of one of the fundamental conditions of man's life upon the planet to mill this is ultimate the niggardliness of nature is to him a basal fact of human existence this however is but half the truth niggardly of meat nature is anything but niggardly of mouths this perception came to mill early it never left him he is never weary of denouncing the thoughtlessness the improvidence the irresponsibility that bring children into the world heedless of how they are to be fed nor with all his passion for liberty did he hesitate to urge the imposition of legal restrictions upon improvident marriages it is not to be wondered at for to the end of his days he remained convinced that all the gains of social progress would be lost if the masses of the people could not learn to meet the niggardliness of nature by mastery of this menacing growth of population it is not our present object to ask if in all this he was right there are some who think that malthus has been refuted there are others who believe that he has been refuted so often that there are evidently serious difficulties in refuting him be this as it may the point that here concerns us is that as mill believed there lay straight across the path of progress this population question not in political institutions not in the capitalistic system not in competition not in private capital or private property in none of these things lay the really formidable foe not in them but in the niggardliness of nature wedded to the improvidence of man this the supreme economic obstacle to progress is moreover magnified for mill by a further anticipation he could not admit except provisionally the force of the consideration by which the menace of an overcrowded world is commonly met the indefinite growth of capital he was of course aware that capital in all prosperous countries tends to increase he knew none knew better all the causes that make for this but behind all these causes he saw the operation of a law which vitally influenced all his forecasts the law that profits tend to a minimum in other words despite the enormous growth of capital which was ceaselessly going on before his eyes he foresaw the coming of a day when by the inexorable action of economic law profits would gradually descend to a point at which further saving would cease to be worth while he was of course aware that here again there were counteractives waste of capital exportation of capital mechanical inventions commercial enterprise business management nor was he likely to miss the obvious fact that small profits upon large capitals may long suffice to stimulate savings and enterprise but still the day was as he thought always coming gradually but inevitably capital was filling up the fields of available investment and in so doing heralding the dawn of a day when by sheer failure of adequate inducement to save it would become stationary so firmly was he convinced of this that he urged this tendency as one of the main grounds for anticipating the coming of that stationary state in which as we have seen he so confidently believed now mill himself did not look forward to this consummation with any misgiving we have seen that he looked forward to the stationary state with enthusiasm it was one of his ideals but then it was so and it evoked those eloquent forecasts already quoted only because he believed that stationary capital would have as its accompaniment stationary population here comes the misgiving for were the first of these results to come to pass and not the second 
were capital to find its limits while population still went on increasing what then would there be no risk that instead of the stationary state with all its glowing adjuncts society would find itself moving steadily to poverty and famine this it is true may seem a vain alarm capital one might suggest could never under the conditions of the stationary state be stationary the growth of intelligence of science of invention which mill hoped and believed would never be stationary would not fail to find new sources of investment so far the stationary state would prove economically a fiction this however is not mill's view he believed in the tendency of economic progress to bring the stationary state of capital just as he believed in the law of diminishing returns from land hence the intensified acuteness of the population question for while niggard nature stands sponsor for the one law and the economic system for the other who will be bold enough to predict that human nature will play its part in controlling what a writer of repute has called the devastating torrent of children End of section four section five of six radical thinkers by john mccunn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two the utilitarian optimism of john stuart mill part two and yet all these difficulties put together seem never to have daunted mill distrustful of god censorious of men open-eyed to the dangers that beset democracy and to the economic obstacles to progress he never seriously doubted the advent of a bright future for mankind and for his country carlyle once called him mystic here said that great prophet as he laid down an early article of mills here is a new mystic strange title surely for this man who set such store upon clear ideas yet in a sense the epithet is not misplaced for it was not upon the england of his own day that mill's eyes were fixed and his hopes fed it was upon a far-off future upon a changed and a better world in the sure coming of which he believed in the face of every difficulty with a buoyant faith such as many a visionary might envy this being so it is time to ask from what sources this faith in the future drew its strength and vitality the first step to an answer is found in mill's general attitude as a political thinker and for this the only adequate word is radicalism for though one might not say that the condition of england question tortured mill as it did charles kingsley or that it awakened in him the siwa indignatio of carlyle or ruskin he was none the less deeply dissatisfied with the status quo and profoundly convinced that something radical had to be done proof abounds for mill we must remember was nurtured by reformers to be a reformer this was the educational experiment which on the testimony of miss fox bentham and the elder mill tried upon john these two set themselves to train him almost from his cradle to carry on the radical tradition and he himself welcomed the mission with enthusiasm we have his own record that in his fifteenth year he embraced benthamism as a religion footnote autobiography page sixty seven i now had opinions a creed a doctrine a philosophy in one among the best senses of the word a religion End footnote. nor did he ever flag in the cause of reform he openly avowed his sympathy with uncontented characters i want to excite your passions he said comparatively late in life at a land reform meeting the passion of the many is needed to conquer the self-interest of the few so runs another avowal he was beyond all rivalry the literary leader of the radicalism of his day and when he had enriched the literature of political and social reform by his writings he entered parliament and worked there for the cause as radical member for westminster 
and though as the years went on he broke with benthamism he never broke nor wished to break with radicalism yet his radicalism had its peculiarities like benthamite radicalism it was philosophical it rested on ideas but unlike benthamite radicalism one of the ideas it rested on was the belief in social continuity for of course historic continuity had been no concern of bentham with his utilitarian hatchet bentham had cut history in two into the ages before benthamism which sat in darkness and the ages after benthamism which were to see a great light mill knew better he had read Comte, he had perused michelet and the french historians above all he had made a study of coleridge and interchanged ideas with the coleridgians maurice and sterling his openness of mind his readiness to learn from other minds did the rest he made the discovery to put the point in pregnant words of his own drawn from coleridge that revolutions are sudden to the unthinking only it was a pestilent heresy in the eyes of the orthodox benthamites nor from the commendable consideration for men to whom he owed much did he venture to avow it in the great essay on coleridge till bentham and his father had passed away but it marks his repudiation of those new beginnings which in ignorant disregard of the past are only too apt to issue in reactionary endings we might call this conservatism and doubtless we may find in it one reason why mill had little in him of the revolutionist even his extremist suggestion the appropriation by the state of the unearned increment was far removed from confiscation yet conservatism would be a misnomer here for the real significance of this wider outlook is not that it shook his radicalism but that it helped more perhaps than any other single influence to give it its decisively and even passionately individualistic character for as mill read history it told him that the old dispensation of status under which the situation of man is the arbiter of his duties had gone not to come again and that the new dispensation in which by dint of his own free choice and self-assertion man becomes the arbiter of his situation had come there was a time for the morality of submission and obedience a time also for the morality of chivalry and protection of the weak by the strong but these days as he tells us in certain pregnant pages of the subjection of women had passed or were passing history itself had turned that earlier page and what remained was that every man and every woman free enlightened self-protective self-assertive should hold their own fate and fortunes in their own hands mill's position here is singularly interesting it has often been remarked that though he lived on till darwinism was in the air he yet held himself surprisingly aloof from the application of evolutionary ideas to politics he was shy of using in this connection the biological categories organism adaptation differentiation integration with which spencer has made the reading world familiar it is indeed the very point upon which spencer claims characteristically to be superior to him yet mill was not blind to the facts he had learned to do justice to history he had accepted the idea of historic continuity witness the essay on coleridge no one he there writes and it would be easy to prop the weighty words by others to the same effect can calculate what struggles which the cause of improvement has yet to undergo might have been spared if the philosophers of the eighteenth century had done anything like justice to the past nor is it enough to see in passages like this merely the usual lesson that radicalism must temper its reforms by reckoning with the force of circumstances for they carry in them the further claim so explicitly expressed in the pages of the subjection of women that the whole current of historical development 
makes steadily for that dispensation of individual free choice and government by consent, which from the days of Vane and the men of the Commonwealth had been the radical tradition. This does not mean, of course, that it was in history that Mill found the final justification of this central principle in his creed. To the last, he was a utilitarian, and the eye of the utilitarian is primarily on the future, not on the past, on ends, and not on origins. And therefore, when in the liberty he comes to state the case for his individualism, his central point is to prove that individuality is the essence of social well-being. But it would be an injustice to the breadth and sanity of his creed to fail to recognize that he was not minded to leave the appeal to history to be the monopoly of conservatives, nor slow to claim, as neither Payne nor Bentham so much as cared to claim, that history was on the side of radicalism. For the individualistic radicalism of Mill was neither an arrogant dogma, like the exploded radicalism of natural rights, nor was it a narrow and bald utilitarianism like that of Bentham. It was a creed fed on a wider outlook, and for that very reason held with a deeper conviction as the years went on. But it is gratuitous to multiply evidence here. The masterly essay on Coleridge, a landmark in Mill's mental growth, is alone sufficient proof that its writer is to be classed not with the radicals of revolution who flouted history, but with the radicals of evolution who respect and even write history. It is, however, just here that the most formidable of his critics, both in economics and politics, have met him. With a true instinct they have assailed what has seemed to them this fanatical faith in the free choice of individuals. For there are persons, they say, and who can deny it, who are not capable of free choice that is of the slightest value. Children are not, nor savages. And if not these, what then, as Fitzjames Stephen bluntly puts it, of the ordinary peasant or the petty shopkeeper? The question, it is true, is not respectful to the peasant and the shopkeeper. But is it more disrespectful than certain remarks, we need not again repeat them, which had fallen from Mill himself? and now it would seem these harsh judgments have come home to roost. It cannot be denied that Mill has invited this assault. No writer has ever had more confident hopes of what liberty, that is, individual free choice, can do for men. No writer stirs deeper doubts as to whether men are fit for liberty. No writer urges more eloquently that all will be well if men are left to do as they please none awakens more lively misgivings as to what it may please them to do. We think of men as they are to be, and the heavens open. We recall what they are, and darkness descends. This brings us to the problem which every student of Mill must do his best to solve. Mill's optimism is unwavering. His individualism is final. But how, if individuals be as he paints them, can individualism justify optimism? The answer is not easy. But at least the clouds begin to lift when we turn to his political psychology and briefly compare his analysis of political motive with that of Bentham and James Mill. These two men, so diverse in temperament, so alike in creed, had confided to Mill the arc of utilitarianism and radicalism. They had planted in his mind beyond dislodgment the religion that the supreme political end is the greatest happiness of the greatest number. But to this gospel of political benevolence, there was another and a less glowing side. For however benevolent Bentham and the elder Mill had been in the end they set before mankind, and be it added, in the apostolic pertinacity with which they worked for it, neither of them ever expected of mankind that sacrifice which they themselves practiced. Their words are here beyond mistaking. By those two powerful minds, the ideal of a greatest happiness, sufficient to stagger imagination in its comprehensiveness, was tied to a doctrine of the inherent selfishness of the instruments, the men and women, 
by whom alone, under a democratic dispensation, it could be realized. There is no more glaring paradox in political literature. As we read of the end, it is altruism triumphant. The scene changes, and we find Bentham's declaration that men will not so much as lift a little finger for their neighbors, save in so far as it makes for their own interest, and James Mill's rasping laugh at the simpletons who reckon upon unselfish motives. It follows that the ultimate expectations of both cannot travel beyond the hope that by operating upon selfish human nature by the external sanctions more especially of law, public opinion, and religion, public service may be won from private selfishness. It is not within our scope to enter upon an examination of this psychology. Our concern must be narrowly limited to two points. The one is that it plants athwart the path of human progress a fatal barrier. Evil day for the service of the public, ill omen for human progress, if public spirit to become practical must shrivel to self-interest. The second point is that this is precisely the conclusion to which J. S. Mill, in defiance of the masterly influences of his teachers, was led for it was one of the greatest efforts in his life to free the Benthamite philosophy of reform from the Benthamite theory of motive. Upon this there can be no manner of doubt. For though the elder Mill labored, perhaps more strenuously than ever father has labored with son, to make the younger Mill an orthodox Benthamite, it is to his credit that however undesignedly he made him more. With his Benthamism, the son developed another thing, that power of learning from other minds which was the one possession in which with the modesty of greatness he claimed to be superior to other men. The inevitable result followed. His mind burst the narrow limits of sectarian Benthamism. Receptive where his teachers were impervious, he listened to other voices, to the apologists of Christian ethics like Maurice and Sterling to the advocates of the religion of humanity, even to the gospel of sacrifice as this stands written in Sardo Resartus, with the result that he came to read life and experience so differently from his masters in Benthamism as to declare that human nature has it in it to pursue the public good, even, if need be, at total sacrifice of personal happiness. End of Section 5《Section Six of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Two: The Utilitarian Optimism of John Stuart Mill, Part Three. This stands written in the utilitarianism, for though that well-known apologia has not convinced the world, it has defined the position of the apologist. Grant that he signally fails to reconcile psychological hedonism and utilitarian altruism. Grant that he may even be said to fail grotesquely in bridging the great gulf between the psychological asseveration that all human desire is, as a matter of fact, desire for pleasure, and the ethical demand that every individual is bound to pursue the happiness of mankind. We may still carry from the pages of this perplexing treatise at least two affirmations of decisive significance. One is the statement, uncompromisingly explicit, that, as the world is at present constituted, the individual must be prepared to face the complete sacrifice of his own pleasures. The other, writ large in the lengthy chapter on the sanctions of the utilitarian principle, is the contention that human nature is capable of developing a social feeling, so deeply seated, a subjective feeling in one's own mind, he calls it with tautological emphasis, and so inseparably interwoven with social ideas that it resists the dissolving power of all analysis and can be broken through only on penalty of remorse. Nor does Mill leave us in any doubt that in comparison with this internal and indeed ineradicable feeling of obligation, 
the external sanctions so prominent in benthamism are subordinate and ineffective what thus appears in the philosophical treatise comes to light in still more memorable words spoken to miss fox at a time when a private sorrow had evoked his inmost thoughts no one he then said should attempt anything to benefit his age without at first making a stern resolution to take up his cross and bear it mill seems to have come to this conviction partly at any rate through what he calls the mental crisis of his life one of the most suggestive chapters in the range of autobiography he tells us that there came a time in his life it was at the end of his twentieth year when he put to himself the question whether if the end the public good for which he had hitherto been working were forthwith realized the result would bring him personal happiness and he adds that the answer he could not suppress was no hitherto he had been laboring for the happiness of mankind with an industry a cheerfulness an optimism that was the envy and admiration of all who knew him he had even been accustomed to felicitate himself on the certainty of a happy lot which he enjoyed through placing his happiness in something durable and distant but somehow this shadow fell and the thought of the public happiness lost its charm it had not vanished it had not even changed it stood there the same supreme object it had ever been as clear as ever perhaps clearer before the mental eye but it was no longer happiness to think of it nor any happiness to pursue it the effects of this experience in alliance doubtless with other influences were permanent one was the conviction the so-called paradox of hedonism that to aim at personal happiness is not the way to attain it and the other a repudiation of the legacy of benthamism that mankind are not to be moved to public service save by touching them in their selfish interests not that he ever underrated the motive of self-interest he was still only too much his father's son to underrate the selfishness of men as they are just as little does he deny the value of the external sanctions always in his estimates of institutions justice enough is done to the value of the appeal they make to self-interest he remarks explicitly upon the folly of premature attempts to dispense with the inducements of private interest in social affairs nor is it to be forgotten that even when he is arguing for the depth and strength of his social sanction he hastens to affirm that it is not to be supposed that it is more than a minority in whom it is to be found yet even when every qualification is made the step he took here was decisive it cut the philosophy of reform loose from a theory of motive almost cynical in its selfishness it carried the assertion that human nature is at any rate capable even of the cross need it be said that this is a vital point it is ever a hard task to prove to the individual reformer that he will personally profit by public service it is hard even when the ends in view are near and certain it is impossible when these ends say the waging of a war the annexation of a dependency the reform of a landed system the organization of education are inevitably distant and precarious of achievement in all such cases the small fraction of personal pleasure that is expected to accrue to the individual reformer even when it is added to the larger fraction of pleasure which the hope of such reforms may already stir in the reformer's breast these though they are items not to be despised are not enough to move the will to resolute and unselfish action who is there who does not know how easy it is in the ordinary walks of life to let the mad world go its way who is there who has had experience of public work who does not know the sacrifices of time care money counter-attractions which even the lesser social causes inexorably exact it is not that sacrifices need to be in contradiction to the pursuit of personal good there is a sense in which the sacrifice of life itself 
may be accepted as the greatest personal good for the person who makes it. But that is not the question here in issue. The Benthamite doctrine is that the personal good that moves the will is ultimately personal pleasure. This is its fatal weakness. It is untenable as a result of psychological analysis and it is doubly untenable when it is offered as part of a philosophy for reformers who might well despair if the appeal to live and strive for public good is to be limited to the coincidences, so hard to prove, of sacrificing service and personal pleasurable satisfaction. Hence the magnitude of the debt of philosophical radicalism to Mill. He saw, as Mazzini and Carlyle saw, with still clearer eyes, that as the world is constituted, the hedonism of his teachers was impotent to justify and still more to evoke sacrifice, and in that conviction he labored to deliver utilitarianism from the reproach that, as expounded by Bentham and James Mill, it fastened upon the cause of reform the forlorn task of preaching an end, nothing if not unselfish, to a world constitutionally incapable of one genuine unselfish motive. This is, however, no more than a first step. Even granting that human nature is capable of the cross, it remains to establish the probability that human nature will soar to this altitude, especially in view of the fact that, as we have abundantly seen, upon Mill's own showing, mankind as they are seem by no means minded to do so. Where are the influences to work the miracle? the miracle of transforming the rank and file of Mill's denunciations into the public-spirited democracy of his aspirations. Speaking broadly, it may be said that Mill's hopes for democracy lie along four lines. These are legislation, voluntary association, education, and individual vigor and self-assertion. The main stress will be found to lie on the two last. As regards legislation, Mill is too often popularly classified as an apostle of what Huxley called administrative nihilism, and Carlyle the liberty of leaping over precipices, in other words, of laissez-faire in its extremest form. This is a mistake. It was but half of the plan of the memorable essay on liberty to point out when and why society and government ought not to intervene. The other part of the plan, as Mill himself told George Grote, whose orthodoxy was greatly alarmed thereby, was to point out where it ought to, but did not intervene. And the latter part of this plan is so far from subordinate as to involve legal restraints on some of the most private affairs in life. Mill is for compulsory education, for legal prohibition of improvident marriages, and for legal restraint upon the domestic tyrants who would condemn their children to premature labor in the name of freedom of contract. Nor is this advocate of liberty at all averse to see the finger of the state in public works, colonization, charity, hours of labor, endowment of research. It was not without reason, therefore, that he gave so much of his thought to the problem of the best form of government for government had, upon his theory of its functions, not a little to do. It is here that Mill's divergence from the Manchester school is quite pronounced, for in the attitude of Bright and Cobden, to popular government there is always a peculiar reservation. They are prepared, of course, like the staunch radicals they were, to set the people in power, but they are not minded to allow the people to be overactive in its exercise, they present the democracy with a weapon beyond all price, but the weapon is to be on no account produced too often. They are eloquent over a wide franchise, and equally eloquent in preaching the minimization of the government that is to rest upon it. Far otherwise with Mill. Representative government was in his eyes a real and effective instrument of progress. And yet Mill's faith in government had limits of decisive and far-reaching application. A. One limit lay deeply rooted in an all but aristocratic distrust of majorities. 
no one has written down the majority not even herbert spencer or sir henry maine more strenuously than he he places it of course in power a democrat could not do otherwise but no sooner has he done it than catching up the note of alarm from de tocqueville whose democracy in america profoundly influenced his thought he diffuses a terror of majorities and takes every security that ingenuity can devise against the multiplied tyranny of the multitude a tyranny as he reminds us more terrible far than individual despotism as leaving no loophole of escape to its victims like the earlier radicals he hated the despotism of kings and aristocracies but he went beyond them in dreading the despotism of any power even though it was the power of the people hence his defence of government by majority resolves itself into the argument that an unresisted majority is incapable of governing hence his plea for an organized opposition under all forms of government hence in parliamentary reform the greater weight he would give the educated voter hence his almost fanatical plea for the representation of minorities hence his eagerness to welcome suggestions the elaborate scheme of hair for example which might shape the representative system so as to counteract the influence of collective mediocrity previous radicals had a deep distrust of rulers this radical had a deep distrust of voters as a radical he was of course bound to believe that somehow the rule of the majority would make for order and progress but he is manifestly convinced that a prime condition of this is that the majority must be withstood to the face his attitude here is characteristically summed up in that singular avowal of his intended policy as member of parliament to expend all the popularity he got from his books in upholding unpopular opinions so firm was his belief that the way to serve the state was to beard the crowd b this was one limit to his faith in legislation the other lay in his doctrine of the inviolability of the individual round every individual life he would have us draw a charmed circle not to be infringed within which each citizen was to do as he pleased without let or hindrance either from law or social pressure all encroachment upon this was his abhorrence and he tried to justify himself by his well-known distinction between acts that affect our neighbours when law may justifiably intervene to protect them and self-regarding acts when law is to be met in all cases by an uncompromising hands off this distinction is untenable as we shall see but it at any rate satisfied its author to the last he remained convinced that there is a large tract of life the region of self-regarding acts with which neither law nor administration nor public opinion have anything to do unless to guard it jealously from invasion from these two limits upon legislation the inference is obvious he who believes in the fallibility not to say the folly of majorities and the inviolability of self-regarding acts is not likely under a democratic dispensation to look for social salvation to government and indeed this comes out clearly in mill's attitude to socialism he was far from unsympathetic here he had emancipated himself from cut and dried economic dogmas he did not believe that the laws of distribution were laws of nature he believed that they were pre-eminently alterable he wished to alter them still less did he soothe himself like bastia with the false flattering unction that the economic organism was a self-acting harmony on the contrary he made the sorrowful admission that it is doubtful if all our boasted mechanical inventions have lightened the day's toil of a single human being he was always convinced that something radical had to be done he even recalls a time when he and his wife were not averse to be classed as socialists yet he never really moved from his persistent individualism all the modifications of the existing system for which he fought would still leave it standing strongly built upon private property 
private capital, inheritance, contract, and competition. Never even in his most socialistic hour did he forget that as the maladies of society were not ultimately due to human institutions, so it was not by even a subversion of human institutions, whether political or economic, that these maladies could be cured. The dangers of poverty and misery remained on his analysis ultimately traceable, as we have seen, to the niggardliness of nature and the improvidence of man. Even if socialistic legislation abolished private capital, this social revolution would he fear end only in disillusionment. It might burst up the existing form of society, but it would not remedy the evils which, as he thought, were wrongly ascribed to competition. His words in the political economy are explicit. No one can foresee the time when it, competition, will not be indispensable to progress. Or again, they, that is, those who charge upon competition the evils of existing society, forget that wherever competition is not, monopoly is, and that monopoly, in all its forms, is the taxation of the industrious for the support of indolence, if not of plunder. It was these convictions that turned his sympathies so strongly to voluntary cooperation. For Mill's individualism is not atomistic or anarchic. So long as collective action be voluntary, few are ready to go further in support either of cooperation or of trades unionism. End of section six. Section seven of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two The Utilitarian Optimism of John Stuart Mill. Part four. How far the hopeful eagerness with which Mill welcomed these two great movements especially cooperation, has been justified by results, it is beyond our limits to inquire. This must be left to those who can read the signs of the times. Our present concern is to note that we find here in a fresh form the problem which forever returns upon Mill. These same unsparing estimates of the herd, which bred distrust of popular majorities in politics, have to be reckoned with here also. Is there reason to think that the rank and file of the working class will be equal to the difficult task of reorganizing the national industries to any considerable extent upon cooperative lines? Can they command the requisite capital? Can they be trusted to choose the true masters in industry, to encourage enterprise, to provide for saving, and above all, to impose those restraints upon the improvident increase of their own numbers, without which cooperation is, in Mill's view, as impotent permanently to improve the lot of the laborer as our socialism or capitalism. To this momentous question, however, Mill's answer is an emphatic yes. But this affirmation is confident only upon one condition, the paramount condition that the citizen be educated. It is here we reach the pith of the whole matter. Convinced that a great gulf parted men as they are from men as they might become, convinced that in the dispensation of the future the individual, both in politics and in industry, must carry his own fate in his own hands, it was to education that Mill turned to bridge the gulf and to equip the citizen and the workman for his vocation. Given education and just laws, this is his postulate, this indeed, he says elsewhere, is not the principle, but the sole remedy if understood in its proper sense. Utilitarianism had always reared believers in education. It produced none more confident than Mill. It is in truth difficult to rise to the full height of Mill's optimism here, for however well grounded the hopes which democratic reformers repose in education, the miracles of education are gradual. 
it is inevitable that more than one generation must pass before its results can genuinely leaven the national mind and will. Political power, on the other hand, may be given swiftly. A single parliament may suffice. The point that emerges is obvious. Where is the security that the democracy may not ignorantly and disastrously blunder in the fateful interval? whilst democratic education is still an imperfectly realized aspiration and democratic power an accomplished fact nor is this the sole misgiving that must haunt the reader of mill for even if education had gone deep and far in the democracy is there reason to think that it would bring with it those provident restraints upon population and that resolute adherence to a standard of living which on Mill's analysis are more vital far to the future of the body politic than even the wisest use of democratic legislation or the success of voluntary organization. It is doubtful if there is anything in Mill adequately to reassure us here. He has himself to blame. Neither the individual citizen nor majorities can be said ever to recover from the stabs dealt to them by this foe of their own household. Yet there are considerations which, in justice to Mill's inherent reasonableness, it is but fair to bear in mind. One is that, so far as the political problem is concerned, he takes securities, weight to the educated voter, representation of minorities and such like, against abuse of democratic power. The other, and far the more important, is that the education from which he hopes so much is to be understood in the widest sense. It is not bounded by the three R's, or smatterings in science, or lessons in history and political economy, or that instruction about political and social duties which some would in these days add to the curriculum. It is, besides, an education in and through the exercise of social duties, that sort of training, in short, which comes of experience of workshop, of trades union, of cooperative association, of political committee, in a word, of participation in practical life. This is a vital point. Schooling, even when it includes not only instructions about duties, but the more important incitement to perform duties which comes of example, backed up by emotional and religious appeal, these are but preliminaries in the education of the citizen. They do but prepare the way for that growth in the capacity to perform civic duties which comes of having civic duties to perform. Nor can any teaching about duties, however excellent, suffice. For if it be paradox, it is also truth that no citizen can be proved fully fit for the gift of self-government, either in politics or industry, at the time when he first receives it. This for the simple reason that it is by actually using the gift that he makes himself practically fit for receiving it. Self-government can never be fully justified by its advocates before it is given. It can only be justified convincingly by the behavior of its recipients after they have received it. There is risk here, of course. Democracy, still raw to its work, whether in politics or industry, may blunder. It may blunder fatally, and believers in democracy must face this fact. But per contra, without running some risk of this kind, the education of the citizen, his education in political habit, sentiment, responsibility, and judgment, will never be so much as possible. This must be borne in mind in judging Mill. His countrymen, as he paints them, may seem but poorly fitted either for political or industrial power, but it is just by the exercise of political power and by self-government and industry that he believes they will be made capable of better things. Even the menace of overpopulation loses its terrors for him in face of this large view of education, for he did not doubt that with this kind of education would come a heightened standard of comfort, and with a standard of comfort, that fear of losing decencies in which economists have found the real preventive check. It may be that he was over-sanguine here. 
he perhaps underrated the strength of the instincts and passions that people the world and by consequence overrated the comparative influence of ideas it is what men think that determines how they act so runs his own avowal none the less it is not to ideas alone that he trusts in this connection but always to ideas in alliance with the discipline of life and experience nor must we forget that with all his enthusiasm for education mill never staked his faith in democracy on the coming of a day when the initiative in betterment was to come from the rank and file let there be no mistake here this apostle of democracy was in certain aspects one of the most aristocratic writers of his generation the initiation of all wise and noble things so runs his deliberate conclusion comes and must come from individuals generally at first from some one individual the honour and glory of the average man is that he is capable of following that initiative that he can respond internally to wise and noble things and be led to them with his eyes open footnote on liberty chapter three the whole context is a vehement plea for the highly gifted and instructed one or few End footnote. the sentences are startling and sweeping and if we read them apart from the general context of doctrine we might fancy we had somehow strayed from the gospel of democratic radicalism into the pages of anti-democratic hero-worship they remain in any case a proof that mill knew how to value leadership but mill is not carlyle we must press those significant concluding words with his eyes open and remember that in the last resort it was not to the heaven-sent hero that mill looked for social salvation but to the vigorous self-assertion of the individual man this is the theme of the essay on liberty which mill thought was of all his writings the one most likely to be read in the years to come it would be needed he thought to stem the despotism legislative and other of collective mediocrity but this memorable essay would receive scant justice if read only as a protest against a meddlesome social despotism it is far more like the areopagitica by the side of which lord morley justly places it it is a trumpet call to thought speech and action a passionate positive incitement to self-assertion and self-realization this is the greater thing even were laissez-faire controversies forgotten the essay would remain one of the books to which readers would return as men return to the springs of mental and moral life it is in truth just for this reason that it is so well fitted to serve the more limited and negative purpose needful as direct arguments against paternal government may be especially in days when so many dread a coming socialism it is not necessarily the militant controversialist who does most for the cause rather is it the writer who can fire his fellow countrymen to fill their lives with thoughts words and deeds inherent strength of individual life is after all a better security than skill of argument against a possible tyranny either of law or of public opinion and it is this that in the pages of the liberty mill knows how to inspire convinced that strong and progressive individuality is the essence of all high civilization he catches up from von humboldt the phrase individual vigor and manifold diversity and sketches an inspiring picture of a society vigorous in thought eager in discussion strenuous in action rich in varied modes of life fertile even to eccentricity in experiments and living and peopled by citizens in whose energetic characters is reflected the many-coloured diversity of their many-coloured environment it is this this enriched and positive individualism not merely the limited individualism of hands-off of which mill is distinctively the prophet and be its flaws and fallacies what they may and we shall see that it has some these cannot destroy its substantial and permanent value as a democratic ideal there is no true citizen of a great and powerful state 
but must long that his country should be in some sense a microcosm of civilization. He cannot rest content, be the arguments for international specialization what they may, that his country should be no more than the workshop or emporium or studio or school of science of the world. His legitimate aspiration, grounded firmly on the idea of nationality, is that it should gather within its borders a many-sided life, in which all the great permanent ends that make life worth living should find their place, just as little can he rest content that his country's religion, literature, science, politics, family life, wealth, should be severally the peculiar monopolies of groups or classes or castes. He must wish and strive so far as the iron law of division of labor admits, that both he and his fellow citizens should come into vitalizing and uplifting contact with all these large interests and ends which his country embraces in its larger life. This and nothing less is the aspiration of modern democracy, the democracy as we shall see of Mazzini and Green. For democracy is not content that society should be diverse and the individual members of society vigorous. It insists that individual vigor must assert itself and find its nutriment in and through the manifold interests, religious as well as intellectual, political as well as industrial and commercial, which it is the glory of a democratic state to offer to even the humblest of its citizens. And it is because there is so much in the essay on liberty to feed and foster this ideal that it will remain one of the great books of modern democracy. It is time, however, to add that it is the very fervor with which Mill urges this passionate individualism that has laid him open to his critics. We see this if we turn to the chapter upon liberty of discussion. For that well-known chapter is not merely a plea for liberty to discuss, it is a vehement incentive to leave nothing undiscussed. Coupling thought and discussion so closely as to make them all but one and indivisible, it makes scant allowance for the fact, and who will dispute it, that whereas excess in thinking is an extreme to which few indeed seem prone to run, there are unhappily not few, but many, to whom excess in discussion is irresistible. One recalls a passage in Lord Morley's Rousseau, in which, in a vivid picture of fashionable France in the 18th century, he tells us how in these vivacious circles the highest things were brought down to the level of the cheapest discourse, and reminds us in the context how Boswell used to ask questions which Johnson declared were enough to make a man hang himself. Lord Morley is not, of course, to be taken as suggesting that the highest subjects are not to be discussed. Ill would it fare with philosophy and science, with theology and ethics, and not least with politics if it were so. Discussion is the recognized instrument for gaining and testing and clarifying convictions. As the Greeks put it, dialectic is the path to definition. But it may none the less be suggested that there are seasons and circumstances when some things are better left undiscussed, and that God, virtue, and the soul are not, again to return to Lord Morley's words, to be made everyday topics for all comers. There are, moreover, questions of casuistry, not least of all political casuistry. These must needs come in the course of experience, and when they do they must, of course, be met and dealt with. It does not, however, follow that they are to be lightly raised or cried upon the housetops. For a practice of casuistical discussion habituates the mind to the idea of the violation of the laws of life. Its tendency is, as Burke puts it, to turn our duties into doubts. At the very least, it gives the casuistical case a prominence which clothes it in a kind of generality, to which, as in its essence an exceptional thing, it is not entitled. Tyrannicide, to cite one of Mill's illustrations, is an interesting topic. The historian and the moral philosopher must needs discuss it. So must the ordinary citizen once some political assassination has startled the world. 
but like many another act involving grave departure from ordinary obligation, it cannot be constantly discussed without making the condition of the body politic dangerously valetudinarian. In the essay on Coleridge, Mill himself asserted that it is a prime condition of political stability that there should remain some principles that are not to be discussed and called in question. Footnote. Dissertations. Volume 1, page 417. In all political societies which have had a durable existence, there has been some fixed point, something which men agreed in holding sacred, which wherever freedom of discussion was a recognized principle, it was of course lawful to contest in theory, but which no one could either hope or fear to see shaken in practice, which in short, except perhaps during some temporary crisis, was in the common estimation placed beyond discussion. End footnote. Those who can may be left to reconcile it with the words and still more with the spirit of the chapter on liberty of discussion. Nor is it easy to admit that discussion plays so overwhelming a part as Mill claims for it in vitalizing convictions and in saving mankind from the justly dreaded deep slumber of a decided opinion. It is at least a reasonable contention that convictions are vitalized even more by the moving and critical and memorable experiences of life, experiences such as Mill himself underwent in his mental crisis, than by the keenest dialectic and most untiring controversy. Who can doubt that there is room in life, though there is little room in the liberty, for a type far removed from the irrepressible disputant of Mill's pages. Others, too, there are among the walks of homely life, shy and unpractised in the use of phrase. Words are but under-agents in their souls. When they are grasping with their greatest strength, they do not breathe among them. Footnote. Wordsworth, Prelude. End footnote. End of Section 7. Section 8 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. The Utilitarian Optimism of John Stuart Mill. Part 5. A further point emerges when we consider the relation of discussion to action. It sometimes happens that an idea by reason of its very vitality, may frustrate its own realization and enactment. It is so, at any rate, with the idea of liberty. Not seldom liberty so inflames its votaries to assert the liberty to discuss that they cannot and will not see that in gratifying this passion for discussion they may be sacrificing the practical fruits apart from which political discussion at any rate loses all its value. What spectator of parliaments is likely to deny that whilst the voluble rhetorician, the fanatic, and the bore are asserting what they call their freedom of discussion, the sands may be running, not the sands of the hourglass by which debate has sometimes been regulated, but the more precious sands of time and opportunity. For God's sake, let us pass on, says Burke, exasperated out of all sobriety of phrase, by the type of man who accepts nothing and questions everything. All this, to be sure, need not make us desire that Mill, in the fervor of his pleas for liberty of discussion, had left even a sentence of that memorable chapter unwritten. It only prompts the wish that he had added even one paragraph upon the seasonable limitations imposed upon discussion in the interests of reverence, good sense, and practicality. The very limitations he admits do indeed but accentuate by their manifest meagerness the uncompromising emphasis of his doctrine. The same line of criticism applies when we turn to liberty of action. Here also Mill's defects are the defects of his virtues. In its substance, his teaching is incontrovertible. 
no one need dispute the central principle that vigorous many-sidedness of character can come only of varied practical contact with the manifold interests and ends of a many-sided environment. There is no other way. Human nature grows to the modes in which it is exercised, and the citizen of a state will remain but a truncated specimen of humanity. He will be mentally and morally mutilated, to use Adam Smith's emphatic word, so long as a narrow lot forbids his participation in the civic and social life, in the religious and intellectual opportunities which it is the mark of a civilized society to offer. This is the strength of Mill's position. The weakness appears in two exaggerations. One, the first is that in the eagerness of insistence that goodness ought to be various, he forgets as Fitz James Stephen has it, that variety of character is not therefore goodness. It is not that goodness is not various. None but ascetics, whom Mill justly repudiates, would deny it. The virtues are many, and the more of them a man can realize without sacrifice of unity of character, the better he is. But then, this unity must have its due. Without it, the most engaging versatility passes at once across the line that parts that man of many qualities, however shining, from the man of principle and character. It is not to be denied that the type after Mill's heart lies open here to criticism. Moving at will within the monopoly of self-regarding acts, free to indulge in eccentricities to his heart's content, he wonderfully recalls the democratic citizen of platonic satire, that restless type who is everything by turns and nothing long, because in his motley party-colored life the underlying consistency of a strong character has been lost. Yet even if this be true, Mill's exaggerations here lie toward the safe extreme. Versatility is not the snare of the modern democratic citizen. The risk for him lies rather in the specialized life, the narrow lot, and the poverty-stricken soul begotten of the sheer urgency of livelihood and the grinding preoccupation with material necessities. Lamentably small is the risk, deplorably distant is the prospect that a many-sided versatility will prove his snare. 2. It is therefore a more needful criticism that in his eager plea for individual vigor and manifold diversity, Mill falls into an extravagant tenderness for social experiments. Social experiments, be it remembered, which are by no means incompatible with a narrow and contracted development in those who indulge in them. The health of a society, he even urges, or to use his own words, the amount of genius, mental vigor, and moral courage it contains, is to be measured by the amount of eccentricity to be found within it. Non sequitur. It is one thing to admit that in all societies that are full of life, experiments in living are to be expected. It is another thing to welcome these vagaries as if they were a service to society. They are at best but the tributes of folly to freedom. For eccentricity is but the parody of individuality, and however true it be that fullness of life will produce experiments in living, experiments in living need by no means come of fullness of life. They may have quite another parentage in shallowness of nature, inconsistency of purpose, egregious vanity, impervious conceit, and fixed ideas. It is good to think for oneself, but as Fitzjames Stephen suggests, it is not necessary that a man who thinks for himself should think differently from other people. This is the distinction to which Mill does insufficient justice. In the fervor of his passion for fullness of social life, he is all too tender to the follies and freaks that may end in irresponsible squandering of life's resources. The other side of this toleration of vagaries is the well-known antipathy to social interference which led Mill, 
in passages to regard the mere refusal to bend the knee to social authority as a prime virtue nor is there any lack of forcible and vituperative phrase ape-like faculty of imitation and such like to make his utterance emphatic and it may freely be admitted that the words and warnings have their value for here as elsewhere it is the very strength and conviction with which mill has grasped a truth and the vehemence with which he urges it that have laid him open to attack the truth in question is that there is a case and a strong case for laissez-faire because in every developed human life there is and must for ever remain a large region within which whatever savours of coercion and more especially of the coarse coercion of law is either altogether impossible or in the highest degree inexpedient this is a fact which no recognition of social solidarity or organic unity can alter it cannot alter it because it is rooted in the very nature of man as a spiritual and moral being it is so for example with thought society of course can by organized action interfere with thought it can do much to cut the sources from which thought is fed it can even enforce an index ex purgatorius it can do even more by depriving thought of that free utterance which is an elementary condition of its health and vitality not without reason does mill moralize over all the wealth of ideas which so far as their diffusion goes may have been stamped out by a brutal obscurantism but thought itself no interference can touch it cannot because it cannot for thought is as the stoics phrased it the inner citadel within which even the humblest thinker owns no lord as spinoza taught it is so entirely of the essence of a man's being that it must needs persist so long as life lasts nothing that coercion can do can stifle it similarly with the religious spirit conceivably society might wage war upon religion or more probably it might set itself for it has many instruments to enforce religious conformity but at most it could achieve no more than a comparatively superficial and illusory success for the relation of the individual soul to god is so direct and so indescribably intimate that intervention between these two is flatly impossible it is a relation that lies deeper than law can touch a state religion however enforced could not create it nor could a secularist persecution destroy it for the religious spirit does not depend for its existence on the provision or destruction of religious facilities religion in its essence would no more perish if these facilities were swept away by a despotic secularism than it would be conjured into existence by their lavish provision indirectly the state may of course help or hinder directly it is impotent either to create the religious spirit or destroy it as with religion so with morality the old truism that men are not made moral by act of parliament is true for morality is more than behavior more even than behavior with such motives behind it as the state or external pressure of any kind can create in its essence it stands or falls with that inward attitude of will that dutiful spirit which lies deeper than the motives which the most powerful social authority can evoke even if all were done that the state can do and it can do much in providing moral education and smoothing the path for the realization of human faculty the root of the matter the moral spirit would still lie beyond its furthest reach nor is it otherwise in other relations of life which involve the deeper emotions and affections much as law can do for the family as an institution it is beyond its sanctions to ensure those spontaneous affections and personal ties without which the family loses half its value and all its charm in all such cases as these intervention with the individual finds natural and inexorable limits it may remove obstacles it may provide favourable conditions 
but beyond this it is impotent. Nor is this all. In matters of religion and morality, all interference is practiced at a risk even in cases when it may be outwardly effective. A public authority could conceivably compel its subjects to attendance on divine service, or it might treat infidelity to the marriage tie as a heinous crime, but it is doubtful if it would have thereby furthered the religious or the family life. The probability, rather, is that by importing into such things the baser alloy of threatened pains and penalties, it would have actually vitiated the motives of the person so constrained. It is for these reasons that every citizen does well to foster with Mill a salutary jealousy of social interference. So long as much of the real significance of human action lies in the devout or dutiful or affectionate spirit, there will always be room for champions of laissez-faire to remind society that there are regions of experience where its interference is impertinent. So far there seems little cause to quarrel with Mill's general result. No one who takes a spiritual view of human life and character can doubt that much that is best in human nature lies quite beyond the province of either the social or the legal sanction. The pity is that in his eager advocacy of this great truth, Mill should have tried to set it on so inadequate and indeed so false a ground, the well-known ground, that human actions part into two and that there is a charmed circle of self-regarding acts within which every individual is entitled to sit immune from all that society can or may wish to do. If interference is to be invoked at all in this connection, he will have it that it is solely because society is justified in doing what it can to protect this inviolable citadel against encroachment and attack. It is a conception that is indefensible from whatever point of view regarded, for in the first place it is not the most self-regarding actions that furnish the strongest case against interference. It is religious actions, or dutiful actions, or domestic actions, which are in their significance nothing if not altruistic. And secondly, a purely self-regarding action is no better than a figment, for even though it was granted that there are many actions in a man's life which directly leave little or no immediate mark upon the lives of others, it does not follow that such actions, however secret, however personal, leave no mark upon his own life, and the marks they leave on him go with him out into his work in and upon the world. Nothing can hinder this. A man is not one person in private secret acts and another in public overt acts. He is one and the same person in both. His social value or his want of social value is the product of all his thoughts, feelings, and actions, whether he call them self-regarding or not. There are, of course, actions whose influence upon society at large are infinitesimal because their influence on the character of the doer of them is trifling. De minimis non curatur. But if we go beyond these, what is it but a commonplace of experience that many a private man's whole social attitude and his lifelong action on the world have been vitally determined by what Mill would call his self-regarding acts? It is only an untenable atomism or a dangerous self-sophistication that can foster the illusion that in the hour of our self-regarding actions we are engaged in what concerns none but ourselves. To stake the plea against social despotism on this is to give the case away. It is therefore not surprising that Mill holds to this figment of self-regarding acts only by an effort of dialectical skill which can hardly convince even the most friendly apologist. Now it is the hour of social conscience, and we are bidden to play the role of critic of even the private follies of the fool. The scene changes, the hour of individualism comes, and we are reminded that we are not to feel called upon to make his life uncomfortable. Now, as would appear, we are bound to judge our neighbor and tell him plainly what we think about him. Nay, we may even shun his presence and warn our friends against him, 
so far is his private life from being purely his own concern but then it is his own concern so conspicuously his own concern that however we may be convinced of his fatuity and however we may wish to sting him out of it by words that will go home we are never to pass beyond a policy of remonstrance and polite persuasion so hard is it even for a master of argument to reconcile the promptings of the social conscience with this laissez-faire individualism of self-regarding acts nor can we leave this topic without the reflection that it was surely by the irony of fate that it was reserved for mill to become the protagonist of self-regarding acts in his own devoted and strenuous life one suspects that self-regarding acts played but a slender part to his friends he was apostolic to his critics he was quixotic in his championship of public causes and when he retired in his closing days to avignon it was with the reflection that much of the world's best work had been done by those who lived remote from it similarly when we think of his writings when he made the greatest happiness principle his creed when he argued that self-sacrifice must find a place in utilitarianism when he avowed his sympathy with the religion of humanity when he argued for the paramount place of social feeling in morality when he foresaw the coming of a day when a common man would dig and weave as readily as fight for his country nay when he was arguing that the recognition of the charmed circle of inviolable personality was the path to greatest happiness he was himself administering the best antidote to his untenable doctrine of self-regarding acts a final criticism remains professor bain who never fails to deal faithfully with his friend has said that the weakness of the essay on liberty lies in the want of a steady view of the essentials of human happiness it is a fair criticism and it applies not only to the essay but to mill's writings as a whole for though few writers have so fully recognized the manifold elements of human well-being or moved amidst them with more habitual familiarity it cannot be claimed for him that we rise from his works with a compact and well-proportioned ideal of the public good we have fragments such as the chapter on the stationary state or the passage in the utilitarianism already cited or what he called his utopia of cooperation yet the fact remains that if there be a compact and connected ideal of happiness discoverable in mill's writings the reader is left to piece it together for himself and yet this criticism however just is no sooner spoken than one almost wishes it unsaid for after all the student of mill will find in his writings and in his life what is of more value than even a closely knit and symmetrical ideal of human happiness he will meet a powerful mind of the first rank in living contact with problems a thinker whose net was spread in the large currents of the thought of his time there was a tendency in mill's own day to regard him as a manufactured thinker a conduit for other men's ideas a logic chopping engine as anything in short rather than a living intellectual force sawdustish was john sterling's epithet and even in our own day one suspects there remains an impression to the same effect but if the study of mill's life and writings is fitted to press home one conviction more than another it is that his was a mind open independent and alive to the last he modestly declares i continue to learn and to unlearn from the first he began to do so despotically educated by his father who was without doubt one of the most masterful intellects of his generation and brought up at the feet of bentham himself his mind was not subjugated even to these great twin influences he had the vitality to go his own way to think his own thoughts to learn from other minds and to leave behind him a greater thing than benthamism the very strictures of his severest critics may be read as a kind of tribute 
Jevons has assailed the inconsistencies of his bad logic and faulty ethics. Fitzjames Stephen has impeached the inconsistencies of his political and social creed. And many lesser critics than these have subsisted on Mill's failures. Yet the sympathetic student of Mill can afford to make all his critics welcome to all his inconsistencies. For his inconsistencies come of the figure of his mental life. They are born of the desire to know, of the capacity and willingness to learn from other minds, of the sense of the reality of the many problems in whose presence he habitually lived. This is, after all, the greater matter. Better Mill's inconsistencies than the limited completeness of Bentham. Better his unsolved difficulties than the arrogant, narrow, self-confident logic of his father for they are, at any rate, the fruits of an enlarged outlook and an enriched experience. Has he not said it? If I am asked, he writes in the autobiography, what system of political philosophy I substituted for that which as a philosophy I had abandoned, I answer, no system, only a conviction that the true system was something much more complete and many-sided than I had previously had any idea of. In the light of a confession of faith such as this, we can understand that if Mill had given fewer openings to critics, he would have given less convincing proof of his real greatness. End of Section 8section nine of six radical thinkers by john mccunn this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the cobdenite doctrines of trade and non-intervention part one one trade cobden loved to avow himself a practical man he regarded time as wasted which was not given to the concrete good of his fellow countrymen he had an uncommon impatience of abstractions and more than a suspicion of theories and theorists the one university in which he studied was what he called that great peripatetic political university the league he had sat at the feet of no gamaliel except adam smith and even here despite his enthusiastic claim for political economy as the highest exercise of the human mind, his concern was not with the science itself, but with some of its applications. His reading, though voracious enough in Hansard and Blue Books and pamphlets, was not otherwise extensive. In short, he was from the first to last a politician. He was, however, likewise a thinker. He might pride himself, as he often did, upon being a man of facts, but it was his greater merit to be a man to whom facts had become significant. Through all the facts and figures of his speeches, there runs the tendency to lift up current controversies into the region of principles, and the steady perception that what he took to be the main elements of a nation's life hang together in organic connection. With the result that from his speeches and pamphlets, concrete, practical, scornful of abstractions though they be, there emerged, if not a philosophy of civilization, at any rate, a coherent, reasoned scheme of what he would have not only England but all countries become. Central and dominant lies the conviction of the magnitude of the industrial and commercial element in modern civilization. For when Cobden, he was born in 1804, looked out upon the world in early manhood as commercial traveller, he saw that an industrial revolution had passed and was still passing over the face of England. It is not necessary to dwell over the familiar details, mechanical inventions, growth of the factory system, rise of great towns around coal fields and iron fields, swift expansion of seaports with increase of capitalists and labourers, and all the adjuncts of these, good and evil. Between the date of Waterloo and the date of the Reform Act, the power looms in Manchester had increased from 2,000 to 80,000, 
and the population of Birmingham had grown from 90,000 to 150,000. This is one of his notes, and it may be taken as typical of the kind of facts that fastened upon his mind and fired his imagination. In brief, the national industries were undergoing that transformation so familiar to us nowadays, through which the dominance of agriculture was giving place to the supremacy of manufactures. And then, Cobden did not bound his views by England. A wide traveller, a keen observer, an international man, his eyes were constantly upon other countries and especially upon the United States. It was not simply that the rise and growth of the American democracy bulked to him as the greatest event of the modern world. It was also that its possibilities profoundly concerned the future of industrial England. In that portentous truth, the Americas are free. Teeming as it does with future change, there is nothing that more nearly affects our industry than the total revolution which it dictates to the statesmen of Great Britain in the commercial, colonial, and foreign policy of our government. For in American democracy, Cobden saw two things which deeply moved him. It was a great political experiment, democracy upon its trial. Don't ask me to wish that it may fail, he exclaims, in the day of America's ordeal. But it was also, and indeed to Cobden, mainly the rise of an industrial and commercial rival, formidable beyond all precedent. To realize what that meant, it needed but to look at this picture and that. England, loaded with national debt, densely populated, crowded with discontented farmers, half-fed laborers, mutinous chartist operatives, costly paupers, ruled by a corn-lying aristocracy, impoverished by outlay on great armaments by land and sea. How could a country like this hope to contend in the markets of the world with that great coming rival of the West, that rival with her vast territory and all but limitless natural resources, with her Mississippi Valley potentially able to feed the entire population of Europe, with her freedom from debt, with her thrice happy isolation from the intrigues of diplomatists and the aggressiveness of armies, with her elastic prosperity, her light taxes, her Anglo-Saxon labor, her public education, her genius for mechanical inventions. With this before him, Cobden drew his inferences. He saw the coming of that industrial rivalry which has since come, and from other quarters besides the West. And it was this perception more than any other thing which shaped within him the conviction that the policy of England must be a policy of trade. Unquestionably, he built here upon facts of the first magnitude. He spoke the simple truth when he said that a new dispensation had come, the whole superstructure of our life had come, like another Venice on its piles, to be underpropped by industry and commerce. A vast and ever-growing organism of production had to be itself perpetually reproduced. A swiftly increasing industrial population had to be found in work, wages, food, and shelter. A rapidly growing class of capitalists and employers had to find investments or succumb armaments of the costliest by land and sea had to be paid for dividends on debt had to be met municipalities financed hospitals charities schools churches supported in a word england was becoming industrialized and commercialized to the core herein as cobden thought lay the fatal failure of so many of the statesmen of his day whig and tory alike they were the slaves of an old tradition. They were thinking about everything but the main thing. About foreign policy, balance of power, diplomatic interventions, armaments, constitutional changes, and franchises. But the key of the situation, as Cobden thought, lay in none of these things, not even in the last. It lay in trade. Trade which had grown and was continuing to grow so vast that it was more and more sweeping into its vortex all the other elements of national life. This made Cobden preeminently the apostle of trade, 
and though there was room in his soul for much besides trade and tariffs it was in the region of economic facts and forces that as a public man he lived moved and had his being that the policy of england must be a policy of trade and if of trade then of free trade this is the pith of all his teaching a satirist of genius has called cobden a bagman a bagman with his calico millennium and the gibe has been often repeated it cannot be repeated too often if it helps to fix the fact that the day is past when statesmanship can afford to be ignorant of the economic facts and forces of the world but then as just remarked it was not a policy of trade merely that could satisfy cobden as all the world knows he went on to argue that a policy of trade must be and always be a policy of free trade there can be little doubt that the series of memorable speeches which cobden made in the house and in the country upon free trade have in singular measure the quality of being convincing they converted peel by their unadorned eloquence as peel himself testified and they can hardly fail to convince the reader that at the time when they were spoken eighteen forty onwards it had become of paramount importance for british manufacturers that the country should draw from every source available abundant food cheap raw materials and cheap instruments of production we can see this in the light of what has happened since england we can see now was then in a position of immense industrial strength actual and potential her manufacturing system had potentialities which were to beggar even cobden's anticipations her commerce had vast capacities for growth her agriculture had still possibilities of expansion she had access to growing markets whose appetite to consume her goods was to prove for many years insatiable not least she had a clear start of her rivals thus situated she was called to face a parting of the ways and it may serve the purposes of exposition to ask what would probably have happened had she chosen to persist in the path of protection as nearly all other nations have done it would be futile to dogmatize on the unverifiable might have been actual history is so hard to write that we may well leave hypothetical history alone it will suffice to indulge the conjecture that this nation like other protected nations would have made substantial industrial and commercial progress those who believe that free trade has been salvation need not therefore believe that protection would have been reprobation it is not necessary thus to traffic in extremes doubtless manufactures would have gone on advancing inventions multiplying facilities of transport and locomotion increasing there were such potentialities in these things as we know now that we cannot think otherwise england in short would have probably done at least as well as other protected countries if so this growth of manufactures would have entailed results it would there is no doubt have brought with it growth of working population and growth of population especially if hand in hand with a rise in the standard of comfort would have brought increased demand for food hardly anything could have prevented it and this would have been an excellent thing especially for the landed interest for if agriculture had continued to be protected and the demand for food gone up the laborer might have been kept on the land the farmer even ceased to grumble and the landlord enjoyed his rents meanwhile the operatives of factory foundry building yard and workshop would of course have had their wages good wages we shall assume seeing that manufactures on our supposition had been prospering but unhappily their wages even if they had been good would have soon begun to lose their charm by being increasingly absorbed in the purchase of food kept dear by a protective tariff and so we may imagine matters would have gone on till sooner or later the very fact of industrial progress without any argument would have opened the eyes of the nation to the full significance of the fact that this country having decisively thrown in its lot with manufactures must be content to import 
a large and increasing proportion of its food for even if it were granted as has been alleged that it is within the limits of physical possibility that great britain could grow food enough to feed its people this mere physical possibility is not worth considering it could only be realized by pushing the margin of cultivation up the bare hillsides and into the upland moors and long before that process had reached its limits the cost of produce would have become so great that even the well-paid workman when he had purchased his meals would have found that he had little if anything left wherewith to purchase anything else now it was the merit of cobden to see this without waiting for any such object lesson he read the signs of the times he discerned with utmost clearness the industrial revolution that had taken place he knew that the national industries were changing he was convinced that year by year we were becoming more and more a nation of manufactures and he argued that in becoming such we must make up our minds increasingly to import our food but of course he did not stop there without a shadow of hesitation he took the further step to free food it is interesting to note that in taking this his characteristic step he does not seem to have anticipated that food would be much cheapened he says so we do not seek free trade in corn primarily for the purpose of purchasing it at a cheaper money rate of course he saw that free trade in corn would make an end of scarcity prices and agricultural monopoly and it was in this connection that he was wont to declare that the corn law was a rent law and nothing else but it is none the less true that his eyes were set not so much on cheap food as on abundant food and on the industrial expansion and efficiency which abundant food would bring in face of an industrial population increasing like a rising torrent at the rate of one thousand a day he once said it was essential to secure two things one that abundance of food supply without which labor could not be efficient the other a check upon monopoly prices of corn monopoly prices which by dearness of bread would divert ultimately into the pocket of the landed interest an undue proportion of the wages of labor thereby leaving less available for stimulating the demand in other commodities besides food these two things cobden was convinced were best secured and beyond all question they were effectively secured by sweeping away the corn laws by the board but he seems to have been equally convinced that all this could be done and yet agricultural prices be so well maintained as to leave farmers their profits and landlords their rents did he not style himself the farmer's friend did he not declare that the repeal of the corn laws would not throw an acre of land out of cultivation did he not even prophesy that there was no interest in the country that would receive so much benefit from the repeal of the corn laws as the farmer tenant industry partly it was that the farmer enjoyed the natural protection equivalent to the cost of transport of the foreign article but partly also the increased demand for produce which cobden believed was certain to come from the expansion of industries all round under the bettering influences of free trade policy there was another prophecy that memorable one in which despite his denunciations of the corn law as a rent law he tried to persuade his particular foes the landowners that they would have as good rents without a corn law as with it so little did he anticipate the extent to which cheapness would go and land fall out of tillage End of section nine. Section ten of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter three The Cobdenite Doctrines of Trade and Non Intervention. Part two. Not that these prophecies were utterly false. The tenant farmer was prosperous enough after free trade, for a time, till eighteen seventy at any rate nor is it to be forgotten 
that the same free trade policy which shattered the landlord monopoly in agriculture has by stimulating the growth of cities made even the barrenest of acres extraordinarily fruitful of ground rents as those who dwell in cities know it was not of this however not of the unearned increment from land that cobden was thinking when he tried to console the landlords and it need not be denied that his sanguine optimism here betrayed him into prophecies flagrantly false the decay of agriculture involving a loss which when capitalized has been made by experts to run into large figures must always be reckoned in any estimate of free trade policy yet the miscalculation cannot be said to invalidate cobden's central argument can it be denied that the corn law was bound up with monopoly that it was essentially a rent law can it be denied that abundance of cheap food had become vital to english industry can it be denied that the repeal of the corn laws ensured a supply of cheap food if it cannot we are far on the way to an approval of cobden's policy as to the import of food there is a tale that in eighteen forty five when cobden had in the house finished what lord morley thinks the best of his speeches the protectionists were heard to whisper peel must answer this peel so the story runs crumpled up his notes as he was heard to mutter let those answer him who can if there are those who do not relish the words as a confession it is always open to them to read them as a challenge imported food however must of course be purchased it must be paid for in exports visible or invisible as must also be those various other things which we need but cannot profitably or it may be cannot at all produce for ourselves now cobden's policy for exports is of the simplest it is all summed up in one word cheapness it is cheapness that will enable us to hold our home products against the foreigner it is cheapness that will enable us to secure the open markets of the world against rival exporters it is cheapness that will enable us even to pierce the hostile tariff walls of foreign markets nothing else will do diplomacy flags fleets armaments are futile in comparison we cannot dragoon the world not even our own colonies into taking our goods that policy of the cudgel is obsolete what remains is to persuade and entice by the cheapness that appeals to that deeply rooted instinct to buy in the cheapest market never was there such a profit of cheapness the fight is for commercial supremacy and the battle will rest with the cheapest but if we must have cheapness our course is so clear that common sense to which cobden was always appealing is enough to point it out we must secure from all available sources and at the least possible cost raw material and products partly manufactured and the instruments of production and out of these turn out the finished product which by the open sesame of cheapness will force its way into the markets of the world this is the trite and simple case for free imports all round it stands in need of no words to commend it stated thus abstractly it is all but self-evident to bring abundance of stuff at least cost whether raw material or partly manufactured goods to the door of the workshop and to equip the workshop at least cost with every inventive appliance and every economy that the whole world can afford this is the open secret of producing the cheap article protection prevents this protection in short is obstruction it is a way of preventing people from getting things it is equivalent to asking producers to revert to less easy methods and so far it has been said truly enough that it is not in essence different from asking a farmer to reap by sickle instead of machine or of a manufacturer to prefer hand loom to steam power machinery such things make production difficult and costly so does protection 
and indeed so convinced was Cobden that by removal of these protective obstacles, industry would advance by leaps and bounds, that he believed, as we have seen, that the expansion of cheap manufacture by providing employment and by increasing the demand for food would prevent the farmer and the landowner from suffering at all. Foreign markets won and home markets held by cheapness, with agriculture, that greatest of all industries, sustained by increasing working population and increasing demand for food. This was Cobden's expectation. But this was not all. His immediate aim, of course, was to convert this country. But all through his agitation he never doubted that by converting Britain he was but beginning the conversion of Europe, the very rapid conversion of Europe. There will not be a tariff in Europe, so runs the unfulfilled prophecy, which will not be changed in less than five years to follow your example. For it was not an insular or one-sided free trade that would content him, though he never hesitated to prefer that to protection. His expectations went out to nothing less than a complete international division of labor under which the production of the whole world would be maximized and the wants of each several country supplied on a basis of a free international exchange of commodities. Nor did this exhaust his outlook. Though fundamentally the movement was economic, it had other, it had political aims. It was democratic inasmuch as it struck at the political no less than at the economic monopoly of the landed aristocracy, thereby profoundly altering the political center of gravity. But above all, it was to be not only the harbinger, but the cause of peace, and the breaking down of hostile barriers between nation and nation. Free trade, he cries in one of his most vehement passages. What is it? Why, breaking down the barriers that separate nations, these barriers behind which nestle the feelings of pride, revenge, hatred, and jealousy, which every now and then burst their bounds and deluge whole countries with blood. Even this did not suffice him, for when his battle was won, it was not enough for him to claim that he had carried through a great policy for the England of 1846. He went far further. In the pardonable enthusiasm of free trade victory, he claimed to have proved free trade for all places and all times. To him, free trade principles were eternal truths. He likens them to the law of gravitation. He calls free trade the international law of the Almighty. He asserts it to be an exemplification of the golden rule of Christianity. We have a principle established now, he says in 1846, which is eternal in its truth and universal in its application and must be applied in all nations and throughout all times. This is the voice of enthusiasm rather than of economics. But as it was both meant and taken seriously, it invites the remark that, to say the least, it was not the voice of worldly wisdom. It was not necessary for Cobden's practical purpose to prove so much. He might well have been content to prove that free trade was the sound policy for the England of his day. Unfortunately, he went on to asseverate, in those somewhat wild and whirling generalizations, that because it was sound then it was sound forever. Looked at theoretically, this was all too bold a stride. The thinker in politics, especially since the middle of the 19th century, has been coming to understand how wide is this step from a commercial policy, however sound, to an eternal truth. Even long before Burke had declared that nothing universal could be affirmed in political subject matter, and the growth of the historical and comparative method under the hands of Maine and others has gone far to support the statement. Who can deny that it has been one of the decisive results of 19th century political thought to reinstate, in the light of the wider outlook on history and politics, the ancient but still living deliverance of Aristotle, that between the rigorous universals of science, 
and the looser generalizations of politics, there lies in the very nature of political subject matter a world of difference. This being so, it is not for the practical politician to rush in where the political theorist fears to tread. Yet this is precisely what Cobden does, and he has to pay the inevitable penalty. For the man who traffics in universals does so at a risk. He lays himself open to attack. He forgets that an eternal truth, so called, is really the most vulnerable of propositions. It has the weakness that if proved false in a single case, it goes to the ground at once. Illustration is not far to seek. There are hostile critics of free trade who point to the fact that J. S. Mill has admitted that protection may be the best policy for new countries. They think that therefore free trade stands refuted. There are other hostile critics who think that they can prove that free trade is not the policy for 1910, and they too think that therefore free trade stands refuted. They are both right in the inference, whatever be the value of their premises, if free trade stands or falls as an eternal truth. But it need not stand refuted at all if only it be advanced with judicious moderation, as what it was meant for, a sound commercial policy for England at a particular epoch in her history. The theorist, perhaps, may be pardoned for indulging in sweeping generalizations. It is his nature to generalize. But let the practical man remember that the width of a generalization in practical politics is so far from being a security that it does but offer a larger target for the shafts of the unbelieving. Nor can Cobden be acquitted here of giving a fatally false lead to his followers. The confident, sweeping generalizations of the master have betrayed the disciples into an illusion of false security. Convinced that in 1846 free trade was proved up to the hilt, they seem to have come to regard it as therefore proved, as Cobden said it was, once for all. Nay, they even seem at times to resent its being so much as called in question. And they might, of course, be justified even in their irritability if free trade were an eternal truth. Mankind, or at least the practical part of it, has no time and less patience to submit to be called upon to prove eternal truths over and over again. Yet it would certainly have been better for Cobdenites if instead of assuming their cherished policy to be a truth never again to be called in question by reasonable men, they had set themselves to prove it afresh, to prove it, for example, to be no less sound for 1910 than Cobden, as they believe, proved it sound for 1846. It would really be a greater tribute to their master if instead of reposing on his enthusiastic, unguarded, and untenable eternal truth, they emulated him in the courage, the tenacity, the lucidity, the wide grasp of fact with which in his day he attacked the problem of the hour. For the reasonable claim which the anxious political inquirer may to the last of time make on the Cobdenite is not the mere resuscitation of the abstract economic principles upon which the free trade policy was victoriously argued, nor yet the proof that it was the highest wisdom to apply these principles as Cobden did with such effect in the free trade controversy. It is rather the claim for a modest appendix, containing a careful diagnosis of the body politic as it is here and now, and a demonstration that the actual state of things industrially and politically renders a continuance of free trade nationally expedient. This is the more desirable because since Cobden's day such vast changes, both political and commercial, have passed over England and the world. A brief consideration of at least some of these is essential. One of the greatest is undoubtedly the growth, both in fact and in idea, of that spirit of nationality, which is perhaps the most forceful and pregnant political movement of the present age. 
we can see its influence in that very domain which cobden had made peculiarly his own for the tariff controversies which vex the beginnings of the twentieth century are much more than the divergencies of politicians and of parties there lies behind them a conflict between principles whose magnitude we can hardly yet gauge a conflict between the essentially cosmopolitan ideal of cobden which would fain level the barriers between nation and nation and encourage capital and labour to move freely whithersoever investment and employment might beckon them and the very different ideal which accepting the rivalries between nations as a cardinal fact cannot forget these dividing barriers so much so that it does not hesitate in the interests of national and imperial strength and unity to pursue a strictly national policy even to the extent of demanding enormous and at times appalling sacrifices of the citizen for it cannot be supposed that any one is likely to call in question the strength and the vitality of the spirit of nationality it is not merely that the nations of the world struggle as they have always struggled sometimes in peace and sometimes in war to assert their existence and achieve their ambitions their self-assertion has become more conscious more deliberate more resolute sometimes it takes one form sometimes another it may be the unification of a nation as in italy or the consolidation of a military empire as in germany or the emergence of a great state heretofore aloof in the arena of world politics as in the case of the united states or it may be a craving for colonial expansion or a hunger for spheres of influence whatever the form it may take it is there and it is one of the most irresistible of political forces at this moment nor is it only in the wider politics that this leaven of nationality has been working it has made itself felt also in that ideal of citizenship which has been gaining ground since the middle of the nineteenth century for is it not of the very essence of this ideal of citizenship that the citizen and the nation are bound together by bonds more intimate more organic than was previously supposed so that while on the one hand the citizen is declared to need the nation an active democratic participation in the affairs of the nation in order to realize a true citizenship so on the other hand the nation if it is to be a really organized nation strong both for defence and for the working out of its destinies must be able to reckon upon the absolute loyalty and devotion of its citizens now it is not to be assumed that this spirit of nationality is irreconcilable with cosmopolitanism and its breaking down of barriers between nation and nation on the contrary he who sets the idea of the nation in irreconcilable antagonism with the idea of mankind runs serious risk of destroying or at least impairing both for a genuine cosmopolitanism is doubtfully possible as coleridge declared except by antecedents of patriotism it is the natural law of the growth of sentiments and ideas that they pass out to foreigner slave or savage after they have found soil and nurture in the narrower and intenser relations of citizen to citizen on the other hand it is not less true as mazzini passionately urged that the nation will never be seen in its true character till it is valued as a supreme instrument resolutely to be used in the service of humanity nor did cobden himself cease to be a patriot by becoming cosmopolitan he was oftener taunted with preaching a gospel of narrow national self-interest yet it is not the less true that the idea of the nation and the idea of mankind may come into conflict exceedingly acute adjustment between the two is far from easy and this is manifest the moment we pass to a second of the signs of the times the conspicuous vitality of the spirit of protection it is matter of fact that the vitality of the protective spirit has falsified all cobden's forecasts and it is not to be wondered at for cobden's eye was upon trade 
and it is not considerations of trade alone that have maintained and built tariff walls. In that case, they would not be so formidable. They might fall before free trade arguments. No, these tariff walls which stand so firm, which show no signs of crumbling, are due to the alliance of trade with the spirit of nationality. For this spirit of nationality to which the national interests are paramount looks upon markets from a different point of view from that of Cosmopolitan Cobden, who would fain have opened all the markets of all the world to everybody. It does not concern itself much with the world as a whole. It does not think of leveling the barriers between nations. It thinks first, and sometimes it also thinks last, of securing markets for the national industries. Its instinct is for monopoly, a large, a national monopoly, but still monopoly. And if it can handicap or exclude altogether other nations from its own home markets, or oust them in foreign markets, or monopolize spheres of influence, the probability is that it will try to do so. It has no aspirations after an international division of labor. It lends no ear to free trade theories. It is deeply dipped in the spirit not only of industrial but of political rivalry. And though it may be denounced by free traders as fatuous and as defeating its own ends by its fiscal follies, it is not shaken. It goes on. For the reason why it does not accept free trade arguments is not that it cannot understand them. They are not at all hard to understand. The reason is that it looks at the facts, the facts of trade and commerce, from a different point of view. Nor can there be a doubt that it is a sincere belief in the strength and vitality of this point of view that has awakened in many minds those fears and warnings with which we have been recently made so familiar fears lest this country might come by the action of its rivals to be circumscribed in that access to markets upon which as cobden so clearly saw it depends not only for the disposal of its wares but even for the food which its exports purchase and must continue to purchase if as a nation it is to hold its own end of section 10 Section 11 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3. The Cobdenite Doctrines of Trade and Non-Intervention. Part 3. It is anything but easy to say whether such fears are well-founded. Let those pronounce who know the facts of the commercial world. Still more, let those who are competent to forecast the commercial future. One may hazard the opinion that Cobden would not have been disquieted by them. So firm was his faith in cheapness, so complete was his confidence that England could afford to go upon her own way in indifference to what the rest of the world might do. And yet it is as well that those who have all, and even more than all, Cobden's optimism, should bear in mind that it is not merely over protection as a commercial policy that the gospel of cheapness has to win its victory. What it really has to encounter is protection in alliance with the masterful and ambitious spirit of nationality, which has been going on from strength to strength since Cobden's day. But of course it is not in regard to foreign markets only that anxieties have arisen. Rightly or wrongly, yet very genuinely, the fear has entered into many minds that the policy of free imports, by the killing or the crippling of home industries, unable to hold their own in the battle of cheapness, is hastening the coming of the day when employment may fail. Now Cobdenites have never failed to see that some of a nation's industries may be crippled or even killed by free imports. They have viewed the possibility with calmness, not because they denied the fact, but because they were content with the compensations. Their equanimity has usually rested upon the economic commonplace that when labor is displaced from one industry, 
this only means that it will move to other industries within the country in which it can be applied with more effect nor is the process the less really matter for rejoicing because it may have its unpleasant incidents and if it should happen that this result does not ensue even if there should be a diminution of employment in a country labour is not nonplussed and left in idleness for can it not move to other shores there to apply itself with more effect under that international division of labour toward which even insular free trade is a step in this case the world will be the gainer the world will be the gainer because it is thus that labour will feel its way to those countries where it will be most effective and so the production of the world as a whole and the exchange of industrial products will be increased now it is easy to imagine a nation for which these compensations are entirely satisfactory even in the face of much crippling of special industries and even in the face of much displacement of labour for a nation might unquestionably stand in such a position of industrial strength that it could even welcome the loss of many industries for it could always turn to other industries in which by dint of national resources and industrial aptitudes it could afford to laugh at all foreign competition and when such industries were large and numerous or both they might easily absorb all and more than all the labour which might have been driven from such ousted industries as had gone down before the foreigner the last state of that country would be better than the first in its first state it was economically speaking misdirecting its labour into channels much better in the interests of all concerned left to the foreigner in its last state it would have concentrated its labour upon those industries where it could work with maximum efficiency and without any fear that employment might fail such was the position of this country as regarded by cobden the free trade policy was undoubtedly in his eyes not only a policy of plenty but a policy of employment his critics said that his movement was a middle-class movement a manufacturer's movement not a working man's movement they even affirmed that his zeal for free trade in corn was a plan for lowering wages by cheapening food this criticism will not stand cobden's appeal may have been mainly addressed to the middle classes as was natural under the existing franchise but the benefits were not to be limited to them for apart altogether from the fact already touched upon that cobden believed that the price of food would be well maintained he was convinced if he was convinced of anything that free trade would increase employment to an enormous extent so much so that his belief that the price of corn would be well maintained owing to an ever-increasing demand may be regarded as a measure of the confidence he felt that free trade was the sure path to employment but then of course the situation has changed since cobden's day rivals have come of age an industrial revolution has passed over other countries as well as over england and for various reasons which we need not specify the competition of the foreigner in home markets has become more acute than cobden could foresee hence these alarms lest employment may fail and the recrudescence though in changed guise of questions which cobden believed he had laid for ever is england as a matter of fact still in a position of such industrial and commercial strength that she can afford to laugh at all competition and even regard the downfall of some of her industries as a blessing in disguise are her industries so thriving as to be likely to absorb and to continue to absorb whatever labour may be displaced by foreign competition in home markets such are the issues that have once more been forced to the front by the changing conditions of national life nor is it possible to wish that they had not been raised not only have they breathed a new vitality into cobdenism they have also helped to define more unmistakably the cobdenite position 
for it is not the distinctive characteristic of the Cobdenite that his answer to these questions is a yes in contradiction of a protectionist no. His unwavering position, if he hold fast to his orthodoxy, is that even if the answer were no, the free trade policy is not to be altered. Recourse to protection would make a bad situation worse, and consolation would lie in the reflection that, if it must needs be that employment fail, the labor displaced can move to other lands, there to find the work and wages denied it in its own. It is here that the believers in nationality can no longer follow. They contemplate the contingency with dismay. To them, emigration of labor on any considerable scale appears a symptom of political as well as of economic decadence. To them, it would mean a loss of loyal citizens and a transfer of them possibly to rival nations, a transfer in the first instance of their industrial efficiency, but in due course also of their political allegiance. Nor could Cobdenite consolations avail here. No economic gain, however great to the individual workman or to the world at large, could satisfy these champions of nationality if it left the nation politically weaker. Hence the peculiar anxiety with which possible failure of employment is regarded by those to whom national strength has become a paramount object. Their fear is not economic only, it is political. And it is this fear, and not merely their apprehensions for the future of industry, that has led some of them to avow their readiness to meet possible failure of employment by a policy that is no longer Cobdenite free trade. Such persons, however, though at one in their readiness to depart from Cobdenism, may divide into two classes. The one class consists of those who are convinced that it is not beyond the wit of man to devise a fiscal policy which will secure an industrial prosperity such as persistence in free trade could never bring, thereby averting that failure of employment which, in their view, free trade cannot obviate. To these, free trade is no longer the best policy even for industry. But not all who are ready to depart from free trade need be of this persuasion. There are others who, though Cobdenite enough to hold that free trade may still remain the best policy for trade, are frankly prepared to dissent from the further Cobdenite maxim that what is best for trade must needs be best for the nation. Such seems to be the significance of the suggestion that it might be far-sighted wisdom in a nation or empire to face some economic sacrifice, if by this it could safeguard its political strength, unity, and destinies. This, to be sure, is a policy that would call for not a little proof. To Cobden, as we have seen, it seemed all but axiomatic that when a country has been industrialized and commercialized to the core, no policy that involved economic sacrifice could make for genuine political strength. It may be that in this he was mistaken. He was not infallible. His forecasts were sometimes false. But at any rate his arguments stand written in his life and above all in his speeches. Let those answer him who can. 2. Non-Intervention It is not possible to do full justice to Cobden's policy of trade till we see it linked, as in his mind it was indissolubly linked, with his policy of peace. For though in the order of his thought trade is the central fact, and peace is urged for the sake of trade rather than otherwise, the two things so interact that they are but two aspects of one policy. Cobden's apostleship of peace does not rest solely on economic grounds. War, except for defense, was to him a sin and a crime, a brutalizer of the masses, a multitudinous immorality, a damnable trade. Neither he nor Bright hesitates to invoke religion and morality against it. Indeed, it is precisely the combination of this spiritual appeal with common sense, a powerful alliance, that is one of the secrets of their influence. 
yet Cobden's arguments are essentially economic. I thank God, he once said, we live in a time when it is impossible for Englishmen ever to make war profitable. This was the thought that was uppermost in his mind, and in it lies the pith of his case, a case which is surely one of the strongest indictments of war ever penned. In certain aspects the economic argument against war is of the easiest. It is obvious that war misdirects wealth and labor into work that is, to say the least, unproductive. For though dockyards and arsenals produce much, their products are not instruments of production. These serve their purpose and in time wear out, and meanwhile the world is none the better for them in its ceaseless struggle against the inexorable perishability of wealth. The inventions of war are astonishing, and its energies prodigious, often heroic. But in the long run they all mean one thing, the diversion of material resources away from channels in which they not only produce, but help further production, into channels in which they serve a contrary purpose. And as this voracious, economically barren consumption in armaments has to be made good, the sequel is the inevitable taxation, which hangs like a millstone round the neck of productive labor and enterprise, not merely the increased taxation while war is going on, but the permanent taxation necessary to meet the interest on debt, which, in a great war, however successful, mounts up by leaps and bounds. Armies and navies are doubtless necessary to enable us to pursue our peaceful industries and commerce. So far they may even be regarded as an essential part of the great organism of production. But this does not alter the fact that war debts and the taxation they drag in their train all go in support of men and establishments which do not produce commodities which we can utilize in further wealth production, or with which, as articles of commerce, we can purchase commodities from other lands. A battleship is a marvel of enterprise, design, and labor, but a battleship is not an Atlantic liner, which leaves the stocks to become a commercial asset and an instrument for international trade. It needs no argument, surely, to demonstrate that if instead of one battleship a nation were so happily situated that it could put on the sea two liners, it would industrially and commercially be the gainer. Now, of course, Cobden was not so fatuous as to suppose that we could dispense with an army and a fleet. He was a practical man. But this did not prevent him from seeing and from saying that expenditure upon armaments, and still more the employment of them in war, was altogether grievous, and beyond certain limits, a flagitious waste of resources. Nay, it was worse than waste at an epoch when, as he read the signs of the times, every industrial nation was called upon to gird its loins, to husband its resources, to increase its production, to push its trade, and to enter that one true fight in which even the Quaker can participate, the fight for markets with its actual, and still more with its coming rivals. Nor did the evil end here. For war, and menaces of war, and even armed peace, rear ever anew barriers between nation and nation, more than ever estranging, and postpone the day of that peaceful international division of labor, under which, as Cobden hoped, the nations were to benefit each other by the freest interchange of commodities. In other words, there were two things which in Cobden's scheme of life could not fuse, free trade and war. And as free trade had in his view become a necessity of national existence, war must be made to cease at peril of national misery and impoverishment. We must bear these considerations in mind if we are to understand the vituperation which Cobden pours on the doctrine that trade follows the flag, and as the inscription on Chatham's monument has it, can be made to flourish by war. The historical question here must not detain us. Let us leave it to the historians to decide whether trade has or has not, as a matter of fact, followed the flag. It was not with this historical question, nor with Chatham and his policy, 
that Cobden was primarily concerned. Nor need we speculate as to what line Cobden would have taken had he been confronted with the question. What is to be done should rival powers annex or dominate spheres of influence in order to monopolize markets heretofore neutral? For this was less a matter of practical politics in his day. It is enough to take his vehement assertion that trade does not follow the flag as simply his way of affirming that under the new dispensation trade was becoming so vast and so irresistible a force that it was getting quite beyond the powers of armaments to control it. The attempt to make trade flourish by war, the policy of the cudgel, was in his eyes not only wicked but futile. Was it not a fact, the sort of fact he gloried in, that the calico printers of England were undersold under the very guns of Gibraltar? So powerless were our cannon to open a single market. For if he was convinced of anything, it was that the time was past for dragooning the world into taking a single chattel. That was the wrong way of going to work because it was, apart from all other considerations, the impracticable way. The thing could not be done. And it was impracticable because the nations of the world were, as he thought, discovering that more excellent way, the way of cheapness. It was to this he pinned his faith. It was this that was his flag, the one flag which in the long run trade was sure to follow. Hence his passionate and unqualified denunciation of all armed intervention, whatever. Convinced that industry and commerce had become the dominating forces in national and international life, convinced that war works havoc with industry and commerce by its deadly effects alike on cheap production and on easy interchange of commodities, he took his stand as an absolute non-interventionist. Not a ship, not a man will he consent to send, not a farthing will he consent to vote for intervention under any contingencies, no matter what our sympathies may be, and Cobden himself had strong sympathies no matter though freedom in foreign lands be trampled underfoot, no matter that atrocities may outrage the moral sense of the world. The worst that tyrannical governments may do to their subjects or strong nations to weak ones will never justify a declaration of war by other intervening nations. For defense, a country may do much, turn itself into a camp if that be necessary, but for all that goes beyond bare defense, it must stand by and wait the event, no matter what it may see, feel, or think. End of section 11. Section 12 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3. The Cobdenite Doctrines of Trade and Non-Intervention, Part 4. Cobden's admirers have sometimes denied that he went so far as this. Sir Lewis Mallet, for example, points out that Cobden never positively affirmed that non-intervention by arms must be absolute. But though he may not have affirmed it in so many words, it is the inference from all he said, wrote, or did. Now there is, of course, much in this that invites criticism, but before criticizing it is as well to understand the whole case, seeing that here as always Cobden has reasons. To begin with, let us be clear that Cobdenite non-intervention is not to be confused with a policy of greedy or cynical national selfishness. Cobden was beyond all gainsaying, cosmopolitan in his outlook. Was he not called an international man? The hopes he built upon free trade are evidence enough for this. For though it was his prime concern to convince Englishmen that free trade was sound business, there are noble passages in which he strikes a loftier note and touches the more spiritual issues. It is because I do believe that the principle of free trade is calculated to alter the relations of the world for the better that I bless God I have been allowed to take a prominent part in its advocacy. I have been accused of looking too much at material interests. 
nevertheless i can say that i have taken as large and great a view of the effects of this mighty principle as ever did any man who dreamed over it in his own study i believe that the physical gain will be the smallest gain to humanity from the success of this principle i look farther i see in the free trade principle that which shall act on the moral world as the principle of gravitation in the universe drawing men together thrusting aside the antagonism of race and creed and language and uniting us in the bonds of eternal peace this same cosmopolitan spirit appears in other aspects it was no part of this non-interventionist's ideal that england should not act upon the world on the contrary there were certain things he told his countrymen they could do and he urged them with passionate emphasis to do them one of these was to paralyze the action of military and militant powers by steadfastly refusing to subscribe to war loans loans for the cutting of throats and though it is not the possible cutting of throats but the certainty of a bad investment that plays the main part in his arguments the fact remains that if only this ingenious plan could have been carried out england would have intervened to some effect in preventing the cutting of throats by cutting the sinews of war another device was the submission of international questions to courts of arbitration a great cause in the advocacy of which cobden must always be remembered honourably as a pioneer still another was international negotiation for a general reduction of armaments for which every nation then as now longed yet which all nations together then as now seemed impotent to achieve but above all there was ever before his eyes another and more excellent way in which great britain could act upon the world for it was his conviction that if our country or any country had but the wisdom and the self-control to hold its hands from armed intervention it would furnish forth to the nations a shining example of national prosperity and happiness an example which would become only the more effective when other nations came bitterly like magnified prodigals to realize what it means to squander wealth in permanent armaments to face the periodical ruinous cost of war no matter in how just an intervention to heap up debt to dislocate commerce to groan under taxation to sorrow for the dead it is therefore emphatically unjust to the manchester school to say that in a greedy narrow insular selfishness they cared for nothing but their own country far from it they were cosmopolitan they had a vehement desire to act upon the world the question was how and their way was the way of peaceful national industrial and commercial example it is further to be remembered that cobden absolutely repudiated all national responsibility for armed intervention there are those who think that a country like ours and indeed that all countries hold their power and their armed forces included as a trust it is not in them to believe that a great and powerful nation ought to play the mere spectator in view of movements by which the whole future of millions of the human race in europe or beyond europe is being for generations to come decided and least of all if outrage is being done and freedom trampled in the dust by barbarous or rapacious powers they believe with mazzini that here if anywhere a nation has a mission not so cobden he absolutely repudiates such a view do you suppose he asks that the almighty has given to this country or to any country the power and the responsibility of regulating the affairs and remedying the evils of other countries partly it is that england's hands and indeed no hands are clean enough but partly and perhaps mainly the faith it appears again and again in his pages that god is over all and that providence will right wrongs and check wickedness without our help we are no more called upon he cries in one passage which may be taken as typical to wrest the attribute of vengeance from the deity and deal it forth upon the northern aggressor than we are to preserve the peace and good behaviour of mexico 
or to chastise the wickedness of the Ashantis. It is a large assumption, but it stands as a fundamental article of Cobden's creed. To this trust in Providence we must add a distrust of governments. This was deeply rooted and unwavering. Just as in domestic questions, Cobden turned away with the dogmatic individualism of a laissez-faire politician from the socialist doctrines of the fools, as he called them, who supported Peel and Graham on the factory acts, so in the larger world of international relations. He has just as little faith in government action here. He would fain banish forever as a superstition of senile wiggery all diplomatic meddling with the fancied balance of power which he denounced as a figment. This grew upon him and his misgivings were not to be dispelled by any extension of the franchise and the passage from Whig to radical government. Radical, and indeed republican, at least in theory though he was, even to the extent of endorsing vox populi vox dei, he was not minded to place the people in power without regarding it as the people's highest wisdom not to set their trust in governments. Late in life he defined governments, as a rule, as standing conspiracies to rob and bamboozle. The more I see of the rulers of the world, so he writes to Bright in his fifty-fifth year, the less of wisdom or greatness do I find necessary for the government of mankind. How could a man be expected to believe that standing conspiracies to rob and bamboozle were the instruments for working out the purposes of providence amongst the nations of the world? As little intercourse as possible betwixt the governments, as much connection as possible between the nations of the world. That was his ideal. It is an even stronger, or at any rate a less controvertible point, that all armed intervention is, as a matter of fact, to the last degree uncertain in its results. There are two things we confound, says Cobden in a weighty sentence, when we talk of intervention in foreign affairs. The intervention is easy enough, but the power to accomplish the object is another thing. This is not timidity. It is not necessarily defeat he has in view, but the costly, unsatisfying half-success which makes so many nations sorrowfully wise after the event. Finally, against this doubtful gain there is to be set what is never doubtful, the cost. The cost which to this prosaic and practical man, with his homely ideal of industrious comfort and peaceful citizenship, resolved all the pomp, circumstance, heroism, and chivalry of war into nothing other than, in Bentham's phrase, mischief on the largest scale nor were his protests limited to war. They were as strong against the panics and surprises that load the nations with the burdens of armed peace, that costly armed peace which, in the words of Gambetta, threatens to reduce the peoples of Europe to beg at the gates of the barracks. Not the most hostile critic can deny that, at any rate, Cobden's writings and speeches are a manual on the voracity, not only of war, but of armed peace. In the name of every artisan in the kingdom to whom war would bring the tidings once more of suffering and despair, in the behalf of the peasantry of these islands, to whom the first cannon would sound the knell of privation and death, on the part of the capitalists, merchants, manufacturers, and traders, who can reap no other fruits from hostilities but bankruptcy and ruin, in a word, for the sake of the vital interests of these and all other classes of the community, we solemnly protest against Great Britain being plunged into war with Russia or any other country on behalf of Turkey. All this is forcible, and indeed it is not only so forcible, but in many respects so convincing, that it becomes the more important to be on one's guard against certain assumptions and fallacies with which these arguments are interwoven for if it be not a figure of rhetoric, it is an assumption, and nothing else, that non-intervention is part of the divine scheme of things. Where, if not in history, are the divine purposes and methods with nations to be read? And who can deny that in the world, as history reveals it, 
war has been so inextricably interwoven with the course of events and with what we usually call progress that he who makes so bold as to say that the armed struggles of nations are no part of the divine plan leaves us wondering and in the dark as to what this divine plan would have achieved had battles never been fought or won we cannot say we do not know it was an article of cobden's faith that the virtues in the long run always go with strength and the vices with weakness one hopes so but if this conviction is to rest on the teaching of historical fact the sifting process and the results have been wrought out by the energies of war as well as by the energies of peace not that we are called upon to contradict cobden here this would but substitute two dogmatisms for one enough to lodge a protest that this whole question as to the methods of providence in history is too vast too perplexing too metaphysical to be settled by assumptions cobden is not entitled to claim without more proof than he furnishes that providence is on the side of non-intervention any more than those of a different way of thinking are entitled without proof to assume that providence takes the side of the strongest battalions nor can one accept the fallacy for it is nothing else that the intercourse between communities is nothing more than the intercourse of individuals in the aggregate and therefore to be conducted on the same peaceful principles the analogy does not hold within the barriers of the nation we can leave the free competition of man with man or trade with trade or party with party to pass into pitch of utmost tension only because we can rest assured that behind all this there is a strong and stable government which can prevent competitions and rivalries from issuing in civil strife but this moderating and restraining power is just what we look for in vain when we pass to the relations between nation and nation international law no doubt exists but what are its sanctions there is a european concert hesitating in its deliverances and slow in its actions there are treaties and courts of arbitration though as cobden was the foremost to urge they are never to be entrusted with any powers of enforcing their deliverances who will contend that all these put together can exercise upon nations especially strong ones more than a shadow of the control and restraint exercised over individuals by the law of the land of which they are citizens the fallacy is at its height in certain remarks upon national cowardice if cobden argues that which constitutes cowardice in individuals namely the taking of undue and excessive precautions against danger merits the same designation when practised by communities then england certainly must rank as the greatest poltroon among nations this may be well as a rhetorical protest against panics repeatedly proved groundless but if it be meant as a serious attempt to place on the same footing the precautions which one nation takes against others and the timidity which in a law-abiding country arms private houses with burglar alarms and loaded revolvers the analogy is of the flimsiest for of course the unsuspicious fearlessness of men toward each other in a civilized society goes with the knowledge that even if advantage be taken of this confidence there is yet an iron limit which arrests all encroachment on security of person or property this is of the rudiments of civil freedom but of course this immunity from aggression is unfortunately just what one nation cannot count upon as against other nations so long as there is no supreme coercive authority above all nations to step in with a thus far and no further and to proceed to inflict condign chastisement upon the aggressor now it would be absurd to say that cobden was blind to such considerations on the contrary he showed himself alive to the fact that in the existing economy of civilization a nation must stand prepared if need be to defend its national existence by force of arms he did this when he separated himself decisively from the apostles of peace at any price he did it in a manner sufficiently emphatic when he declared that rather than suffer france to equalize her ships of war with ours 
he would vote one hundred million pounds to the navy estimates but then he did this wholly in the interests of national defence nor was there ever the slightest wavering in his policy that under all contingencies all other nations or tribes must be left to defend themselves or should it please them to make havoc of one another End of section twelve section thirteen of six radical thinkers by john mccun this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the cobdenite doctrines of trade and non-intervention part five it is here one finds it hard to repress the simple question what would be likely to happen were a great power like the british empire to act as cobden would all his life have wished what would happen if it were to renounce in the eye of the world the intention of so much as lifting a finger unless it was itself attacked and to declare that come what might it would limit itself to the influence of peace pursuing example two results at any rate such tidings would in some quarters sound like the knell of doom it would be so in small and weak countries with powerful and aggressive neighbours in rich countries feebly governed and ill defended in uncivilized races whose lands are coveted by civilized colonizers in a word in the possible victims of ambition over the civilized and uncivilized world on the other hand there would be other ears on which the tidings would fall with a different sound on the ears of the ambitious master of legions or of great powers covetous for colonies or spheres of influence or of unscrupulous fomenters of insurrection or ruthless stampers out of insurrection or of fanatical hordes such as in our own day have devastated the soudan to such as these and who will deny that they exist what could be more welcome than the acceptance of cobdenite principles by such great powers as might come between them and their malign ends swift would be their perception that by every power converted to the gospel of non-intervention they would have so much the freer hand for the indulgence of their ambitions and rapacities is it by the powerful example of great powers that such as these are to be restrained or by refusal to subscribe to loans for the cutting of throats even were this practicable or by courts of arbitration which announce their intention of never enforcing their findings or by negotiations for disarmament can we believe much as we might wish to do so that anything avails to stop them short of the armed hostility actual or threatened of precisely those powers which if they followed cobden's advice would refuse to intervene at all this is the standing difficulty of a doctrine of non-intervention admirably fitted to convert some nations whose intervention in the interests of justice and freedom is most to be desired it is thereby only too likely to encourage the intervention for ends not so laudable of those other nations or tribes whose intervention is not to be desired at all in other words it would neutralize the action of those who being amenable to argument seem least in need of being bidden to hold their hand and those who need to be withstood to the face it would leave by removal of checks upon their action to work their will with the destinies of people and the course of civilization nor can any man feel confident that such a policy even were it desirable can be seriously said to be practicable the sympathies of a nation are not bounded by the barriers of its own life and interests and times are apt to come when these sympathies racial religious political humanitarian become so passionate that they cannot be restrained if this be the fact it is part of all wise statesmanship to make provision for such a contingency little to be envied is that country which should adopt a cobdenite policy only to find itself swept along on a wave of democratic passion into an armed intervention for which it was all unready 
nor is the manchester school to be acquitted here of unconsciously playing a part which is something of an irony upon its own doctrine for if it has become difficult for englishmen to stand by and passively look on at what they consider tyranny and atrocity in other lands one reason for this is that the moving words of cobden and bright have helped to make them lovers of freedom it is the jealous patriotic unselfish love of this freedom says cobden impelling the whole community to rush to the legal rescue of the meanest pauper if his character or personal liberties be infringed by those in power that distinguishes us from all european countries yet this is just the leaven which makes it difficult to listen to such tributes to freedom and then to play no more than the spectators part in struggles which though they may be beyond our frontiers are still struggles for freedom begotten of the words of our own orators and statesmen nor need a great nation be stayed from intervention by any or all of those doubts that cobden throws upon its fitness for the task if as he says of england its record is not clean enough the answer is not denial but the admission that if indeed it be so then there is no better way of redeeming even the uncleanest of records than by resolute intervention and sacrifice in a righteous cause and when he argues that no nation is wise enough to be trusted to act it is not necessary to hold a brief for the wisdom of governments enough that the intervention of a nation in foreign affairs may be justified not so much by any claim it can advance to perfect wisdom as by a well-grounded conviction of the unwisdom of its intervening neighbours or rivals it is certainly no part of human wisdom to hold its hands either at home or abroad till it can find perfect instruments nor can it be said looking at the matter broadly that since cobden's day the conditions have made his policy easier of adoption in some respects perhaps they have the public conscience is more disposed to condemn war at any rate in the abstract some countries again our own surely seem to have become greatly more sensitive to sacrifice of human life all countries it is safe to say have come more clearly to realize the cost of war partly for the simple reason that it has become infinitely more costly but partly also one may hope from the diffusion of sounder economic ideas the interests that suffer from war have also under democracy grown larger and more articulate nor can it be doubted that arbitration has made some though not perhaps marked or rapid progress at least civilized peoples are coming to know one another more and to hate one another less yet it may be feared there are influences not evil influences only by any means which tend in the contrary direction and one of these is the growth alike in fact and idea of nationality in so far as nations tend to expand into great empires this may ultimately make for peace the pax romana was the other side of the imperial system of conquering rome similarly there is a pax britannica not to be broken within our empire assured peace within great empires on which the sun never sets is an instalment towards universal peace if such a thing be possible not to be despised but apart from this and certainly in that period when empires are actively in the making who will say that the spirit of nationality makes for peace for it seems to be axiomatic with the nations of the world that their own unimpaired existence and in the case especially of strong nations the realization of their ideals is essential to civilization this appears to be the creed on which they act and not unnaturally for under the existing political system in which there is no higher authority to do justice as between nation and nation each nation is driven to feel that the trust immediately committed to it is its own self-preservation and development the heritage of our civil and political liberty so hardly won our altars and hearths our language traditions and ideals our colonizing instincts our imperial destinies 
for these the citizen is more immediately responsible. These things have, so to say, the first charge on his thoughts and energies. And though there is nothing in this that need prevent the obliteration of that international ignorance, suspicion, and hatred, which still persist even between highly civilized powers, there remains a risk, the risk that the intense patriotic devotion to a man's own country, which seems ready to make almost any sacrifice for the nation, will bring the citizens of diverse countries in all honesty to do something more than justice to their own claims and aspirations, and something less than justice to the aspirations of their neighbors, thereby paving the way for those dire collisions of clashing interests and irreconcilable ideals out of which comes the sanguinary arbitrament of war. It is a vast assumption, one could wish it were a demonstrated truth, that the real interests of all nations are in harmony. It is still but an aspiration, one could wish it were a true prophecy, that what, under that just prejudice men call their country, the nations severally believe to be their interests will not come only too often into armed collision. This risk is enhanced by the direction which national or imperial aspirations have recently taken, for that victorious industrial and commercial development in which Cobden saw the presage of peace has stimulated powerfully the appetite for colonial expansion and the rush for spheres of influence. And when the appropriation of the sphere of influence is wedded to the monopolizing spirit of protection, who can doubt that it carries in it the seeds of many an international quarrel? Cobden himself was ready to admit that armaments were necessary for defense. But a nation of manufacturers and mechanics, dependent for their bread upon their success in foreign markets, may be seriously menaced by other things besides invasion of its shores or overt attacks upon its colonies and dependencies or armed aggression on its mercantile marine. The diplomacy of rival and sometimes hostile powers especially if those powers can reckon upon an attitude of non-intervention, may close markets finally over vast and populous areas. Is nothing to be done, then, but to try to argue such monopolists into free trade policy? Nor is it a little thing that Cobden asks of the citizens of any of the great powers of the world when he invites them to become non-interventionists. He invites them, no matter how strong their cosmopolitan sympathies may be, to renounce once for all the claim that their country should give expression to these sympathies by either act or threat of war. It would be rash to say that in asking nothing less than this he was unreasonable. It is at any rate certain that the citizens of a state after Cobden's own heart would escape from much. They would escape the certain cost and the costly uncertainties of war. They would escape the risk of drawing the sword in an unjust or hopeless or trivial cause. They would escape the responsibilities of provoking counter-intervention. Not least, they would escape participation in those horrors on which it is needless to dilate, and in which even the justest of wars stands panoplied. But it would not be all gain. For these immunities they would have to pay a price. The day would come, it would be certain to come sometime, when they would be face to face with the fact that their country had it in its power to intervene with decisive effect in some cause which enlisted their deepest political sympathies, while yet there was nothing for it left but to play the role of the spectator, spectator possibly of armed interventions by which the fate of nations and even the futures of continents was being determined in defiance of all their hopes and aspirations. It is not easy to unite in one ideal of citizenship those cosmopolitan sympathies and aspirations of which Cobden himself was a prophet, and that refusal to draw the sword, save for defense alone, which to writers like Mazzini has seemed nothing less than an abdication of cosmopolitan duty. Cobden's political creed has drawn upon itself vehement and varied attack. Soldiers have resented, and surely not without reason, 
his bitter disparagement of a great profession, and scholars his Philistine scoffs at the Elysis. In his glorification of the magnitude of modern material interests, he was grossly ignorant or forgetful that the tiny glorious Athenian state was the cradle of civic and political virtue. Imperialists have taxed him, not unjustly, with the belittlement of colonies and dependencies, and an indifference to Greater Britain. And men of more spiritual and ethical fibre, such as Carlyle and Ruskin, have denounced his ideal as a calico millennium. The result is that there has grown up in many minds the picture of Cobden as a limited man, a political huckster, to whom trade was all in all. It is no true picture of the man. No careful reader of his speeches and pamphlets can accept it, and still less can any student of his life. For though his talk was of trade and tariffs, of wages, profits, rents, loans, debts, budgets, this was in large measure the result of the fact that it fell to him to lead in the free trade movement. It is easy to see that there was room in his soul for much beside the things which were perforce most upon his lips. We have seen this already in his own avowals of the ends that upheld him in the free trade struggle. But we can see it elsewhere, often in unexpected ways. Who was it in that vacant half-hour at Shrewsbury, sighed for the knowledge of mullions and architraves that had been denied him? Who was it laughed at the Paisley manufacturer who wished to exploit the classic dune for water power? Who was it who never ceased to yearn for the peace and simplicity of country life? Who was it stirred the heart by his tribute to the heroism of the Quakers who held life light amidst the horrors of the Irish famine? Who was it declared that had he the casting of the role of all the actors on this world stage, he would not suffer a cotton mill or manufactory to have a place in it? Nor did he fail to feel, as few men of affairs have felt, the spiritual price that often has to be paid for strenuous public service. Here I am, he writes from Wales, when the battle of free trade had been fought, in one day from Manchester to the loveliest valley out of paradise. Ten years ago, before I was an agitator, I spent a day or two in this house. Comparing my sensations now with those I then experienced, I feel how much I have lost in winning public fame. For Cobden's ideal of English citizenship was not exhausted in that comfortable, prosperous abundance which he believed a policy of free trade and peace would certainly bring. He has told us so himself. There are many things besides free trade to be done before this country is a fit place to live in. End of section 13《セクション14》of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 The Anti Democratic Radicalism of Thomas Carlyle, Part 1. The references are to the People's Edition of Carlyle's Works. Carlyle's verdict upon J. S. Mill was that he was too fond of demonstrating everything and so far at least as the form of his own thought is concerned, he is at peculiar pains not to fall into the same extreme. The logic of the schools, rush-light logic, closet logic, vulgar logic, finds little favor in his eyes, except as a target for objurgations. Cogito ergo sum, alas, poor cogitator, that will take us but a little way. It is so he blasphemes the father of constructive idealism. This runs throughout. In Emerson's phrase, he does not love to spin the ostentatious continuity. So little does he love it that most of his readers, we suspect, though they recognize the splendor and force of passages, have but an imperfect notion of the connection of the whole. And so, when friendly, they are content to take Carlyle as a man of intuitions intuitions as abrupt and inconsecutive as those of the Hebrew prophets to whom, and not without justification, they are wont to liken him. And when unfriendly, 
they are not without a leaning toward that critic of the sun who wrote down sartor resartus as a heap of clotted nonsense this difficulty of interpretation meets us when we turn to his politics for at first sight his politics puzzle he is not tory nor whig nor radical in the ordinary sense of the word except indeed in so far as he may be made to fill office admirably in all of these parties as devil's advocate every student of his life and writings must know that he spent many an hour for many a year in flinging projectiles of which he had an unlimited store with impartially good aim at all parties in the state the scavenger age he once called the nineteenth century cuius pars magna it is to the whigs perhaps that he is least respectful he hated their half-hearted via media he despised them both for their lack of foundations and even more perhaps for the fact that they did not seem to miss them he was thorough they were the grand dilettanti there is more hope of an atheist utilitarian he once wrote out in his diary of a superstitious ultra tory than of such a lukewarm withered mongrel it is true that as years went on his estimate softened the titular aristocracy whig or other was not quite anathema maranatha there stands a sentence in which late in life he records his deliberate verdict that from plebs to princeps there was still no class among us intrinsically so valuable and recommendable and yet even this strong as the words are is not much better than a commutation of the sentence passed in earlier years the writer of the epitaph upon that worthy nobleman the count von sedam had some amends to make to the double-barrelled game-preserving corn-lying aristocracy of chartism and past and present carlyle was all his life a believer in aristocracy but as happens sometimes with other believers in aristocracy like plato burke and coleridge his tributes to the natural aristocracies of insight and of worth are the bitterest of satires upon the aristocracy of titles pedigrees broad acres sport and luxury and yet it is not to be forgotten that carlyle is severely impartial for one must hasten to add that if whigs and tories pleased him not neither did radicals if the aristocratic landlords whom he called upon in sartor resartus to be pioneers of emigration were preserving their game what were the radicals doing they were busy ballot boxing on the graves of heroic ancestors or sending masters of tongue fence to the national palaver or shouting for liberty to leap over precipices or jubilantly preparing to shoot niagara even in face of this however and of much else in the same strain radicals are not left without their consolations for it must be consolation of a kind to know that if their shrift be short they receive it at the hands of one who is probably a greater radical than themselves for beyond a doubt carlyle is a radical of the first magnitude what other name can fit the preacher of the doctrine as it stands written in sartor resartus that all ranks dignities institutions creeds are but the clothes often threadbare enough wherewith the human spirit patches its nakedness and masquerades in the world's eye the entire volume is one prolonged cry of old clothes that chapter the world out of clothes with its levelling disillusionments is surely sanculatism of an advanced type and when was the natural equality of men more picturesquely set forth than in those few pages on atomatism speculative radical is indeed his own epithet for teufelsdruck and spiritual radicalism for his doctrine both phrases fit carlyle himself similarly in regions less visionary and less speculative carlyle drank in radicalism in his father's cottage he was bred on a countryside where radical tradition was in the blood the religious faith of his early years was emphatically one which knew no respect of persons by hearsay by observation which few things escaped by personal experience 
he was familiar with the struggles and the worth of the poor with humble life he had to the end of his days a deep and understanding sympathy and when in chartism in 1839 and past and present in 1843 he directly attacked political questions his utterance is radical to the roots it is radical in the lurid exposition of the condition of england question and is radical in its fiery and menacing demand that something must be done and done quickly all carlyle's flouts and flings all his jibes and scoffs and their name is legion at the political radicals of his day must not be suffered to hide the fact that to the genius that winged his words he united a practical insight that made him the passionate advocate of popular causes since familiar enough far in advance of his day one need but name poor law reform corn law reform factory acts land law reform not to speak of public health and emigration it is long years he writes to emerson of the revolution of eighteen forty eight since i felt any such deep-seated satisfaction at a public event and even that wild unbridled derisive outburst which forever divided him from the ordinary political radicals the latter-day pamphlets what is it but one of the most vehement pleas ever penned for administrative reform nor is it simply that he dealt with these things many others did that his distinction was to deal with them after such a fashion with humour pathos paradox satire invective eloquence as to burn them into the mind of his generation it is for this reason that he is not only a radical but the father of radicals how many radicals and others one may wonder have found their inspiration in the trumpet calls of past and present or even in that single short concentrated explosive chapter helitage in the volcanic page of Sartor or Sardis. Yet if we claim Carlyle for radicalism, and nothing else is possible, it is very certain that his is not the radicalism we know, not that of Bentham or Mill or Bright or Cobden or Mazzini or Green, for it is radicalism in disbelief, derision, and denunciation of democracy. One finds him writing to Emerson, that he was much struck with Plato and his notions about democracy. Small wonder, for since Plato wrote the eighth book of the Republic, there has been no such satirist of democracy as this spiritual radical. Now, of course, Carlyle never dreamed of denying that democracy was a fact. His eyes were open to the signs of the times, and he saw that it had come. The tramp of its million feet, he declares, is in all our streets and thoroughfares. Nor did he doubt that it would run its course. As little did he dispute that it had its uses. The author of the French Revolution knew well its powers to cleanse and destroy. It was especially valuable as an instrument for deposing shams and quacks. In all this wild revolutionary work, he once said, from Protestantism downwards, I see the blessedest result preparing itself. So, in his view of democratic theories, he was no lover of Benthamism, as we shall see, but he did not fail to discern the possibilities of root and branch work that it carried within it. But there his appreciations stopped. What remains for democracy at his hands can only be described as a prolonged culmination service. This is the more interesting because there is so much in Carlyle's thought that might seem to make for thoroughgoing democracy, for Carlyle is on many points in singular agreement with his democratic friend Mazzini. Like that apostle of the religion of democracy, he believes in the divinity of the individual man. Through every living soul, the glory of a present God still beams. He is emphatic here. The veriest human scarecrow, he assures us, holds his title of manhood from the maker direct. The dullest clodpole, the haughtiest featherhead, has that divine spark in him which constrains him to follow the leader of men, the hero, when he sees him. 
none of all the writers of democracy has ever spoken as he has of the peasant saint or done more to dignify the toils obscure of honest poverty not even burns but there he parts company when mazzini goes on to argue and surely not without a presumption in his favour that if men are thus in very truth the children of god they must be trusted to take their political destinies into their own hands and work out their own political salvation he will have none of it and so as the years went on and he saw english democracy running its course he has nothing left to offer it but jeers ever more derisive at the twenty-seven million gods of the gallery scoffs ever more embittered at horsehood and doghood suffrage and even let the worst be said execrations upon what he once called the rotten multitudinous canaille the truth here is exactly as mazzini puts it in his criticism carlyle believes in god he believes also in the worth of the individual man however humble and homely what he does not believe in what he abhors and distrusts for evermore is the collective will god and the individual man mr carlyle sees no other object in the world so run mazzini's words carlyle's indictment of democratic radicalism is on the face of it highly rhetorical he could not write without rhetoric but it is also the rhetoric that has reasons behind it this is so even in his most explosive outbursts and in the present instance he leaves us in no doubt as to what his reasons were one reason was that he realized with a penetrating insight the depth and difficulty of the problems he used to laugh sardonically at some of the questions that agitated politicians game laws usury laws african blacks hill coolies smithfield cattle and dog carts and even when the country was convulsed over the first reform bill he had an intuition that the real questions lay deeper than merely political reforms could touch it never smokes but there is fire was the motto he chose for his chartism but as he looked out in the thirties first from the dunscore potmus of craig puttock and afterwards from his retreat in chelsea it was on a spectacle of deep-seated social disorganization it was an england of full purses and full poorhouses of overproduction when clothes could not find backs and backs could not find clothes to cover them where every new machine was welcomed and that cunningest of all machines a man was superfluous where there was endless work to be done and where willing workers sought in vain for work to do it was in england in short ill-fed ill-housed discontented given over to smashing of machinery and rick-burning and mutinous chartist agitation carlyle saw this and felt it call ye that a society he cries where there is no longer any social idea extant not so much as the idea of a common home but only of a common overcrowded lodging-house where each isolated regardless of his neighbour turned against his neighbour clutches what he can get and cries mine and calls it peace because in the cut purse and cut-throat scramble no steel knives but only a far cunninger sort can be employed this was the condition of england question as carlyle raised it and he could not believe that democratic radicalism was equal to its solution it was unequal to the work that had to be done powerful to destroy it was impotent to reconstruct admirable as a besom to sweep the world of simulacra reorganization was beyond it forcible enough for wresting tools from the hands that could not use them it was feeble for putting them into hands that could he never seems to have had much faith in it at any time and after the death of peel the one contemporary statesman in whom he had some confidence his disbelief in political methods steadily grew upon him till the note that was struck in latter-day pamphlets in eighteen fifty found its sequel in eighteen sixty seven in the wild whirling derisive invective of shooting niagara but he had reasons all along his faith in collective wisdom was of the slenderest and one can easily see why for it was part of the doctrine of unconsciousness 
as given to the world in the pregnant early essay on characteristics that even the greatest actors on the world's stage are swept along by ideas of which they are but imperfectly conscious it was always his conviction that the forces of life lie deeper than the plummet of consciousness can sound the ideas that master men are greater than the ideas men master some of the most picturesque effects in all his writings are those in which he loves to describe how even intellectual leaders in the very hour of their fancied enlightenment are being precipitated towards ends they wot not of was it not so with the french salon before the revolution in love with new ideas and all unconscious of the blood boltered nemesis that was lying in ambush for them was it not so with the revolutionary leaders filled with the latest lights of encyclopedism and so soon to be devoured by the spectre of anarchy which they had themselves unchained was it not so with the french noblesse who scoffed at the theories of the social contract and whose skins were used to bind the second edition of that work if these things were done in the green tree what was likely to be done in the dry should power pass into the hands of those whom even mill designated the collective mediocrity and common uncultivated herd on the whole so runs one of many similar reflections in the french revolution how unknown is a man to himself or a public body of men to itself aesop's fly on the chariot wheel exclaiming what a dust i do raise it needed only that this gospel of the unconscious to which even genius must bow should join hands with a low and not seldom a contemptuous and cynic estimate of popular intelligence and we have all the elements for that scornful belittlement of popularly elected parliaments which grew upon carlyle pari passu with the growth of democratic power fatuity could no further go than to suppose that an electorate mostly fools could by the panacea of ballot boxes find their way where even illuminati had stumbled and fallen or solve problems which called for nothing less than the insight and valor of the rare heaven elected leader of men End of section fourteen Section fifteen of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter four The Anti Democratic Radicalism of Thomas Carlyle. Part two. Nor is anyone likely to deny that on one point Carlyle was here indubitably right. The problems were difficult they were deeper far than the politicians imagined it is easy now to see that the reforms of eighteen thirty two and the years that immediately followed could not fulfil the democratic hopes that were built upon them hence disillusionment and embitterment hence chartism hence the cry for a new and still again a new reform bill hence in due season the advent of socialism let justice be done to carlyle here he saw with the clearest eyes as mill likewise saw and as the politicians did not see that the problems were deeper more stubborn more formidable than political reform could solve they were social questions this is what carlyle saw he saw it and he said it when brushing politics aside he declared that the real question of the day and he might have added of many a day to come was the condition of england question it is quite another matter however when he went on to revile democracy as impotent or as he called it paralytic one must not to be sure say dogmatically that he was wrong democracy is still upon its trial yet it is not premature to suggest that there are some respects in which the damnatory verdict is to say the least unconvincing thus it lies on the surface that in his unrelieved diatribes Carlyle ignores the possibility that a democracy can learn its business. We have seen that the educative influence of democratic institutions was the sheet anchor of Mill's optimism. 
it is absolutely nothing to Carlyle. He believed, indeed, in popular education. He passionately pled for it. But it did not come into his horizon as it did into that of Mill, that there is a civic education that comes of the free citizen's contact with affairs. This is the most glaring gap in Carlyle's politics. He does not know how to value the civic spirit. If he turns his eyes on citizenship at all, it is only to see the evil incidents, the shibboleths, the palaver, the stump oratory, the schwermerei, the ignorance, the levity, the recklessness. The evils need not be denied, Mill saw them, and yet Mill was convinced, and both Mazzini and Green, as we shall see, shared the conviction that it is of the essence of all sound national life, not only that the state should count on the subject's loyalty, but that the citizen should find his life as he can never find it in the circumscribed round of private interests, in and through the duties which are also the responsibilities of civic status. Carlyle, to be sure, believed that the individual man, be he never so lowly, was capable of much, of nothing less indeed than of writing on the eternal skies the record of a heroic life. It is his limitation that he seems to shut his eyes to the fact that, far short of the heroic life and nearer hand, lies what Green was wont to call the life of the good neighbor and honest citizen. Similarly with these flouts and flings at democratic ignorance. It is easy to emphasize the complex difficulty of political and social problems, to point to the ignorance of the mob and draw the obvious inference. It was the way of Lowe when he fought against the extension of the franchise, as it was the way of Maine, when he deplored that the franchise had been extended. It is the way of all the critics of democratic government. First, they magnify political questions as enough to perplex the wits of experts. Then, they proceed to ask if roughs and clowns are likely to find solutions. Carlyle's indictment is substantially the same, except that in the rich rhetoric of his onslaught, he leaves all other critics far behind. The issue, as thus stated, is, however, all too easy. The real issue involves certain further considerations which, in barest justice to democracy, are not to be forgotten. One of them is the fact, sufficiently familiar, that political questions come before the democratic electorate in a vastly simplified form. When Gladstone was arguing the case for extension of the franchise, as against the unbelieving intellectualism of Lowe, he laid it down as axiomatic that the people must be passive. This, he said, was written with a pen of iron on the rock of human destiny. He did not mean, of course, that the people had nothing left them to do, but only that they were not called upon to play their decisive part till by much discussion elsewhere, in press, platform, parliament, private life, the question sub judice had been thrashed out and reduced to their broad issues. Nothing can be more evident than that the tariff problem or an agricultural holdings bill or a project for graduated taxation, if these be taken in all their baffling intricacies and far-reaching consequences, pass far beyond the mental compass of the average elector. Even the chosen representative has before now been beholden to the expert in one and all of them. And if the matter ended there, there would be nothing left for democracy but to humble itself under the Carlylean rod. If it does not, if it still clings to the claim to manage its own affairs, it is on the comparatively modest ground that the average man can be trusted to cast an honest and sensible vote after many a voice and many a pen have for many a day been laboring to make the broad issues level to his comprehension. Nor is this an unreasonable expectation. It is not unreasonable because the qualities to be looked for in an electorate are far from being purely intellectual. In any great community it must always happen 
that the members of the diverse ranks, classes, and conditions bring with them to the work of self-government their own characteristic virtues and defects. They are severally placed in positions of advantage and of disadvantage. Carlyle, alas, sees only and all too clearly the disadvantages and the defects. Who will venture to hold a brief for the learned class when he recalls the dry as dusts of the Carlylean pillory, or for the nobility, when he remembers the graceful idleness of Mayfair diversified by the sweat of Melton Mowbray, or for the plutocracy, when his thoughts run to the whole broadsides delivered against cash nexus and Midas eared mammonism, or for the plebs, when he resuscitates those epithets we have seen. But it is not upon defects and disadvantages that questions of suffrage turn. If this were so, the whole world might well be disfranchised. The one point worth discussing is whether beneath the defects which need not be disputed, there cannot be found in the members of all classes in the state those positive qualities that make the citizen. These qualities are not intellectual merely, nor is it difficult to specify what they are. One is the ability to set sufficient value upon the broad public ends upon which all political effort is directed, and among these the very ends to which Carlyle himself has so opened the eyes of his countrymen that they cannot again be closed. One has but to think of personal independence, tools to the man who can use them, and wages to the man who can earn them, good sanitation, accessible education, the maintenance of law and order, an efficient public service, national defense. These are the very ends which Carlyle proclaimed upon the housetops, and not in vain, because in truth they are ends that stare even the average man in the face and cross his life and his interests in manifold inevitable ways. A second quality, and it goes closely with the first, is sufficient superiority to selfish, and to use Bentham's favorite term, sinister interests. But then these sinister interests are not the peculiar bane of a democratic electorate. They are the bane of all classes in the state, and they are not least the bane, as Bentham would remind us, of those classes who are peculiarly tempted toward them by social privilege and political monopoly. Still another quality is that experience of the transaction of public business, which, as we have seen, filled so large a place in the educational outlook of Mill, and which comes of actual contact with the affairs of workshop, friendly society, trades union, cooperative association, political organization, not less surely than it comes in other walks of life. Lastly, and above all else important, there is that sagacity, shrewdness, common sense, call it what we may, which is the cardinal quality of the practical man in all conditions of life. The critic of human nature may say it is none too common. Carlyle, for one, thought it was none too common in any social stratum. Least of all is he disposed to admit its presence in the twenty-seven millions mostly fools. Yet even Carlyle tells us it may be found under the peasant's roof, nor in his humorous and satirical yet not unkindly estimate of the English character, does he fail to credit Bull, despite all his limitations, with a solid, if silent, good sense and practicality. It would seem as if it is only when this noble, silent people comes to politics that these saving qualities appear somehow to evaporate. Such, at any rate, appear to be the more important qualities which fit the citizen for his work, and the case for democracy as against Carlyle may be said to rest upon two cardinal propositions in regard to them. The one is that they are not the monopoly of any single rank, class, or order in the state, and the other that they exist in sufficient measure in all classes, from plebs to preenkeps, to justify a democratic franchise. It is not that these qualifications need be supposed to exist in equal measure among all sorts and conditions of men. 
few would say they do. None may know better, and it may be more bitterly, than the hewers of wood and drawers of water, the indubitable superiorities that come of an intellectual training such as their lot may have denied them. None may realize more keenly and sometimes more enviously the opportunities which titled or affluent leisure may put within the reach of the man who is minded to work for public causes. Yet the balance does not dip wholly in favor of the educated, the titled, or the affluent. One must never forget that among the qualifications for citizenship, and it is not the least, is a face-to-face -face personal experience of the hardships, miseries, and wrongs which it will remain for long a prime concern of wise legislation and sound administration to extinguish or alleviate. And if this be so, it is not those citizens who are naturally removed from personal contact with these things by a studious or an affluent or simply a comfortable and easy life who are best fitted either to press for remedial legislation or to judge of its effectiveness when passed nor can anything be more evident than that of a tithe of the denunciations derisions and reproaches which carlyle hurls at landlordism and capitalism and dilettantism be merited these classes would stand convicted of blindness and apathy to the social needs that were starting up under their very feet nor is it to be forgotten how much of the work of democracy lies not in its self-solving problems but in choosing men who can. For it is, of course, inevitable that modern democracy be representative. Its business is not to find delegates, but to delegate its powers, and to record its votes for men into whose hands it can resign the initiation of measures and adjustment of details of which it is itself for many reasons inherently incapable. Its truest friends take their stand upon this ground. They plead for the independence of the representative. In the words of Macaulay when arguing for a Whig franchise, popular institutions once provided will provide the country with fit men. Carlyle himself has told us that the clodpole and the featherhead have in them an indestructible instinct of hero worship. If so, cannot the ordinary citizen who is neither clodpole nor featherhead be trusted to find his leader and to follow him all the more readily because he is the man of his political choice? This, however, is precisely the point upon which Carlyle most decisively joins issue. The reason above all other reasons why, as he contends, democracy is bound to fail is that it cannot choose its true leaders. With all its greed for franchises and its inordinate appetite for elections, it cannot be trusted in the only election that is of real significance, the election of capacity and worth. Sincere and unquenchable as the promptings of hero worship may be elsewhere, the objects of its choice in politics would too surely be the Sir Jabesh windbags of past and present, or even stump orators and charlatans worse than he, born to power by the temporary hallelujahs of flunkies. It is, in truth, far from easy to understand Carlyle's exact position here. He does not seem to mean, as some of his critics have averred, that the born leader of men is to dragoon his followers into a servile subservience, an occasional sympathy with the brass collar of girth, born thrall of Cedric, and other methods of despotism, must not obscure the fact that he insisted that all genuine hero worship must be spontaneous and willing. On the other hand, he is certainly not minded to leave the follower to choose the leader. For this is precisely what in politics at any rate he abhors. It has often and justly been urged that Carlyle leaves his readers bewildered as to the precise methods by which his heroes are to be placed in power. The one point on which he is entirely explicit is that it will never be by democratic count of heads. For to him, the world was by its very constitution a hierarchy, extending up degree above degree to heaven itself and God the Maker, 
and by consequence anything that savoured of equality, and especially that instalment of equality which equalises citizens at the door of the polling booth, was a monstrous usurpation. Social salvation lay for him in directly the opposite direction. For it turned on the hope, which till near the middle of the century was even strong and confident, that the great mass of his fellow countrymen still had it in them, as the deepest instinct of their souls, to recognize, to honor, and to follow the divinely elected and self-elected leader of men. This was to him the everlasting adamant, lower than which the confused wreck of revolutionary things cannot fall. It was the cornerstone of living rock, whereon all polities, for the remotest time, may stand secure. Such leaders may be endlessly diverse, and it is the glory of Carlyle that his hero worship has so many mansions, but they are to be sought for especially in two directions. There are the men of spiritual insight, the prophets and the thinkers, who had discerned beneath all the welter and scramble of human affairs the old eternal laws that live forever. This was what he had in mind when he once said that the true struggle of the age was not between Tory and Radical, but between believer and unbeliever. Believer and unbeliever in those oracles of eternal justice by the observance of which as he had early come to think, nations live, as by disregard of them they surely decay and die. And there are the men of practical insight, the silent workers of the world, men of but little speculative turn, driven on by ideas of which they are but dimly conscious, who nevertheless are in their lives and deeds nothing other than ambassadors of the cosmos. Ah, yes, I will say it again, the great silent men, looking round on the noisy inanity of the world, words with little meaning, actions with little worth, one loves to reflect on the great empire of silence, the noble silent men scattered here and there, each in his department silently thinking, silently working, whom no morning newspaper makes mention of, they are the salt of the earth. To these two, the hero as prophet and the hero as worker, let the world hearken, and all may yet be well. To them, let the world refuse to hearken, and democracy, if it would but listen, may already hear the roar of the Niagara over which it is hastening to plunge. End of section 15. Section 16 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4. The Anti-Democratic Radicalism of Thomas Carlyle, Part 3. It is not easy to decide to which of these two types Carlyle leans, so fervid is he in his admiration of greatness in all modes, from Norse Odin to English Samuel Johnson, from the divine founder of Christianity to the withered pontiff of encyclopedism. As the years went on, his sympathies seemed to have intensified toward the rugged Brindleys, Arkwrights, Watts, and to the captains of industry, from whom he looked for so much. It has been truly said that it is one of the striking contrasts of his character that though by choice and disposition a spectator of life, he was always in his strongest sympathies a man of action. Yet this last point must not be pressed unduly. Too many readers are carried away by the well-worn designation of Carlyle as the prophet of work. So he is. There is no watchword dearer to him than tools to the man, not arms and the man, or shirt frills and the man, as he reminds us and it has actually been made matter of reproach that in urging mankind as the sum of the whole matter to do the duty that lies nearest to hand, he would disastrously withdraw their energies from the more distant and less self-centered duties of citizenship. It is the very criticism which characteristically Mazzini passes upon him. 
but there are two facts which go far to blunt its edge. One is that work in the Carlylean vocabulary is a wide word. It includes, as a memorable passage in Sartor Resartus tells us, the work for spiritual bread. Johnson and Rousseau, Goethe and Burns are among the workers. Hence the futility of the taunt that Carlyle preached a gospel of work and never did anything himself. The fact of the matter here is not that Carlyle failed to live up to his own gospel of work, but that his critics should learn to interpret that gospel aright. The second consideration is that in Carlyle's tributes to practical workers, even the most humble and illiterate, it is never the mere work done that evokes his reverence. In the great workers, it is the insight, the eye for fact, and the firm faith that lay behind achievement. In the humble, unrecorded workers, it is the doing of the work with fidelity as in the great taskmaster's eye. Few criticisms are further from the mark than the trite imputation that Carlyle worshipped mere blind and brutal force. This will become clearer when we remember that Carlyle's entire practical teaching, both in politics and ethics, rested upon certain fundamental convictions which it is now time to proceed to consider. This is the more important because there is a tendency in some quarters, where it might have least been expected, to stake Carlyle's claims as a political writer upon the truth or otherwise of his definite prophecies about democracy. It must have startled many students of his life to read the conditions on which his biographer is willing that his master's writings should be consigned to oblivion. Carlyle, says Mr. Froude, like them, that is the Hebrew prophets, believed that he had a special message to deliver to the present age. Whether he was correct in that belief, and whether his message was a true message remains to be seen. He has told us that our most cherished ideas of political liberty, with their kindred corollaries, are mere illusions, and that the progress which has seemed to go along with them is a progress toward anarchy and social dissolution. If he was wrong, he has misused his powers. The principles of his teaching are false. He has offered himself as a guide on a road of which he has no knowledge, and his own desire for himself would be the speediest oblivion both of his person and his works. It is not necessary to adopt the funereal estimate. Carlyle himself, it is to be remembered, set but little store upon political prediction. What thing is foreseen, he asks, especially what man the parent of things? But quite apart from this, it is scant justice thus to judge a man of genius by the soundness or otherwise of what is, after all, but an application, however important, of a far wider doctrine. It would be nearer the truth to affirm that though all the political predictions which Carlyle ever penned were falsified, though he were proved wrong in his forecasts and Mill and Mazzini right, he would still remain one of the great political writers of the century. At the very least, he has done democracy the service of telling it of its faults, and who will venture to say that it does not need the telling? If Carlyle said many bitter things of his generation, so did Isaiah and Plato and Tacitus and Juvenal and Swift of theirs. This was part of his mission. By temperament and vocation, he was a satirist in politics. It little befits English society to complain of his flouts and flings, his mordant humor, his fierce invective, till it can feel with a clear conscience that it has ceased to deserve them. Let it rather lay to heart the injunction of the ancient cynic, associate with your enemy, he will be the first to tell you of your faults. For the words of a great satirist, instinct with genius and lit up by humor and pathos, do not lose their value because leveled against causes that are triumphant. It is just the hour of triumph that most needs the salutary whisper, Remember thou art mortal. And then the words of Carlyle are not powerful only to scathe and to destroy. The very ferocity of his indictment of democracy was born of a passionate perception of how much there was to be done. 
It was not simply the ineffectuality of democracy that he reviled. It was what he believed to be its impotence in the presence of great and urgent social ends and issues. And his championship of the ends remains whether they are to be attained by democratic government or by aristocratic despotism. Enough and to spare remains in his writings for the democratic spirit to feed upon and perpetually to renew its youth, even when the whole combination service upon counts of heads be taken as read. For the democratic spirit is one thing, and democratic methods of government another. And though Carlyle did not love the second, Few men have done more splendid service to the first. For the root and the fruit of democracy, what are they but the recognition of the worth, dignity, and possibilities of the individual life, however flickering and obscure? Carlyle joins hands with Mill and Mazzini here. He outdoes them. No writer in our literature, it is safe to say, has done more for this, the essence of the democratic spirit, than this sworn foe of political democracy. It is not because of his toils that I lament for the poor. We must all toil, or steal, howsoever we name our stealing. What I do mourn over is that the lamp of his soul should go out, that there should one man die ignorant, who had capacity for knowledge. This I call a tragedy, were it to happen more than twenty times in a minute, as by some computations it does. This is Carlyle's version of the education question. What is to become of our cotton trade? cried certain spinners when the Factory Act was proposed. What is to become of our invaluable cotton trade? The humanity of England answered steadfastly, Deliver me these rickety, perishing souls of infants, and let your cotton trade take its chance. This is his case for factory legislation. Even in the nigger question, that stone of stumbling and rock of offense to many a disciple, it will be found that in treating the great cause of slave emancipation with scant respect and deplorable levity, this is, in part at any rate, because his eyes were open to other things nearer home. It is not to the West Indies that I run first of all, O brothers, O sisters, it is for these white women that my heart bleeds and my soul is heavy. Nor in these days of great cities and massed populations and imposing movements alike political and economic, which threaten to dwarf to insignificance the transitory struggling individual life, can democracy afford to reject, still less to assail, the man who even in his bitterest and most declamatory hour never forgot that there is the fifth act of a tragedy on every deathbed, though it be a peasant's on a bed of heath. It is something even more than this, that beyond all writers of the nineteenth century, Carlyle has borne witness to the spirituality of the foundations upon which society rests. It has been characteristic of this age to produce many writers and readers who, having, with or without proof, satisfied themselves that society is an organism, seem to think that no more remains to be said. Evolution has produced the organism, the will of evolution, if it have a will, be done. It is not enough for Carlyle. Deeply prejudiced, though he was against the teaching of the evolutionists, and lamentably incapable of doing justice to Darwin, he was well aware, none knew better, that society is organic. Never has the subtlety of the ties that bind man to man been drawn to light with more telling and picturesque effect than in the chapter in Sartre on organic filaments. But he is not minded to rest content with biological analogies and evolutionary forces. He takes a higher flight. Generation after generation takes to itself the form of a body and forth issuing from Sumerian night, no heaven's mission appears. But whence? O oh heaven! Whither? This is the question as he puts it in what is one of the greatest passages he ever wrote. It is also the question he tries to answer not only in the context where he declares it is from mystery to mystery, 
from God to God, but in the vehement protest of all his writings from Sartre onwards against the extrusion of spirit from explanation whether of the rise or of the fall of nations. For Carlyle's political doctrines are very far from being political only. The politics of a higher region encompass him, as Emerson said, and into that higher region the reader must follow him if he hopes to understand the grounds and significance of his teaching on even the most mundane affairs. Nor is the difficulty in following so great as it might appear from the fragmentary and disrupted form of his utterance. Suspicious though he was of all closely reasoned construction, and all his life through much more concerned that ideas should be realized in life than that they should be systematized in thought, it will be found that all his leading convictions are far enough from floating loose and incoherent. This will appear if we proceed at once to ask what these ideas are. At the root of all else lies the conviction, intense, unfaltering, far-reaching, of the mutability of the world of appearances. No writer of any age has surpassed him in this, not the Hebrew psalmists, nor Plato, nor Marcus Aurelius, nor Omer Khayyam, nor even Spinoza himself, great reasoning prophet of the unsubstantiality of all finite things. For this conviction met Carlyle at every turn. The obscure annals of his quiet Annandale countryside suggested it. So did the hurrying crowds of the Strand. He never forgot it, nor could forget it. To look at all ordinary things was for him to look through them, with an eye which, even in the pride of life and the great tides of affairs, detected the transitoriness of the whole falsely satisfying unsubstantial spectacle. He tells us how one evening he passed through the little town of Annan, where years before he had been a schoolboy. Annan Street had groups of prentice lads in it and maid servants in white aprons. Tom Willison's shop light was shining far up the street, but Tom himself, I suppose, is laid long since in the everlasting night or the everlasting day. What he here saw in the unrecorded pathos of humble life, he saw elsewhere on the larger scale. On the broadest page of history, as he reads it, is written the same disillusioning message. All things pass. Even the vastest of historic movements and the most gorgeous pageantries are, after all, what are they but shadows, which come and go in frail and temporary substantiation across some more enduring background of life or nature, which in its turn is itself to be engulfed by all-devouring chronos. It is so with your national wars, your Moscow retreats, your sanguinary hate-filled revolutions. They are all but the somnambulism of uneasy sleepers, the dreaming which on earth we call life. And so on the great procession moves from the little life and the unmarked death of a country carrier to the fall of an empire or the collapse of a civilization. It is beyond our scope to trace the sources of this conviction, apart from the influences of the Hebrew scriptures and some aspects of German idealism. It doubtless came simply of the personal experience that life is a fleeting and unsatisfying thing at best, and of that broad outlook upon fact and history which seldom fails to dwarf all single episodes and events. Enough that it stands written broadly on all the Carlylean writings, so that even he who runs may read it there. And yet it is this prophet of the mutability of empires and civilizations, nay, of the unsubstantiality of nature herself, who is ready to tell a country ditcher that his life is an epic, and to remind the world that there is the fifth act of a tragedy on every deathbed, though it be on a bed of heath, who claims for the day drudge the possibility of writing on the eternal skies the record of a heroic life, who honors the hard hand of the mason as much as if it had held a scepter, who is quick to ascribe to a fact, how trivial soever it may seem, a significance not to be conceded to the greatest creation of imagination, who has won from a brother historian the tribute that in historic research he joins to the genius of a poet the care of an antiquary, 
and who more perhaps than any writer of our century, has dedicated his powers to preaching the wonder of the dewdrop or the withered leaf. Does it not seem as if there must be contradiction somewhere? Now the great world itself is shadow and illusion, the dreaming that men call life. The mood passes, and the hammer or the pickaxe, the morning cloud or the hyssop that springeth on the wall, has become the theme of a gospel. Yet contradiction is a word we must not use here. For the contradiction vanishes as soon as it becomes apparent that this conviction of mutability, written so large upon the Carlylean page, is not the last word, though it may be the first of Carlyle's philosophy. In point of fact, his almost oriental sense of mutability is but the step to a faith which nothing ever shook in the reality and immutability of a world of unseen law. If this transition seems startling, it is to be borne in mind that it is one which the human mind, with an audacity which would pluck belief from doubt and life from the very jaws of death, has not hesitated again and again to attempt. The prophet, the poet, the metaphysician, the unlettered man even, whose spirit has been touched by the hungers and thirsts of religious aspiration, have all believed that somehow they could pass this gulf. All of them have striven, some by the groping trackless ways of mysticism, some by firm highway of philosophy, to find permanence beyond mutability, reality behind illusion, being beneath the very flux and nothingness of things. Carlyle follows them. We can read it in his conversations, his diaries, in all his writings, and in none so unmistakably as what he calls, not altogether aptly, the high platonic mysticism of Sartor Resartus. It was the experience of Teufelsdruck as it stands written in Sartor Resartus. For when that platonic mystic rose in protest against the everlasting no, and all the world and the fiend had done to crush him, it was not to nurse the barren consciousness of an abstract and empty spiritual freedom. It was to turn from the corrosive sorrows, the maddening obstructions of his own embittered lot, to the larger life of the impersonal world, to the treasured achievements of ancient cities, to the buried valor of world-famous battlefields, in a word, to the twofold text of the Book of Revelation, the text written in the lives of heroes, and the other text of great libraries. This was his center of indifference, and small wonder if the passionate egoism of Teufelsdruck's earlier years was forgotten in the greatness of the spectacle. And yet it was not a spectacle only, for as he looked upon it with those eyes that looked through clothes till they became transparent, Intuition struck fire upon experience, appearances grew luminous with a new light, and through the veil of nature and of the long procession of life the truth dawned that the universe is not dead and demoniacal, a charnel house with spectres, but godlike and my father's. It was so that Teufelsdruck passed to the everlasting yea. End of section 16《ラジオビジネス・ジャーナル・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・ラジオ・And to the last, he flung his missiles at all close logical synthesis, especially if it seemed to him overconfident. He is content with his zigzag series of rafts, his flying pontoons over the impassable. But he never doubts that the crossing can be accomplished. An endless variety of phrase, an endless monotony of conviction in force on a hundred pages, the final conclusion. That mutability and illusion be their empire never so wide, 
are but the appearances woven upon that cunningly wrought curtain of space and time which lies between our imperfect vision and the realities that are abiding nor be its logic what it may is this belief in ultimate realities ever more strongly held by carlyle than when he realizes with a profound and pitying sympathy the transitoriness of life and the fragility of tenure by which the generations of short-lived men hold the earth it is the creed of his disciple emerson if my bark sinks tis to another sea his own strong words need no further comment know of a truth that only the time shadows have perished or are perishable that the real being of whatever was and whatever is and whatever will be is now and for ever carlyle then takes this momentous step but it is not to rest there for if he believes in unseen laws he believes also that these laws exist that they may be enacted this was in the main because he conceived spiritual reality as spiritual force hence his protest against the absentee god who sits on the outskirts of his universe to watch it go hence his insistence that this all-pervading force is present even in the evaporation of the raindrop or the rotting of the leaf this conviction runs throughout eternal law he writes is silently present everywhere and every when by law the planets gyrate in their orbits by some approach to law the street cabs ply in the thoroughfares nothing less than this will satisfy his hunger for what is concrete and actual hardly has he ceased prophesying upon the mutability of the world before he is like plato again in this bidding us turn to the world once more to see in its very dust and drift a revelation of eternal ideas this comes out vividly in his attitude to emerson a man's disciples are sometimes his best correctives and carlyle seems to have felt that emerson and his followers were just by reason of their faith and ideas in danger of falling into an airy and over-easy optimism which failed to do justice to concrete fact you seem to me so he writes in danger of dividing yourselves from the fact of this present universe in which alone ugly as it is can i find any anchorage he is more explicit still i will have all things condense themselves take shape and body if they are to have my sympathy i have a body myself in the brown leaf sport of the autumn winds i find what mocks all prophesyings even hebrew ones nor is it too much to say that it is as prophet of this doctrine that ideas or laws must find enactment that carlyle has done most for his generation there may be passages in which at times he seems to sink into pessimism he can see in the insane scramble of human affairs little but a tale told by an idiot hence his disgusts his satire his ferocious invective against cants and shams yet this is but the bitterness of an inverted idealism it bespeaks no loss of faith justice may be delayed men and nations may perish as if without law yet his final word is firm i tell thee again there is nothing else but justice hence the other the practical side of carlyle for despite all his acceptance of mutability his belief in the eternal and resistless activity of spirit compels him to reinstate though with a deepened significance that same endless procession of human affairs in which he had erewhile seemed to seek in vain for any substantiality at all it is necessary to dwell on this because it furnishes the key to much of his writings thus glancing for a moment at the form of his message it partly explains both his humour and his pathos for humour and pathos have both their root in the perception of contrasts and carlyle's view of life was such that contrast verging upon contradiction could never be far from him thus there are times when as he writes the tragedy of life seems to be darkening down with every word 
but it does not darken into night. For the thought of the evanescence, the nothingness of all the ways of men asserts itself, and the tragedy dissolves in a sudden laughter of sunshine. Nay, I think, with old Hugo von Trimberg, God must needs laugh outright could such a thing be, to see his wondrous mannequins here below. And though the end is not always, perhaps, not oftenest laughter, it comes through similar contrasts. As Teufelsdruck has it, light dancing with guitar music will be going on in the forecourt, while by fits from within comes the faint whimpering of woe and wail. It could not be otherwise, for the humor and pathos of Carlyle are not decorations. They are of the essence of the changing movement of his thought. They come of his way of looking at what he once called the divine infernal spectacle of life. The reader who forgets this will never understand him. A high authority has asked if the same fountain can bring forth bitter and sweet. It can, it does, in Carlyle, in whom, if in any writer of the world the roots of the tree of laughter lie close to the well of tears. Enough, however, of the manner of his message. Our present concern is with its substance for it is in this that all his most characteristic doctrines find their explanation. It is so with his philosophy of revolutions. Seeley has called him in this connection the prophet of national decay, and he is never greater than when illustrating revolution that is past or foreboding revolution to come. But when his mind thus turns to destruction and decay, it is for the healthy reason that in the horrors of insurrection in the roaring hell-porch of a hotel de ville, he can read, as by flashes of lightning, the eternal vitality of justice and the vigilance of divine judgment. I should not have known what to make of this world at all, he once said to Froude, if it had not been for the French Revolution. For it was not as a new beginning that he read that supreme catastrophe, it was as an ending, a judgment a proclamation of the bankruptcy of imposture, a sowing of the wind, and a reaping of the whirlwind. Closely akin are his views upon punishment. It happened, some time before 1850, that he went to visit one of those model prisons which, thanks to Romilly and Mackintosh, had by that time taken the place of the styes in which John Howard did his work. And having seen how within its walls the devil's regiments of the line were provided for, he passed out into a squalid quarter hovelled in which the unfortunates not yet enlisted into that force were struggling manifestly to keep the devil out of doors and not enlist with him. Hence this outburst in the latter-day pamphlets, in which with more than habitual fury he insists on the duty of hating criminals, and if need be, even when all else fails, not till then, of cutting them off in the name of God. Many readers saw in this nothing but reaction toward the old ferocious methods that turn the country into a shambles, and the pamphlet is beyond gainsaying Radamanthine. Yet the matter has another, a Carlylean side, for even were it true, as some aver, that the more society abhors crime, the less it punishes it, this would be no fit legend to engrave upon the lintels of our model prisons not at any rate until we feel certain that the less we punish crime, the more do we abhor it, thereby taking security against the facile pity and the doctrinaire toleration which do but murder, pardoning those that kill. It was this side of the question that appealed to Carlyle. It is false to stigmatize him, as some have, as if he were a mere ferocious apostle of revenge. Crime and criminals were hateful to him, and he longed that the arm of human justice should strike them down, because he saw in them a defiance of those higher laws of righteousness that are written on the adamant tablet and on the iron leaf by the finger of justice. For with this Calvinist, Calvinist in spirit long after he had ceased to be so in formula, it is law and vindication of law from first to last. He is always repeating himself, said his critics, so he is. He says the same thing over and over again, but this may be a merit. For when prophets cease repeating their convictions, there will be few convictions worth the repeating. 
similarly with his teachings upon might and right and their relation. It has often been grotesquely misunderstood. It will always be misunderstood if it is not regarded in its true light as part of Carlyle's creed as to the relation of God to the world. Carlyle never fails to see that might differs from right. From hour to hour they may differ frightfully, that is his word. Nor can this difference ever pass into identity through the success, however prolonged, of brute non-moral force. For this is the direct opposite of Carlyle's teaching. Process cannot make right, if it be the fact, and if he taught anything he taught this, that right stands distinct from wrong in the very decrees of God. There is, of course, much controversy familiar enough as to whether in his interpretation of particular historical personages he is not over ready to see in them the instruments of God, or at very least the scourges of God, where other interpreters would hesitate to claim any such credentials for them. This is a question for historians. Let them decide or agree to differ, whether Frederick or Mirabeau or Napoleon were as Carlyle draws them. Meanwhile, the fact remains that these, like other Carlylean estimates, which have seemed to critics all too favorable, are so far from being due to over-eagerness to deify brute force and worship success that they are due to precisely the opposite proclivity. Their true derivation lies in a passionate, life-long yearning to see justice done, and in a faith that refused to believe that the old eternal laws that live forever could permanently remain without their witness upon earth. Carlyle could not think otherwise without infidelity to his fundamental conviction that if laws, divine and immutable, exist, they will sooner or later find enactment. Lecky had once attacked him for taking might as the symbol of right. I shall have to tell Lecky one day, as Carlyle's rejoinder, that quite the converse, or reverse, is the great and venerable author's real opinion, namely, that right is the eternal symbol of might, as I hope one day he will with amazement and real gratification discover, and that in fact he probably never met with a son of Adam more contemptuous of might except when it rests on the above origin. It is difficult indeed to reconcile contradictory indictments of Carlyle. This critic will have it, that his eternities and immensities are mere abstractions, and that in his outlook on actual life he is a raging pessimist, that one stigmatizes him as a worshipper of success. Of the two, the last is furthest from the mark. Thy success? Poor devil, what will thy success amount to? If the thing is unjust, thou hast not succeeded. We are now in a position better to understand Carlyle's political teaching. Like Plato, with whom he was in many points, though for long unconsciously at one, he believes in ideas, ideas which are the immutable objects of human thought and insight. Like Plato, he longs for the coming of the day when these ideas shall be enacted in human affairs. Like Plato, he bitterly realizes how hard it is to enact them in a world given over to flux, irrationality, falsehood, illusion, and self-seeking. And like Plato, not least like that great prophet of aristocracy in this, he is convinced that the kingdom of ideas can be realized not by the initiative of the hoi polloi, who spend their years in a vain show, but by the elect spirits, the Carlylean heroes, the Platonic philosopher kings, who are the ambassadors of the cosmos. Small wonder that Carlyle should have come to recognize his kinship with Plato when the parallel is so close. The two great implacable foes of democratic government part company only when the one, true to the Greek spirit, insists that the savior of society must stand equipped in all the panoply of dialectic and closely reasoned system and the other hovering on the verge of mysticism is content with the zigzag series of rafts, the flying pontoons of loosely knit thoughts which in him take the place of a philosophy. The divergence is not slight, but it is at most the divergence of thinkers 
who are at one in the belief that all that is best in human life comes of conscious dependence of the finite spirit upon eternal realities when finally we pass from politics to ethics for the two domains are inseparably interwoven it is to encounter the same ultimate convictions the worst calamity that can befall a man as carlyle thinks is not misery however acute nor hardship however grinding worst by far its obstruction not i cannot eat but i cannot work is the burden of all wise complaining among men this was the trial of teufelsdruck as we have it in sartor the world at every turn shuts its doors in his face and cast him forth a useless waif all through the bitter years when he was enacting the stern monodrama no object and no rest and struggling in vain to get his destiny as a man fulfilled this was the everlasting no it was an experience burnt into carlyle's mind by his own long uphill and at times all but desperate struggle we know from the life how the text that rang in his ears as in those of his great contemporary j s mill was the night cometh nulla dies sine linea so he wrote often enough in his diary nor is his reiterated message know thy work and do it to be read as it sometimes is as the resource the refuge of a strong spirit to whom speculative doubts have left the universe an enigma for the work of which carlyle is the prophet is always urged from sartor resartus onwards as the sure path by which the worker brings himself consciously or unconsciously into harmony with the supreme laws of life and in due season if the work be honest to a belief such as speculative arguments alone can never give in a divine law of duty that is over all doubt is not removed but by action there is no refrain more constant than this in carlyle's writings from first to last hence the carlylean scorn of idleness the idler we read must either be beggar or thief but worse even than this is the fact that he is outlaw and outcast looking up looking down around behind or before discernest thou if it be not in mayfair alone any idle hero saint god or even devil not a vestige of one in the heavens in the earth in the waters under the earth there is none like unto thee if this be the worst we can already guess if only by contrast what is the best or in other words what is that supreme good for man which since the days of socrates has been called by many a varied name carlyle's name for it in sartor is blessedness but the word itself will help us little it is so apt to be construed as nothing more than a superior kind of happiness and this of course is precisely what it is not upon this point carlyle has left us in no uncertainty when first he came upon the scene as man of letters the ethical school he found in possession of the field was benthamism with its thrice familiar watchword of greatest happiness or more strictly construed greatest pleasure one cannot say that carlyle argues with these utilitarian hedonists there is satire invective derision parody everything almost except argument he is like dr johnson when his pistol misses fire he knocks down the enemy with the butt end and it may well have been among the peculiar trials of philosophers so earnest as the two mills or george grote that the adversary will so often not so much as take them seriously yet it is here as usual behind the rhetoric there are reasons for these diatribes are more than scoffs invectives parodies they come of the settled conviction that hedonism is doomed to failure because it gives a fatally false centre to life it centres all in pleasure the pleasure may be that of the individual as ultimately it was with bentham or it may be the pleasure of the whole sentient creation as it is in the doctrine of the younger mill but in either case though it is not to be forgotten that it is egoistic hedonism that carlyle denounces the centre round which all else revolves is pleasure or escape from pain it is not thus that carlyle regarded human life the world god's seed-field and task-garden 
is on his view of it nothing if not a scene overshadowed interpenetrated by law inflexible righteous eternal not to be questioned by the sons of men as in the physical world it is law that governs alike the orbit of the planet and the evaporation of the dewdrop so in the world of action it is law that lays its equally inexorable commands upon the human will this is the centre of gravity of the moral universe and this being so it is the main concern of a man to see to it that his life is in actual willing harmony with this central fact it is on record that scotch voltaire lord jeffrey o oh wise judge once tried to persuade carlyle that it was not a man's duty to concern himself with his relations to the universe as well might a polished sadducee have set himself to dissuade the baptist from preaching repentance to find his true relations to the universe is to carlyle the whole duty of man it is an attitude which will bring its own consolations for we must not number carlyle among the stoics who invested duty with a grimness which would freeze emotion at its source himself emotional in almost every line he penned he has told us in the everlasting yea of the peace and of the infinite pitying love for man that came at last into the storm-tossed soul of teufelsdruck yet it is not this emotional experience even though it be sweeter than day spring to the shipwrecked that is the prime object of endeavour it is the actual rightness of relation between the individual will and the moral law whatever more than this may belong to blessedness this is its essence no other conclusion was consistently possible for carlyle if to his eye mutability was written abroad upon the face of the world even upon many things which men and nations live and die for how much more upon the fragile tenements of all human pleasure behold the day is passing swiftly over our life is passing swiftly over and the night cometh wherein no man can work the night once come our happiness our unhappiness it is all abolished vanished clean gone a thing that has been but our work behold that is not abolished that has not vanished our work behold it remains or the want of it remains for endless times and eternities remains and that is now the sole question for us for evermore brief brawling day with its noisy phantasms its poor paper crowns tinsel gilt is gone and divine everlasting night with her star diadems with her silences and her veracities is come what hast thou done and how no ethical writer of any age has felt this more profoundly than carlyle it was the verdict of his own struggling aspiring for ever unsatisfied life it was the conviction he brought back from his contact with the world and from an encyclopedic knowledge of history and biography love not pleasure love god this the conclusion of sartre is the note of all he wrote upon ethical subjects it was a faith up to which he himself strove to live and not in vain many a critic has since he died been busy with his reputation but to all that has been said there is one answer it is not the only answer but it is the one that cannot be gainsaid his work remains the want of that does not remain it is not its magnitude alone though its magnitude is vast nor is it that in all he touched essay biography history prose poem reflective thought he reveals the master's hand it is still more the proof he has given from the days when as an annandale lad he trudged along the moorland roads to the university of edinburgh till in extreme old age the pitcher was at last broken at the cistern that the life of letters can be made the path of courage devotion faithfulness and victory End of section 17section 18 of six radical thinkers by john mccun this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 5 the religious radicalism of mazzini part 1 
it was the central aim of mazzini's life to make democracy alike in thought and in action religious in the italian revolution of eighteen forty eight it was his privilege none dearer to his heart to have entrusted to him the flag of the volunteers on which was inscribed god and the people it was the flag he was carrying all his life in that inscription is to be found the text of every word he wrote and of all the democratic watchwords rights of man greatest happiness no monopoly tools to the man who can use them none could satisfy him nothing could satisfy him but the old cry of the crusader god wills it god wills it for from early years he was painfully struck by the fact that democracy and religion seemed to have sundered if anything ever profoundly surprised me he says of democracy it is that so many persons have hitherto been blind to the profoundly religious character of that movement nor did the fault lie solely with democracy it lay also so he thought at the door of christianity which by its unpractical otherworldliness its undue preoccupation with private piety and above all its detachment from the political duties went far to forfeit his allegiance he had justification here it cannot be affirmed that the great democratic changes of the nineteenth century were broadly speaking carried through in the name of religion not certainly in england hardly in a single case except in the emancipation of the slave and to a lesser degree in factory legislation can it be said that it was in the name of religion that reform was pressed forward it was no sympathy with roman catholicism that passed catholic emancipation it was the idea of political equality it was no sense of the value of nonconformist religion that got rid of tests it was the claim for political justice still less was it so with free trade or questions of imperial or municipal franchise probably the individual citizen may have been upheld in these and many other struggles by spiritual motives there may have been much religion in his life even in his politics though there was not much on his lips in this way the private religious inspirations of personal lives may be a force even in the most secular movements this however is matter of conjecture and against it must be set certain tendencies which already in mazzini's day and in increasing measure since have made steadily for the secularization of politics one is the tendency in some quarters to reduce politics to an exciting game an eternal cricket match between blue and yellow to use maine's belittling metaphor another is the disposition to view public life as nothing more than public business a mere matter-of-fact affair in which the invocation of spiritual motives would be as absurd as liturgies in a counting-house or a government office a third is the trend of democracy to engross itself in the more materialistic problems not unnaturally but it lies on the face of history that this country and other countries have as the nineteenth century ran its course become industrialized and commercialized to the core an extraordinary conspiracy of causes which it is needless to recite has cooperated to this result never since the world began has there been such an increase of wealth and never has the need for material resources made itself more prominent even in the more spiritual causes be it in churches or in universities in schools or institutions for grappling with disease or in the manifold projects of social philanthropy to this we need not return it was as we have seen the movement of which cobden was the prophet nor need it be deplored it is never the end of a nation to diminish its riches its problem is to spiritualize increase of riches but the movement has its dangers it materializes it secularizes it absorbs a people more and more in economic ends which lie at furthest remove from moral and religious motives 
it is the inevitable risk which every nation runs by becoming rich only a spiritual people can spiritualize great riches especially when great riches go with great want of riches nor is it rash to say that the magnitude of the conflict the conflict about property which seems opening out before democracy in the present age is likely to put the spiritual forces of society to the proof it was precisely this that wrought upon mazzini's fears his hatred of the materialistic program of the manchester school is so intense that one might suppose it would have precipitated him into socialism and so it might for he has much in common with the socialists had it not been that he dreaded that the socialists by drawing all political effort into an absorbing struggle between poverty and riches would materialize and secularize the democracy in their very effort to save it as with the movements so with the thinkers the thinkers of democracy had had much to say about political justice and natural rights about greatest happiness and utility not much about religion neither bentham nor james mill nor john stuart mill were in any ordinary sense religious thinkers to judge from their own words they would probably have resented the imputation and though cobden like bright now and again lifts up current politics into the lofty region of theistic appeal did he not call free trade the international law of the almighty cobden as his biographer tells us was not of those who live much in the unseen the secularity of all of them is unmistakable as we think of the cheerful religious indifference of bentham the sensationalistic reaction against orthodoxy of james mill the attenuated theism of his son the mundane practicality of cobden it is not too much to say that even had they wished to give democracy a religious creed which they did not all these men in holy alliance had not so much as the makings of such a creed amongst them similarly with nineteenth-century socialism the christian socialists it is true with morris and kingsley at their head made a gallant attempt to capture socialism for christianity and their effort may always serve as a perhaps needful reminder that there is no essential bond between socialism and secularism yet it will hardly be disputed that the real thing the formidable socialism of marx and lasalle and their following has gone upon its own way marching on usually toward secularism and sometimes to judge by their own avowals toward a pronounced atheism all this is what mazzini was determined to change once and forever the religious question he wrote late in life pursues me like a remorse it is the only one of any real importance all his hopes for democracy were staked upon its rescue from materialism and secularism we have his own words here on the day when democracy shall elevate itself to the position of a religious party it will carry away the victory not before this was the task to which he dedicated his life and he held to it with the same unfaltering faith and the same unwavering pertinacity with which he wrought for italian freedom he long meditated a book upon religion it was to be his magnum opus and he often chafed as the years went on that it was still left undone but he might well have spared himself his self-reproaches for all his life through he was writing on religion religion and politics were in his mind inseparable to write on one was to write on the other hence the glowing fervour of his phrase hence the sustained elevation of his appeal coupling as it does even the homeliest duties with the loftiest motives it is not politics as politics are usually written it is a kind of oratorio in politics nor had he the slightest doubt as to what above all other things was needed it was a creed a creed to be held not only by such as might in reflective hours wish to justify their motives to themselves but to be as the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day to radical reformers 
in the actual campaigns of politics. In this sense, Mazzini believed in the need for dogma, not Catholic dogma, nor yet Protestant, for of both he was severely critical. Yet dogma in the sense of a settled body of convictions as to the relation of men and nations to God, to which the spirit of leaders and followers alike might ever return for unfailing inspiration and refreshment. Of the possibility of such a creed he was supremely confident. He was prepared to formulate it himself. He even seemingly looked forward to the coming of a day when a new spiritual power would from a regenerated Rome formulate the new faith for Italy and the world. It is not within our scope to examine Mazzini's religious creed and to test the grounds on which he held it. Philosophers and theologians will probably agree that he underrated the difficulties of construction. He was too rationalistic to lean on authority. He was not rationalistic enough to trust to reason when it took the form of metaphysical analysis, of which he had an impatience bordering on hatred. We will sweep out all that stuff, was his significant remark about Hegelianism. He was a man of intuitions, not of analysis. It was convictions he cared for, not inferences and ratiocinations. He was more akin here to Carlyle than to the philosophers. Be this, however, as it may, the point that concerns us here is that he was absolutely convinced that without a religious faith, democracy was foredoomed to failure, and the question of interest is, why? The answer lies in two convictions, upon both of which Mazzini is explicit to emphasis, the one that nothing less than an unfaltering sense of duty can nerve and sustain the democratic citizen, the other that this consciousness of duty must stand or fall with a theistic faith. We must glance at these in turn. There is a popular belief that democracy has much to give, and Mazzini shared it to the full. He was optimist enough to think that democracy carried in it the promise of honest livelihood and carefree home, of sound education, and an unobstructed civic life, rich in many and varied forms of free association. But he also believed, if he believed anything, that it had in its hand a greater gift than these, the gift of the obligation to live, and if need be readily to die, for one's country. Truly, he was no preacher or promiser of smooth things to his generation. It startles us to read of the burdens which in his own political career he laid on the consciences of citizens. It was neither by mother's tears nor friend's remonstrances that he could be for a moment stayed in sending young and ardent spirits upon missions which he knew meant death. It was not callousness, for he had one of the tenderest of hearts, nor was it recklessness which was far from his conspiring and far-seeing mind. It was the settled conviction that failure and death, intrepidly encountered, are the really sanest, and in the long run the most fruitful tribute to political duty. Merciful, says Carlyle of him in a startling conjunction of epithets, merciful and fierce. For his own part he habitually took his liberty and life in his hands, and there was a memorable moment in his career when in 49 the short-lived Roman Republic lay at the mercy of French bayonets, and when, as one of the triumvirs, he urged the Romans to prove to the world that republics founded upon faith and duty neither yield nor capitulate, but die protesting. This deification of duty has an obverse, a complete distrust of the democracy of rights. Mazzini's fear for democracy was not the ordinary fear. The ordinary fear is that it will go too far. Mazzini's is that it will not go far enough, because it may rest fatally contented with the enjoyment of its rights. This is the warning that runs through the hortatory and passionate pages of the duties of man. It was not that he undervalued civil and political rights. He knew well that these were fundamental conditions of all else. He was the last man to disparage the struggle for rights. But the pity of it was, and the danger, 
that the citizen, having got his rights, should fancy that this was all, and blindly think that rights were the end instead of, as in truth they are, only the beginnings of a true citizenship. What is the right of free utterance, if a man have no word of sincerity or sense to utter? Or the right to worship God to him who shows no desire, either in churches or out of them, to worship anything? Or the right of property to the hewer of wood and drawer of water who can barely earn a subsistence? Or the right to vote to the citizen who is so corrupt that he sells it, or so indifferent that he uses it either not at all or with a deplorable levity. This is the line of thought that saturates Mazzini. He may not have done full justice to rights. He surely did not when he said that men will not die for rights. It is not the less true that he knew how to value rights more than many from whose lips the word was never absent. For he saw, as only too many cannot see, that the winning of rights is but one of those half-victories which is a whole defeat, if the lesson be not learnt, that when a people has won its rights, it is then only for the first time in a position to begin effectively to do its duties. For there are two ways of teaching mankind to value their rights. The one is to speak to them of their wrongs, and wake up within them that fury against injustice which is one of the most indestructible passions of the human heart. Nor is this a way unknown to Mazzini. If the Italy we know is another Italy than that of his youth, it is in part at least because Mazzini did not know how to spare a despot, whether in church or in state. Merciful and fierce. Yet it was not in this method that he reposed his trust but in the more excellent way of lodging in the heart and imagination of the citizen an ideal of what he had it in him to achieve, if only his just rights were given him. It is not rights, it is duties that is the really fundamental and quickening conception. As with rights, so with interests. It has been said that Mazzini failed to do justice to utilitarianism, and the fact need not be denied. His biographer tells us that there is no sign of his having read Mill. If he had, he would doubtless have done more justice to the utilitarian ideal which in so many points is like his own. Even in his handling of Bentham, against whom his attack is leveled, he never seems to realize the width of the gulf that parts the Benthamite with his splendid devotion to the public good from the fanatics of natural rights. Yet even his failures here serve all the better to illustrate the point. It was because he was so wholly out of sympathy with utilitarianism that he could not do justice to it, and the reason of his lack of sympathy was the conviction that the utilitarian appeal, resting as it does on hedonism, was inadequate to the sacrifices democracy demands. It was equally impotent, he thought, to evoke the spirit of sacrifice and to justify it. It is in vain, so runs his characteristic sum of the whole matter, to adjure mankind in the name of pleasure to die. It is not to be denied that this criticism at any rate assails utilitarianism on a weak point. When Bentham said that the word ought ought to be expunged from the vocabulary of morals, he was certainly giving a hostage to his enemies. He was confirming their suspicion that the Benthamite appeals to greatest happiness were, after all, conditional. For were they not conditional upon the contingency that by grace of nature or by operation of the external sanctions, self-interest may come to take the form of benevolence? Even Mill, decisive though his divergence from Bentham is, leaves the call to self-sacrifice appropriate only to the select minority, in whom social feeling has found favoring soil and needful nurture. There is, in strict logic, no room even in his gospel for those unconditional, those categorical appeals, which, however hard to justify in theory, are the claimant practical necessities of reformers. It is, at any rate, in these appeals that Mazzini reposes all his trust. 
he has a horror of the utilitarian spirit of calculation and compromise. He thinks it would sap all unselfish and heroic effort. He has scant respect for the hypothetical heroism which will undertake difficult duties only under the guidance of political arithmetic. The one sufficient security lies for him in the clear line of duty, absolutely without compromise, paltering, or shadow of turning. He would have ought and can, as inseparably knit in the reformer's creed as in the ethics of Kant. This is high and heroic doctrine. And we must now go on to add that in Mazzini's eyes it is likewise impossible doctrine if it does not rest upon a convinced theism. For Mazzini is not to be numbered among those to whom religious beliefs are more or less probable hypotheses or even needful moral postulates. His belief in God is not, as with Kant, a superstructure built on his belief in duty. On the contrary, his gospel of duty depends upon his faith in God. Hence his lifelong aspiration and effort to make democracy theistic. For a godless democracy was in his eyes a democracy with the sinews of all dutiful and sacrificing effort cut. End of section 18. Section 19 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 The Religious Radicalism of Mazzini, Part 2. This is, of course, a strong asseveration. It is not likely to pass unchallenged, and it will certainly be challenged by some in these latter days more than it was in Mazzini's lifetime though even then he was to most but as a voice crying in the wilderness. For it cannot be said that since Mazzini's day democracy has moved toward theism. The drift has been toward Darwinism in politics. Hence the growth of the conception that society must now be relegated to its place in the order of nature as a slowly evolved organism within which the struggle for existence between individuals and groups is checked and softened only by the exigencies of the larger struggle for existence between nation and nation. No one is likely nowadays to deny that the conception has its measure of truth and its fascinations, nor is it in the least to be wondered at that there are minds to whom it seems so satisfying that in view of the experimented effectiveness of biological forces, as judged by their existing social products, they are content to banish divine plan in history and final causes in social evolution to that crowded limbo of discarded metaphysical figments to which naturalism and agnosticism are so willing, not to say eager, to consign anything that savors of theism. Nor is this attitude the monopoly of the thinkers. The popular mind, so often prone to be newfangled over new categories, has fallen in love with the categories of biology. It sees struggle for existence and survival of the fittest in the competitions, rivalries, and conflicts of individuals, of trades, of parties, of nations, of ideals. It echoes the voices that declare society to be an organism, and it listens to the tales that tell it how this organism has been evolved by the sheer visa tergo of natural forces. So the leaven works. Will of God and plan of providence give ground before the forces and the methods of evolution. The origin of society becomes more and more. Its destiny, if it have a destiny, less and less. Human history becomes but a chapter in an infinitely larger work, and the heaven of bygone religions is construed as but the subjective vision of fulfilled desire. Nor is it to be in the least degree wondered at, if to a generation now for some time nurtured on a diet of such ideas, the passionate theism of Mazzini should seem strained, dogmatic, superstitious, 
antiquated, and superfluous, and not the less so when thrust by the rhetoric of a hundred pages into the secular domain of politics. It therefore becomes of peculiar interest to inquire why Mazzini insisted that democracy, in theory as well as practice, must grapple itself to theism. The answer to this question is twofold. For whilst on the one hand Mazzini's theism compels him to regard democracy as part of the divine plan, on the other, his faith in democratic ideals compels him to find their justification in his theism. We may look at these two points in turn. If we are to understand the first of these, the initial step is to realize what Mazzini meant by democracy. He certainly meant more than the word is usually supposed to mean. As a matter of fact, it means different things to different minds. To some it suggests popular rights, to others social or political equality. To not a few, and among them to thinkers of repute like John Austin and Sir Henry Maine, it means no more than a form of government. There is much familiarity with the thing, there is little agreement upon the definition. Now it is not to Mazzini we must go in search of scientific definitions, and indeed it is the distinctive characteristic of his conception of democracy that it is impossible to compress it into a compact formula. But this at least is evident. It is to him more than a form of government. It is a far larger and a more inspiring fact. This is not because he undervalues democratic government. He is, of course, convinced that wherever there is genuine democracy, there will also in due season be democratic government. But the two things are not identical. Democratic government is not the whole of democracy. It is but one, and among the later of its fruits. For when democracy at last makes its way into the political constitution, it is only because it has, it may be for long, existed elsewhere. For it does not reside only in polling booths, committee rooms, and parliaments. It has its birth and growth in the awakening spirit of personal independence, in the increasing sense of human worth, in the enhanced respect of man for man, in the passion for equality, in the deepening recognition of the ties that bind the members of the commonwealth each to each. It is these things that are uppermost in Mazzini's thought when he speaks of democracy. Nor do his words leave us in any doubt upon the matter. When all men shall commune together in reverence for the family and respect for property, through education and the exercise of a political function in the state, the family and property, the fatherland and humanity, will become more holy than they are now. When the arms of Christ, even yet stretched out on the cross, shall be loosened to clasp the whole human race in one embrace, when there shall be no more pariahs nor Brahmins, nor servants nor masters, but only men, we shall adore the great name of God with much more faith and love than we do now. Such is Mazzini's definition of democracy in its essentials. The inference is obvious. For if democracy be anything like this, if it is, in its essentials, a vast spiritual and social movement to which words like these are in any reasonable sense applicable, it is no longer possible because it would forthwith become a kind of atheism, to rule it out of the divine plan and relegate it to the rank of a secular product. To the convinced theist, and especially to the theist with strongly pantheistic leanings, it must needs become what Mazzini said it was, a page of the world's history written by the finger of God. The language, to be sure, is something more than English politicians are accustomed to from their literary leaders. But just on that account they express, in the glow of their religious passion, the central convictions of Mazzini about democracy. It is thus his theism claims democracy for its own. We reach a similar result when we approach the matter from the other side. 
for it quickly becomes evident that Mazzini's faith in democratic ideals lands him in theism no less irresistibly than his theism leads to his consecration of democracy. This is not perhaps at first sight evident, for in his account of the way in which the ideals of reformers find their substance and content, he is by no means far removed from other thinkers who are not specially theistic. Like them, he turns to history, and he finds there certain institutions, the family, for example, or property, which bear the stamp of permanence. It is a strong presumption in their favor. He is well aware that it is not the business of the reformer to invent all the elements of civilization de novo, nor is he ever lacking in reverent respect for the tradition of the centuries. Yet the verdict of history alone is never final, for he is not at all minded to accept the history of the world as the judgment of the world after the fashion of some philosophers. He had too much radicalism and too deep-seated a respect for the individual conscience. Therefore, it is only where the verdict of history is at one with the deliverances of the reformer's own conscience that he finds the criterion by which all institutions and all reforms of institutions must stand to be judged before they can be built into the reformer's ideal. This is his explicit declaration. But then there is a further requirement. The ideal must constrain belief. It is this that matters most of all. For nothing is easier than to have ideals with but little accompanying belief. As a matter of fact, mankind, and especially political mankind, hold their ideals with all degrees of belief, from the shadowy make-believe of the dreamer, right up to the absolute faith of the prophet and the reformer. But it is only this last that can satisfy Mazzini. He was not a theorist writing for theorists. Far less was he a dreamer writing for dreamers. He was a reformer writing for reformers upon matters of life and death. And as such he saw with utmost clearness that every ideal that is to move the world must be held with that complete conviction in which lies the open secret of the constraining influence of ideals over the human heart, will, and conscience. It is never enough that the reformer should simply have an ideal, however well thought out. The authority of even the most imposing ideal would collapse from the moment in which wholehearted belief began to be sapped by half-hearted doubt. For the mere content of an ideal is one thing. The faith with which it is held as summary or symbol of the things that are worth living for or dying for is another. And it is because he realized the depths of this distinction that so many of Mazzini's pages are filled, sometimes with sorrowful references to comrades who had miserably fallen away from their early ideals, but oftener with impassioned adjurations to stand fast in the political faith. Never had man learnt more completely that lesson which de Tocqueville saw written in Democracy, the lesson that if men are to be free, they must believe. But if this be so, a question at once emerges. How is this belief to be made secure? How is the reformer in dark days no less than bright to assure himself beyond misgiving that he is pursuing substance and not shadow, realities and not illusions, in a word, ends that outliving all failure will be certain of achievement at last. To this question there are manifestly many possible answers. Some reformers will simply trust their empirical forecasts, some their intuitions, some the verdict of history, while others again will be content to fall back upon the authority of their party or their leader. But none of these resources, nor all of them united, could satisfy the craving of Mazzini for certitude. Nothing could satisfy him, short of the belief that God exists, and that the will of God will be done on earth. He says this again and again. Personally, he was convinced, for he has told us so in moving words, that it was this religious faith that alone enabled him to hold fast to his own ideals, through the years of imprisonment, 
exile, slander, destitution, disillusionment, which diversified his life of rare joys and many sorrows. He claimed no monopoly of such experiences. In his stern scheme of life they were the inevitable lot of many a reformer. And in that conviction he pled with an unwearied iteration that if democracy is to believe in its ideals it must be theistic. His pleadings are not proofs, they are impassioned declarations of articles of faith. When he appeals to the intuitions of conscience, as he does, it is because he sees in conscience a faculty capable of discerning real and permanent values, values discernible by man only because they already exist in and to the mind of God. When he appeals to the tradition of the centuries, as he does, it is only because he believes the whole course of history to be the unfolding of a divine plan. It is not philosophy, it is faith, it is dogmatism. But it is a faith and a dogmatism into which he would have every reformer to enter if he used to hold fast to that inexpugnable belief without which ideals, no matter how magnificent their content, will neither nerve the will to daring nor sustain it in the presence of difficulty and disaster. No reader of his works would dream of calling him an orthodox believer, but his divergence from orthodox believers lies not in that he is less a believer than they, but rather that he carries his religion into his politics, and his politics into religion, with a passion of conviction such as the orthodox believer might well envy and imitate. When a thinker is thus possessed by the religious spirit, we may be sure that it follows him into details, for religion like this is not merely one element among other elements in life, it is not content with a departmental influence. It works as the leaven which penetrates and pervades the whole. It is so at any rate, in this instance, as we find when we turn from fundamentals to his treatment and estimate of the life of the individual man. It is the irony of our modern life that just when the individual man has by the gospel of democracy been aroused to the consciousness of his worth dignity and claims, there is borne in upon him by the teachings of science the message of his extreme finite insignificance. Be free, independent, self-assertive, and see that you be not defrauded of your rights and hopes, so run the oracles of a democracy. Yes, rejoins the voice of science, drawing its oracles from the wide evolutionary outlook on nature and history, but do not forget that in the presence of the vastness of cosmic processes you are a quite insignificant unit, an ephemeron, a fly of a summer, or in less metaphysical phrase, a perishable individual with no discoverable core of personality in you and but one among many transitory specimens of a species which itself is transitory. One need not further labor the point which indeed has become something of a commonplace. There can be no doubt that Mazzini, though he had but slender dealings with science, felt the acuteness of this antithesis. We see this in the words he puts into the lips of the individual man as there rises before his mind the overwhelming vastness of humanity. It is not the atomists, every man for himself, nor the equalitarians, I am as good as you, upstart formulas both, but the words with which the fisherman of Brittany puts out to sea, help me, my God, my boat is so small, and the ocean is so wide. In face of this problem, a problem, be it said, that presses with a painful acuteness on all secularism, which claims to be both democratic and scientific, Mazzini has two resources. One lies in the relation of the individual soul, however insignificant it may seem to God. This was the side of Protestantism he welcomed. To him, as to the men of the English Commonwealth, and also to Carlyle, the direct communion between the human spirit and the divine was the source of that individual strength, that defiant independence, that comes of conscious dependence upon the source of all life. There was no shadow of hesitancy in his teaching here. 
It was central to his creed that through consciousness of participation in the very life of God, the individual could not only lift himself out of the nothingness that threatens to engulf him, but if need be, withstand principalities and powers to the face. The second resource lay in the principle of association, which he made it the business of his life to preach to his generation. An atomistic individualism was his abhorrence. It was the sure path to isolated impotence. For if God had made men equals, as he said a hundred times, the equality he had in mind was such as pointed the way to that association and mutual helpfulness which is only possible because the equal units are so diverse. Whence indeed it comes that in social life men can gain so much more than they give, flinging into the common stock their own small modicum of faculty, and drawing forth through the organized power of association the force and achievement of many who may have where they themselves are lacking. The perception of this made Mazzini naturally the apostle of association in many modes, but there were two of these for which he more especially stood sponsor, the family and the nation. End of section 19. Section 20 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. The Religious Radicalism of Mazzini. Part 3. Whenever Mazzini approaches the family, his radicalism passes into a profound and reverent conservatism. He regards it as immortal. He says it is more imperishable even than the nation. And of all the maladies that could befall society, the deadliest would be the decay of the home. It is not too much to say that for him, unlike some of the later friends of democracy, the decline of the family would be the path to decadence. This was, of course, in part at any rate, because the family was so substantially justified of history. But it was also because he felt with a pathetic personal conviction that in missing this, the individual life, be its other resources what they may, runs the risk of an irretrievable impoverishment. He who from some fatality of position has been unable to live the calm life of the family has a shadow of sadness cast over his soul and a void in his heart which naught can fill, as I who write these pages for you know. No political thinker has written of the family with a more discerning sympathy than this exile from home as well as country. Even this, however, was far from the central consideration, for this lies in the larger, more civic conviction that the family carries in it the germ and first principle of the public affections. For it was not the family's sentiment that was uppermost in his thought, he never hesitated to teach that fathers must part with sons, and sons with fathers, be the rent ties of human affection what they may, at the call of the state. He always thought politically, so that the home was to him no mere refuge from public cares and disgusts, but, to use his own characteristic words, the place where between the mother's kiss and the father's caress the child learns the first lesson of citizenship. Hence, as we might expect, it is the civic responsibility of the parent that is the dominant note. In the name of all that is most sacred, so runs the adjuration, never forget that through your children you have in charge the future generations, that toward them as souls confided to your care, toward humanity and before God, you are under the heaviest responsibility known to mankind. The doctrine, to be sure, is not new. The same thing was said by Burke when he declared that no cold relation was a zealous citizen and branded Rousseau as a lover of his kind but a hater of his kindred. It is thus with both writers that the family points onward to the nation. Very significant in Mazzini's view of the nation 
is his attitude towards two groups of social reformers. The first are the earlier socialists of France, who seemed to him to sit all too loose to the national life. Intent on their industrial problem, it was their plan, as it has been the plan of most of the many communistic experiments of the United States, to detach themselves, as far as possible, from the larger national interests, to erect their own industrial experiments, and to leave the great tides of political life to sweep past their doors unheeded. To such as these, Mazzini's antipathy was implacable. Eager to foster all reasonable forms of association, and not least industrial undertakings, it was his conviction that all such combinations are pernicious while they last, and foredoomed to ultimate failure if, in a spirit of sectional selfishness, they ask their members to abjure upon the threshold the larger interests of citizenship. This runs throughout. Though he was an apostle of cooperation, though no nation could approximate to his ideal which was not rich in many modes of association, his aversion was intense toward all attempts to purchase a limited success for any form of association at the price of an enfeebled patriotism. He was interested in the economic problems that vex modern democracy, but his interest was always more than economic. It was civic and patriotic. Similarly with his attitude to the socialists who followed Marx, and who were so possessed by the industrial problem that they were ready to subordinate national patriotism to one great international combination of labor against capitalism. Mazzini was not without his sympathies here. He joined the international, and characteristically did his best to enlist its members in the political movement. But when he found that they were lukewarm to national causes, he grew lukewarm to them, and eventually severed his connection. It is characteristic that he seems to have been more sympathetic with the Chartists than with the Socialists. It was not from any coldness to the cause of labor. There was almost nothing which he was not willing and eager to do for the working men of Italy, and it is a touching fact that in all the misery and poverty of exile, a poverty which drove him to the last straits, he gave the evenings of his laborious days, in times long before the evening school was so much in fashion as it is now, to the teaching and befriending of the Italian waifs and strays who eked out a wretched living on the streets of London. But the thing he could not do was even to seem to justify the policy which, in asserting the claims of labor, however just and however urgent, ignored or even subordinated the prior claims of country. Love your country, he cries with his wonted impassioned utterance, it is your name, your glory, your sign among the nations. Give to it your thoughts, your counsels, your blood. Raise it up, great and beautiful, as it was foretold by our great men. And see that you leave it uncontaminated by any trace of falsehood or of servitude, unprofaned by dismemberment. Let it be one as the thought of God. It was so that in the way men call the nation, he worshipped the God of his fathers. Nor is it simply this apotheosis of the nation that impresses us, not even when we read it in the light of his lifelong struggle, sometimes in the garret of the conspirator, sometimes on the stricken field for the unity of Italy. It was also the depth and fervor of the conviction that the man who for any reason whatever severs himself from the national traditions the national struggles, hopes, and triumphs, even from the national humiliations, thereby cuts out of his life the interests which make life most worth living, and with the recklessness of a barbarian rejects the instrument that God has put into the hands of the citizen in order that he may lift himself out of the petty round of private cares, trivialities, and even vices, into the larger air of the life of the nation. 
for in one respect mazzini saw eye to eye with the political thinkers of ancient greece to him as to them the bane and blight of national life was faction division the sacrifice of unity to sectional interests he had bitter experiences of this in his own struggles for italian unity nor was he himself guiltless in the later years of his life of fostering by his fanatical passion for an impracticable republic the very malady he strove to remedy but it can always be pled for him with truth that even his worst failings sprang from his passion for the nation in hating cavour and counterworking the italian monarchy he was but giving effect to his settled opinion that it was only as a republic that the italian nation could stand strong in organic unity and yet if mazzini thus glorified the nation more than any other writer of modern times it was not because he stopped short at the nation as a final end or highest unity quite the contrary that development of the spirit of nationality which is content to rest in the view of the international system as essentially a struggle for survival amongst rival nations is far from him he has been called a fanatic for nationality yet he was an international man if ever there was one only his internationalism was neither as in cobden the internationalism of trade nor as in marx the internationalism of labour it was the internationalism in the eyes of which a nation is guilty of the grand refusal if it do not stand forward and take its place to the limits of its power in international politics in this and nothing short of this lies for him the final justification of national existence for it is not race or geographical boundaries nor is it even traditions language literature nor yet intranational ideas that really make a nation it is mission little i care for rome he once said if a great european initiative is not to issue from it and his reason follows we cannot live without a european life hence his hatred of cobdenism hence his vituperative vocabulary for non-intervention cowardly desertion of duty negation of all belief political atheism the word of cain hence his exhortations to the united states in eighteen fifty four to play its part in world politics hence his own passionate sympathies with poland and the balkan states sympathies which he was always ready nay greedy to translate into action in this sense it was europe not italy alone that was his country it is not only cobdenites who will refuse to follow him here all radicals who are prone to see in an active foreign policy paralysis of social reform and increased burdens on the poor will look with suspicion on the doctrine nor is it to be denied that as coming from a man who united to a deep distrust of diplomacy the conviction that the existing boundaries of european states needed drastic rectification mazzini's doctrine of national mission is heavily freighted with war he was never averse in his own career to rush to the arbitrament of arms he was prepared to pay the price if only war meant mission but even those who may doubt the wisdom of this preaching of a latter-day crusade must in ordinary fairness do justice to the grounds upon which it rested partly it was the perception that a great nation cannot even if it would at any rate in europe sit loose to international relations partly the equalitarian conviction that the citizen who believes all men to have worth in the eye of god cannot abruptly arrest his practical sympathies at the national frontier say not the language we speak is different acts tears and martyrdom are a language common to all men and which all can understand but chiefly it was the faith integral to his religion and political creed that the organized nation 
and never so much as when it is a democracy, becomes the most effective of all instruments for working out the providential plan among the nations of the world. Most people think of Mazzini as the apostle of Italian unity, but on his own avowal, he could never have spent his years for Italy had he not believed in the day when free and unified Italy would stand preeminent among the nations as, when need arose, the armed champion of struggling or trampled freedom in all lands. It was not the spirit of the filibuster, nor was it any mere passion for national glory and aggrandizement that drove him on. It was the peculiar cast of his political religion, which unhesitatingly laid upon the nation in its service of humanity the same spirit of political duty which from first to last he enjoined upon the individual citizen. It will hardly be denied that this forcible doctrine raises one of the gravest practical problems with which modern democracy has to deal, and upon which the citizen is bound to come to some decision. The reality of international duties is no mere academic speculation. It is a recognized fact. That same consciousness of the worth and claims of the individual which within the nation has clothed the citizen in civil and political rights and freed the slave has gone far further afield it has sent forth the many missions of many churches it has founded aborigines protection societies and championed the cause of native races it has begotten the spirit that cannot sit still in presence of the spectacle of what it takes to be wrong injustice and atrocity done in other lands this being so, the question from which there is no escape is, how are these cosmopolitan duties to be carried from the region of conviction and sentiment into the world of actuality and fact? To which of the voices is the citizen of the coming years to listen? Is it to the voice of Cobden, unsparing in its denunciations of war and armaments, eloquent for the bloodless victories of commerce, strong in its confident plea for peaceful national example? Or is it to the voice of Mazzini, which in the name of the brotherhood of men and the providence of God, pled with passionate democratic conviction for the stern duty of armed intervention, for the undoing of despotism and the succor of struggling freedom in all lands? And yet this issue, grave as it is, is, after all, subordinate to the larger question, if it indeed be true, that democracy must be religious or fail. No one can venture to say that Mazzini has proved that it must. It is not for any man to say what forms democracy may assume and the vicissitudes through which it may have to pass. But one thing at least Mazzini has proved. In life and in writings, and in life perhaps more convincingly than in writings, he has shown that the democratic spirit can, by alliance with religion, achieve results which none of its friends can afford to hold light. One of these is the belief in the reality of distant and still unachieved ends, which is at once the strength and the solace of the reformer. Another is that personal faithfulness to political duties, which is only too apt to be frittered away through indifference when political power is broken up into minute fragments and portioned out to the multitude in wide democratic franchises. A third is the defiant individual spirit, drawn from conscious dependence upon a divine support, which nerves the citizen to resist the tyranny alike of despotism and of democracy. And still another, is the eye to see steadily behind all the more immediate ends of political struggle, with their preoccupying secularities, the lives and destinies of men who are worth working for, because even the least of them is regarded as having in him something of the Spirit of God. These are the things which Mazzini valued. For him, they were of the essence of democracy. His results, of course, rested upon large religious assumptions, and beyond a doubt there are radicals who would be equally willing to take the results and reject the religion on which they rest. 
it is for them to show how such a course is possible. If they can, it is safe to say that it will only be by traversing Mazzini's democratic gospel from end to end. End of section 20. Section 21 of Six Radical Thinkers by John McCunn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 The Political Idealism of Thomas Hill Green. Part 1. Bentham reviled Oxford. Neither he nor his disciples expected any good thing to come out of it, least of all anything radical. But time has its ironies. For Oxford, it was reserved to find, as some at any rate think, a more adequate philosophy than Bentham's, for that democratic citizenship of which Bentham was the prophet. Bentham's philosophy was a fighting philosophy. When it was given to the world, democracy was still an aspiration and a struggle. What democracy needed was a rallying cry rather than a reasoned justification. It found that in Bentham the paramountcy of public good, the iniquity of monopoly, the deposition of privileged incapacity, the exaction of responsibility to the last tittle from all persons in authority. These were things which struggling radicalism needed, and it was partly at any rate because it found them in Benthamism that it fought its battles so well. But time had passed. Democracy had won. The franchise had been twice extended in 1832 and 1867. It was shortly to be still further widened in 1884. New and virile classes and interests had been admitted to power. Municipal self-government had been inaugurated and had begun to run its long and fruitful course. Religious disabilities had been done away. The poor law had been reformed free trade had been carried. Social amelioration had begun in factory legislation. National education was at last coming to the front. In a word, democratic citizenship had become a fact. It had its instrument in popular government. It had its objective in a larger, a fuller, a more concrete ideal of the public good than was possible for the men of the first quarter of the nineteenth century. It was then, roughly speaking, in the 60s, he was born in 1836, that Green came upon the scene. It was when democratic citizenship had become actually and potentially a recognized fact of the first magnitude, when it had passed from struggle to success, from aspiration to fruition, that Green, then an Oxford tutor little known, if at all, beyond his university, began to propound his civic idealism thereby bringing to citizenship a new dignity and elevation, and it may be added, fresh grounds of confidence and hope. The political philosophy of Bentham at the beginning of the nineteenth century was still a prophecy. The civic idealism of Green toward the end of the century was the justification of a prophecy fulfilled. This was a service to his country which Green was peculiarly fitted to render political and proclivity even from his school days, the sense of public duty was in him. It grew with his growth. It became central in his character and thought. It fed upon what it found, upon his admirations of the statesmen like Vane and Cromwell in the past, like John Bright in the present, upon the heritage of the civic spirit of the ancient world as he found it in his study of Greek history, and in the perennial fountainheads of Plato and Aristotle, in whom so much of his work as an Oxford tutor lay. Not least upon the resolute discharge of civic duty in Oxford, both as the first college tutor who sat in the city council and otherwise. But above all it came, as befits a thinker, as the application of the philosophical idealism which he held with the restrained but intense passion of a religious faith. Not that one would suggest that this philosophical idealism came to him after the fashion in which a great religious conception sometimes seizes and holds the mind. 
he was far different from Mazzini. He was a man of analysis, not of intuitions. His philosophy came to him neither by flashes of insight nor by eclectic borrowing from other minds. He thought it out with a laborious tenacity and always, but especially as the years went on, he was cautious of putting his foot down. But when he put it down, he planted it firmly. He always created the impression, says his biographer, of one who had his feet upon the ground. Nor can there be any doubt that the right word for his philosophy is idealism. Green's idealism, however, is not what many persons suppose idealism to be, and what in minds with less respect for experience it sometimes becomes. Idealism is often supposed to be the type of thought that stands for the reality of an ideal world other than this actual world of human life and experience. It is supposed to see visions and dream dreams. It is believed to regard facts with an unbecoming disrespect, and even somehow to have convinced itself that matter does not exist. And indeed it sometimes itself, as in the idealism of Plato and Carlyle, assumes the inverted form that turns round upon the actual world only to belittle it for its despicable actualities. There is nothing of this in the idealism of Green. No man, says Nettleship, was ever less of a visionary. Has he not said it himself? Not the admission of an ideal world of guess and aspiration alongside of the empirical, but the recognition of the empirical itself as ideal. Such is his account of what idealism is. That only valid idealism, as he elsewhere says, which trusts not to a guess about what is beyond experience, but an analysis of what is within it. His own idealism illustrates this definition. It is not content with affirming the reality of those spiritual forces we call ideas, for visionaries have never failed in that. It insists also that ideas are the very stuff and substance of experience and that they are to be found, if ever, in the facts, be they the phenomena of nature or of human life. To Green as to Aristotle, it is the concrete actualities of experience that are real. But then to him, as to his great Greek forerunner, with whom he had so much in common, the concrete fact is real because it is spiritual. It was idealism of this kind that Green applied to politics. It harmonized with his strongly concrete human sympathies. It joined hands with his readiness to recognize the worth of actual men and actual institutions. It chimed in with his instinctive respect for the ordinary good neighbor and honest citizen. It emboldened him to believe in respectability. And it did all this as we shall see more fully in the sequel, because it led him to discern in his fellow citizens as in his country's institutions the vehicles of ideas, the organs of spiritual forces. This is what he believed he could prove, and it is in this belief that we have his distinctive characteristic. Many writers of the century, Carlyle, Emerson, Mazzini, Ruskin, Tennyson, had borne witness to the reality of spiritual forces. Many had paid their tribute to the significance of institutions and to the worth and dignity of the individual man. And some, of whom Mazzini was one, had done their best to draw these two things together and thereby to spiritualize the so-called secularities of politics. Green's peculiar merit was to furnish proof proof that all that makes for freedom and progress in the lives of citizens comes from the presence to them and in them of ideas. There is a striking passage in the end of his luminous lectures on the English Commonwealth upon Sir Harry Vane, whose lofty political mysticism had evidently a strong fascination for him. The enthusiasm of Vane, he here writes, died that it might rise again. It was sown in the weakness of feeling, 
that it might be raised in the intellectual comprehension which is power. The people of England, he said on the scaffold, have been long asleep. I doubt they will be hungry when they awake. They have slept, we may say, another two hundred years. If they should yet awake and be hungry, they will find their food in the ideas which with much blindness and weakness he vainly offered them, cleared and ripened by a philosophy of which he did not dream. The philosophy Green here referred to was undoubtedly that of Hegel. But the words are not truer of Hegel than of himself. The professed object of Hegel's philosophy, he once said, was to find formulae adequate to the action of reason as exhibited in nature and human life, in art and religion. Hegel's object was his object, to find reason in human society, to show that the life of citizenship was in its essence a reasonable life, reasonable in its respect for institutions and accomplished facts, reasonable also in its sanguine hopes, aspirations, and ideals. This was the central purpose and sober passion of his life. This being so, the problem that Green presents to the reader is manifest. The empirical fact that lay before him, as it lies before us, was democratic citizenship, and our prime concern is to see if we can follow him in the conviction that an examination of this fact really does justify the contention that civic duty, rightly regarded, is nothing less than a spiritual function, or, if we prefer so to phrase it, that the life of citizenship is a mode of divine service. Nor need one hesitate to repeat that though no man ever shrank more from high-sounding professions, or laid less claim for himself to loftier motives than actuated his neighbors, Green carried the spirit of religious devotion into his politics. It may safely be affirmed that a view like this is not common in democratic circles. It may seem to savor of extravagance thus to claim the secular for the spiritual. For the secularities of politics are manifest. They are only too much with us. Who is the politician who does not know the parties and programs, the caucuses, committee rooms, polling booths, the compromises, expediences, trickeries? And is it of this thing that one can venture to speak in terms of religion or of spiritual philosophy? Yet if we follow Green, we must. For though it may be admitted that Green, always prone to choose words well within the limits of his convictions, might not have expressed himself in such terms as have been used above, there can be no doubt that he stands or falls by the doctrine that the political life of men and nations is a spiritual revelation, and not less so, but more when it becomes democratic. Green's radicalism, for radicalism it is, contrasts in many points with that of the earlier radical thinkers, whether these be the utilitarians or the apostles of the rights of man, and in nothing more decisively than in his frank and full recognition of the force of circumstances. One of his earliest essays was upon the force of circumstances, and its whole purport is to show how even the genius or the hero, however masterful his inspirations, however strong his will, must sooner or later reckon with this force of circumstances. The strong man may by force of will transmute circumstances, but he must not, he cannot, ignore them. If he does, his will must dash itself in vain against inexorable limits. Green illustrates this in those notable lectures on the English Commonwealth. They began with a criticism of Carlyle on the ground that Carlyle does imperfect justice to the solidity of the forces with which Cromwell and the Puritans had to contend, and they go on to trace the cause of the brevity of the success of the political heroes of that great popular movement. One can see in every line that Green is profoundly in sympathy with the men. Their ideal of a religious citizenship was his own. He declares the Cromwellian protectorate to have been the great spring of subsequent political life in England. 
he asserts that the spirit of independency which inspired Vane has more than any other ennobled the plebeian elements of English life. To the sincerity, the patriotism, the nobility of aim, the religious inspiration, the iron will of these Puritans, he pays unstinted tribute. But he is no less firm in pointing out how even the strongest of them failed, because in their enthusiasms and ecstasies, their mysticisms and fanaticisms, they ignored or underestimated the conditions under which their work had to be done. In other words, because they refused to come to terms with the traditions, the habits, the common feelings and interests, even the prejudices which stood rooted in the national character. They would fain have done in a few years what, as in the light of the sequel we know right well, it needed centuries to accomplish. Nor was theirs an unique experience. It was but one illustration of the perennial tragedy of life, which comes of the inevitable conflict between the creative will of man and the hidden wisdom of the world which seems to thwart it. The higher enthusiasm, he says in a pregnant passage, which breathed in Cromwell and Vane, was not Puritanic or English merely. It belonged to the universal spiritual force which, as ecstasy, mysticism, quietism, philosophy, is in permanent collision with the carnal interests of the world, and which, if it conquers them for a moment, yet again sinks under them that it may transmute them more thoroughly to its service. It is worth while to dwell at some length on Green's interpretation of the Commonwealth, for as Nettleship well says, these four lectures bring out the whole man. Green was a reformer and a lover of reformers. He was a radical and an admirer of radicals. But as one of his contemporaries said, he was a radical of a very peculiar kind. He was, at any rate, far enough from subversive for from first to last he held two convictions for which we do not usually go to the oracles of radicalism. One is that he who would reform the institutions of his country must qualify himself for the task by opening his eyes to the force of circumstances. The other, that no reform, however triumphant for the time it may appear, and even when backed up by men of heroic mould, is likely to endure if it has not come to terms with the national sentiment, character, and institutions. There are some ardent spirits to whom a doctrine like this is far from welcome. They do not like to be reminded that there are limits before which reformers must bend or against which they must dash themselves in vain. They prefer the note of earlier radicalism, the radicalism of the revolution, or the utilitarian crusade with its confident faith in new beginnings, swift political transformations, legislative shortcuts to happiness, and the rapid realizability of ideals. And some do not hesitate to say of Green, as some have said of Hegel, that his political doctrine plays into the hands of reaction by damping the fires of reform, and providing conservatives with convenient apologies for inveterate abuses. But it is entirely possible for a philosophy to be radical without ceasing to be conservative. Were this not so, it would at any rate be a misnomer to call Green's teaching radical. For in certain aspects, Green is profoundly conservative. Not only did he preach the force of circumstances, it is within the truth to say that the subversion or even the shaking of institutions is the last thing he would have desired. The return to nature of Rousseau and the revolutionists was, in his eyes, a reversion to barbarism. It was the watchword of men fatally blind to the resources of civilization that lay ready at their hand, and it was doubly to be distrusted because it glorified sentiment and depreciated reason. His own attitude to the social system is fundamentally different. It is not a spirit of antipathy or even of discontent. It can only be called a spirit of profound gratitude. 
words can hardly be stronger than those in which he extols the heritage into which the citizen of a civilized state is born in great books and great examples in the gathering fullness of spiritual utterance which we trace through the history of literature in the self-denying love which we have known from the cradle in the moralizing influence of civil life in the closer fellowship of the christian society in the sacramental ordinances which represent that fellowship in common worship in the message of the preacher through which amid diversity of stammering tongues one spirit still speaks here god's sunshine is shed abroad without us End of section 21